Good morning. Please stand for the invocation and pledge of allegiance. O oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance. Stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Welcome to this meeting of the Board of Education. This meeting is being televised live on ACPS TV and live streamed on the internet. General information and protocols for the meeting are posted on the signs by the doorway as you enter the room. Please make sure you read those if you have not already. Item 2.03 is the approval of the minutes. So, we have a motion and a second. Consensus <laughs> in favor? Okay. Uh, item 2.04 is the establish of the agenda order. Um, just note, um, before we make motions, about the departmental reports on today's agenda. We will be having a presentation from Chief, uh, Chief of Police um, Altamari coming up later in today's meeting, and a public transportation workshop scheduled for 6 p.m. next Tuesday, March the 10th, in this room. Therefore, it is my understanding by staff that we will not be having reports for item 5.01 and 5.04 on today's agenda. All of that being stated, the board will still hear any public comments on those particular items as they were would appear on the agenda. Um, questions the board? Okay. Um, I have one other thing. Um, is that, um, a as you know, the, uh, the, the CAC has been, our, our Citizen Advisory Committee, um, has been trying to expedite the vacancies uh, replace, uh, to replace them um, for those who uh, have signed up and are no longer to a continue um, to serve in that manner. And so, um, to our surprise, we were able to complete the nomination recommendations um, yesterday afternoon, and um, I was asked by the president and the staff advisement and agree myself that um, we'd like the board to consider um, the filling of vacancies on the executive committee. So with that being said um, and recognizing they only got a couple more months left and um, this was originally scheduled for next month's agenda but under the circumstances and the caseload that they have um, in their timeline um, I'd like us to consider that today. So I move that the board add filling of vacancies on the executive committee of countywide citizen advisory committee to the agenda today as item 7.09. Second. Okay, we have uh, two folks for discussion, Ms. Antoine and then Ms. Shawhai. Ms. Antoine. Thank you, um, President Corkadel. I had a question about the movement. Um, so the agenda indicated that safety, um, the 501 and 504 will be presented today and you're saying that we're moving it because of the workshop that's coming up and because of Chief Altimer's, um presentation today? Uh, what I was saying, um, I gotta get this thing, 
Um, it's new. Um, what I was saying is, is that uh, Chief Altamari's um, presentation will be the report of staff, um, but so it's going to be under a different section. So we're still going to hear from, from public testimony, yeah, from folks. We're just, those two items are going to be addressed in those separate. Yes, ma'am, what I'm asking is whatever, our staff will be available during um, the chief's presentation today? Oh, yes, uh, okay. the staff is all here today, uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, um, in, in that regard, but they're not, they did not prepare a traditional report because it, his report is, is, that, is the report today. Uh, got it, and then in 504, because of what's, what we're doing on the 10th, um, we're moving that as well. Uh, that that is well. The, it, it's just that there is no report um, because uh, because the bigger report will be on the tenth. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh -huh. Thank you. You're welcome, Ms. Shahan. Um, I I understand what you're saying about proposed item 7.09, but this was not released to the public in advance, so the public doesn't know that we're going to be talking about it, and and I have an issue with that. I also we were just provided a list of names and. I'm not sure if you all remember last spring, but I thought I made it clear at that time that, I mean, I, I wouldn't know these people if they walked by me on the street. And so we were able to get, I, I asked for and we all received um, their applications for us to read so that we can make an informed decision. Yes, I get that a committee met, but that doesn't mean I don't want the background information in advance of voting. So I'm a, I'm a hard no on this one. I think that we should put this on the agenda and um, put it out to the public the Friday before the meeting like we do everything else and we can do that for the uh, March 18th meeting which is only in a couple of weeks. So that's why I'll be voting no on this. Ms. Ellis? Thank you. Um, Ms. Shalham, I, I was right with you uh, last time on that uh, discussion, and for me it is extremely important that um, I, I normally do not feel comfortable making a, taking a vote um, when I don't feel we have all the information. However, I do recognize, um, in other words, I, I never see our vote as a formality. Um, when, if something comes through a committee, that means the work has been done, but it's our responsibility. If we're voting on it, that means we have to consider everything. So, um, so I, I never take that lightly. But I am very concerned for our CAC right now um, with the time constraints that they have. And um, I, I, I feel this committee is um, extremely challenged right now to get done the work that they've been tasked to do for this board. So um, under the current urgent circumstances I, I am I am supporting this agenda item thank you thank you miss Ellis uh, seeing no more comment miss Howell, please call the roll to add the item item 7.09 for the filling of vacancies for the CAC to the agenda please beginning with miss Ellis today Aye. miss Schalheim I'm a hard no and in the future I would like to receive applications for everyone so we're not just a formality so we're not just a rubber stamp for all CAC positions going forward. Ms. Antwine? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Alvi? Aye. Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Motion passes 7-1. Okay. Um, so we can now entertain a motion. Um, are there any other uh, additions? Recommendations, seeing none, I'm willing to entertain a motion to accept the agenda order as amended. So moved. Seeing no comments, Ms. Howe, please call a roll, or do we have consensus? Okay. We have consensus, moving along. Item 2.05. Um, I'm going to, at this time, uh, turn uh, Turn it over to Ms. Antoine. Ms. Antoine. Thank you, President Corkadell. In an extraordinary show of support for the students across Anne Arundel County, the members of Abundant Life Church in Glen Burnie raised and donated funds to eliminate meal debt 
for more than 2,500 students. The donation to the 21st Century Education Foundation, a nonprofit organization that supports the activities of Anne Arundel County Public Schools and its students, will cover student meal debts at 59 schools in the Chesapeake, Glen Burnie, Mead, North County, Northeast, and Old Mill feeder systems. This specific amount of the donation is being withheld at the request of Abundant Life Church. Talk about humble. Last year, AACPS served more than 5.9 million lunches and 3.5 million breakfasts in schools. AACPS menus feature additional healthy options for all students. Choices include additional fresh fruits and vegetables, more whole grain options, and more lean protein and low fat dairy options. In addition to breakfast and lunch, the school system also serves free early evening meals at 45 sites and operates a summer meals program. Abundant Life Church's lead pastor, Nate Dry, said, for our church, this donation is not about dollars, but about the impact we can have on the lives of children. We believe fundamentally that we are called to serve and we are blessed to be able to serve the community in this way. Therefore, the Board of Education of Anne Arundel County and Dr. Arlotto agree. Many of our children and their families struggle with food uncertainty every day. With community partnerships like Abundant Life Church, our students are better. Today, we recognize Abundant Life Church and its awesome lead pastor, Nate Dry, and we thank you for your collaborative efforts to, to reduce the meal debt for our students and their families. Please join me up front as I, pre I present this to you on behalf of the Board of Education. Share. Oh, you don't want to give a preacher a microphone. <laughs> I'll make this quick. Um, we're humbled, and we, um, as a church, we just want to do the things that we believe churches should do and Christians should do, and that's to have a positive impact in the community. Um, the mission of our church is sincere acceptance, and we saw a bunch of kids that weren't being sincerely accepted, so we just wanted to help them. Thank you, and God bless. Item number 2.06 is the Educator of the Month. 
The National Education Association's Read Across America Day is the nationwide reading celebration that takes place annually on March 2nd, Dr. Seuss's birthday. Across the country, thousands of schools, libraries, and community centers participate by bringing together kids, teens, and books to celebrate. And this morning, the Board of Education celebrates Read Across America Day by recognizing a fantastic reading teacher. Lindsay Ells, literacy teacher from Hillsborough Elementary, is all about reading. She implements reading initiatives that benefit students, staff, and the Hillsborough community. She takes a lead role with hashtag AACPS Read With Me Challenge to encourage a love of reading and awareness of the importance of reading outside of school. She coordinates the premier reading event for the school year, Cookies and Cocoa Reading, to celebrate the winter and the love of reading. During this event, the community comes together to read, celebrate, and create based on some of our favorite winter read aloud books. Ms. Ells promotes positive changes in the growth of students by collaborating with staff to ensure students are identified for additional reading intervention or challenging more advanced readers. She just completed the rigorous renewal process for national board certification. Unbelievable accomplishment for which I congratulate you heartily. Through this process, she has proven to be a reflective practitioner who is in tune with the needs of her students and colleagues while also growing her own capacity as an instructional leader. Lindsay performs with a high degree of professionalism, knowledge, and leadership, ensuring that families are given sufficient time and attention to questions they pose. The same is true when she is working with her colleagues. As a result, she has been identified as the administrative designee to act on behalf of the principal in her absence. Through all of her actions, Lindsay continually builds relationships with students, staff, and families through her collaborative conversations, patience, and compassion for all. And so for these reasons and more, the Board of Education is pleased and honored to recognize Lindsay Ells as the Educator of the Month for March 2019. Bravo Zulu! Item 2.07 is the um, employee of the month, um, Ms. Shohan. Thank you. Today we recognize an employee in our school system who's the ultimate staff member. Elizabeth Martello, teacher assistant at Jones Elementary School. Mrs. Martello consistently goes above and beyond her job responsibilities to support each and every student that she encounters. You can find her actively preparing, <laughs> creating, and supporting both students and teachers in the classroom. She is organized and always thinks ahead to prepare for instruction in the classroom while also managing IEP paperwork, timelines, and other important documents. Her work ethic speaks for itself as she has frequently offered to substitute when substitutes are not available. Mrs. Martello's first priority is always the students, which is visible from the moment she steps through the door. She supports student learning in self-contained classrooms, providing small group assistance, creating anchor charts, and, facility, and facilitating intervention groups, just to name a few. She actively participates with the special education team and is considered the go-to staff member when it comes to IEP paperwork. She reaches out to families, ensuring their feedback is gathered as well. 
Her enthusiasm and determination have positively impacted Jones Elementary, arriving every day with a smile on her face. Her presence in the lunchroom and during recess duty helps maintain structure and routine for the children. She is, knowledge, she is a knowledgeable resource for teachers mentoring her colleagues with various instructional strategies or techniques to implement. Mrs. Martello is trusted in our school community and the staff at Jones Elementary School are lucky to have her. So on behalf of the Board of Education, the students, the teachers, and staff of Anne Arundel County Public Schools, we are pleased to recognize you as the Employee of the Month for March 2020. Congratulations. Please join me up front. Item 2.08, Volunteer of the Month, Ms. Hummer. Anne Arundel County Public Schools offers a great many paths for volunteerism. Tutoring, mentoring, chaperoning, and guest reading are just a few of the ways community members can support our schools. But there is another type of volunteerism that is often forgotten, the support given to us by those who take the leadership route. These are our volunteers who represent their school clusters on the Citizens Advisory Committee or the Superintendent's Parent Involvement Advisory Council and serve as officers of the Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs. Today we are here to celebrate the dedication of one such volunteer. Ms. Vanessa Rivera, the Board of Education, <laughs> is thrilled to honor you as our March 2020 Volunteer of the Month. <laughs> The Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs is an umbrella group that provides support, mentoring, training, and networking opportunities to local PTA chapters. Ms. Rivera is the current president of the council. As leader, she is often seen out in the schools helping to get a new PTA group up and running or helping them prepare for an audit. Jen Lombardi, senior manager of schools and family partnerships, appreciates all that Vanessa does. Her knowledge of how PTAs work mixed with a calm, unflappable spirit makes for a powerful combination. Ms. Rivera's service to AACPS is not limited to the work she does with the local units. She is also, according to Family Involvement Specialist Shelley Davenport, assisted in the procurement of system-wide grants. Ms. Rivera is interested in finding any and all opportunities to support our students. From speaking to the Local Development Council to pulling together all the needed paperwork, her support of the Trauma-Sensitive Classrooms Grant has been remarkable, and I can't thank her enough. Vanessa focuses not only on the su success of students while they are attending AACPS, but also their success after they graduate. She is a strong supporter of the Anne Arundel County Council of PTA scholarship program that honors students who demonstrate academic success and have shown leadership in the school community. Library media specialist Tammy Duvall shared, Vanessa works tirelessly as the AACC PTA president and scholarship chair. She has helped to improve the future of countless Anne Arundel County students over the past few years. It is an honor, a privilege, and a joy to work with her. Lisa Shore, who serves as secretary of the Anne Arundel County PTA, shared, in our roles with the AACC PTA, Vanessa and I have served on many committees together, including the School Board Nominating Commission and the Mental Health Task Force. There are so many extra duties and responsibility for this position, but what impresses me the most about Vanessa is that she shares her love of reading and books by having a little free library in front of her house. Neighborhood kids can borrow books for free, and this inspires so many kids to read. I think we can all agree that Teresa Tudor, who recently retired from a position 
as senior manager of the Office of School and Family Partnerships, hit the nail on the head when she said, Vanessa was a joy to work with at AACC PTA. She is very organized, energetic, and always ready to assist any local PTA. Her dedication to all students, teachers, and parents in AACPS is proof that we are all better together. Ms. Rivera, you are a great asset to the entire Anne Arundel County Public Schools community, and we thank you for your service as a volunteer and for your dedication to the AACPS family. Please come forward. Next, we have school and community highlights. Ms. Schalheim. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say that, um, well, a few of us attended the forum on hate and bias crimes the other day. And this is a, a partnership, as I understand it, between the school system, the county, uh, Anne Arundel Community College. And I thought it was a fabulous event. Um, the both panels were amazing. Um, Dr. Lotto was uh, definitely on point that night, and his uh, point, everything that was said was um, was very good. I just thought it, it was a, a wonderful um, gathering of our community, and and really shows our 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 joint interest in erasing hate and bias from our schools. I'm very grateful to our staff who were a part of this. Um, the second panel included representatives from a variety of groups, from uh, the LGBTQ community, from the Muslim community, from the Jewish community, from uh, the Latino community, uh, and there were, there were many others, and I just thought it was a fabulous event, and so I just wanted to say bravo for everyone who's involved, and I look forward to more similar events like this. I thought it was a really uh, wonderful um, evening, and uh, and a lot of wonderful points were, were made. I also attended the STEM uh, festival at, uh, in Severna Park, put on by a nonprofit group called PAGE, and that acronym is Partnership to Address the Achievement Gap in Education, and it was also a really just lovely community event, a great way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schalheim. Ms. Antoine? Thank you. Um, I was I was also in attendance for the forum on uh, bias and hate. I so appreciate the joint efforts, the community that showed up, especially our students, who um, even going until about nine o'clock in the evening, they were there for all of what was being offered, and they offered their support as well. And everything Ms. Schalheim just shared, I concur with tremendously. This is a huge incredible issue across our county, state, and nation, and I appreciate that we are leading change in how we can best combat it. <clears throat> I want to give out a very special thank you to North Glen Elementary for hosting me and Miss Friend um, on our reading tour. We even had a nice little schedule the students were very well behaved, uh, attentive, and involved in the reading. They even got up while I was reading and read with me, turned pages and otherwise without being requested to do so. So, <laughs> so it, was, it, was, it was a fun time. April um, ends our tour. I'm looking forward to um, more of these events in April, but I sincerely thank you, Dr. Alato, um, Ms. Badden, Ms. Friend, uh, Dr. McMahon, I thank all of you for allowing this, this, 
even when I'm having the worst of days. I can, I can reflect on these moments with the students and it makes all the difference. And then I had one about the, um, the recent nominations. Are, are we talking about that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention those. So, I, so we'll, I'll, I'll save it for you then, President no, Corkadell. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. So uh, we also, I, I want to congratulate all of our nominees for Teacher of the Year in Anne Arundel County. Congratulations. That is all. Definitely. Um, uh, we, I definitely echo Ms. Antoine's sentiments. Miss um, Hummer and Miss Alvey. Miss Hummer? Um, yes, I want to thank the PTA of Chesapeake um, Bay Middle School who invited me out for their anti-bullying um, assembly last week. It was great. They had an outside speaker and there were hundreds and hundreds of middle schoolers who were totally paying attention, which tells you that he was a great speaker and had captured them. And so um, it, it was a wonderful all school activity that they had. Um, I also, for those who March Madness has begun, basketball playoffs are in full swing. I was able to go last night to one of the playoff games, Meade versus North County, went into overtime right at the end. So it's the best of basketball. So I encourage you to look at the schedules and get out there. We have lots of our teams, guys and girls, that will be playing over the next couple of weeks. And um, then just a shout out to the overall school system. Over the past month, our school system has received a number of great recognitions for schools and departments, and we don't always highlight those things, but w over the past month, six weeks, we've received, we had five schools that were named Wellness Schools of Distinction. We had three schools that received the state excellence in gifted and talented education. We had two of our schools that were named National Magnet Schools of Excellence. And then our finance office was just received for the 39th year in a row the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting by the Association of School Business Officials, the highest honor in that association of finance professionals, 39 years in a row. So across the board, our school system is excelling in a wide range of things. And I just wanted to make sure and highlight the outstanding efforts from all these different departments and the recognitions they have earned. Um, Ms. Alvey? So I just wanted to remind everyone that the Student Member of the Board Student Leadership Forum is taking place at Sperna Park High School in their cafeteria on Thursday, March 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. It is an opportunity for students, um, any AACPS student, to come and speak to their board members about what's concerning to them. Um, so I highly encourage that all the students you know, please tell them to come and join us. And also, the Future Business Leaders of America State Leadership Conference is coming up. I want to congratulate all the regional, um, uh, regional winners throughout Anne Arundel County from our various high schools and middle school that won at the regional level. And I wish them the best of luck for the, their state conference. And then finally, I want to t thank the um, staff, uh, the Office of Student Leadership here um, at the Board of Education for helping with the PAGE program because they did a wonderful job um, and all the PAGES that I participated with at the State House had a great experience and I want to thank them for, for participating in that opportunity and allowing me to have that op opportunity as well. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alvey. And one final comment from Ms. Antoine. President Corkadel, I forgot about our town hall meetings. Um, uh, we, we started a series, uh, the Board of Education started a, a series of town hall meetings. Our first one was um, over, the, uh, over the last couple of weeks at North County. I appreciate all the participation and the support. I am not sure off the top of my head when the next one is, but I'm looking forward to it. I, I believe that uh, we have a student one on the 12th, is that the correct date? And then on the 19th will be our next one, which is at Northeast. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder, Ms. Ms. Antoine, that, that totally set my mind. Okay, great. Thank you all. Um, next, we have the item 2.10, two one, one the CAC report. Ms. Howard. Good morning, President Corkadell, <clears throat> Vice President Ellis, board members, and Dr. Olato. Before proceeding, 
As chair of the CAC and on behalf of our body, we truly appreciate the board's expedited assistance in filling vacancies. This will positively impact our work. Now let me update the board on our activities. The CAC met Monday, February 10th, having a guest Q&A with Lisa Van Buskirk of Start School Later. She provided a briefing of the history of her, her organization and its interaction with the board related to school start times and associated health and safety impact considerations. We appreciate her information, perspective, and in particular the resources made available for our members' consumption. The dialogue was vigorous, engaging, and insightful. Future actions of our committee. Induct any newly appointed committee members. Appointment of a permanent member as a liaison and member of the recess work group led by um, uh, Mrs. Jackson. Continue dialogue with policy committee on the CAC policy review. Continue to study and examine practices for recess at the elementary level and the magnet program selection process lottery criteria at the secondary level. We'll also be refine, refining the topic scope, goal setting, and selecting a group leader to manage the engagement and to support a final report submission. Due to the delay of the secondary topic selection and elementary vacancies, report submissions would be more realistic for the June board meeting. The CAC anticipates with the addition of replacement elementary members, our recess study will drastically benefit from increased participation and fulfillment. Accordingly, we revise our, time, our report timeline as below. Data collection, analysis, and collation and collaboration will continue through April, and a final report mid to late May, early June. We will have also the 2020-2021 current member commitments and term expiration notification to the board no later than March 31st. Our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, April 13th, to have work sessions planned for the committee work progression. Thank you for su your support of the CAC and looking forward to the challenge to deliver, deliver meaningful information assisting the board in its goal and to strengthen the committee interactions, building stronger capabilities in the future and in, in our future endeavors. Thank you very much. Um, sure. Any questions? Uh, Ms. Antoine? Yes, ma'am. I, I missed something. You said that you're sure. presenting something to us in June, and I missed what that was. I'm sorry. The report. We're going to, we anticipated to have the report uh, draft for you in May, but it's gonna, the final one will be ready for June instead of May. Understood. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Ms. Howard. Greatly appreciate it. Chief Altamari um, is um, going to be uh, next on our agenda for a presentation, item 3.01, the Anne Arundel County Police Chief, Chief Altamari, and as you recall, uh, this is going to be our safety and security report uh, for this morning. Of course, we will continue with 5.01 for public comment. Uh, Chief Altamari, thank you so much. Thank you so very much for joining me. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Tamika, you want to come up? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And just normally we would um, break right now for the um, for the employee volunteer and feature of the month. Um, in the interest of time for Chief Altamari, um, we're going to entertain his presentation, and then promptly following that, we will take a short break to take care of the pictures. And we greatly appreciate your patience. Um, as you may recall, uh, we had some uh, information uh, requests uh, that uh, our team uh, players at the uh, Anne Arundel County uh, Police Force, uh, they, we recognize that they are, they're an integral part of our school system in helping our, keep our children safe. And so in that interest, um, I want to thank you, sir, so much for coming down because um, you know you, you're a part of our team, 
and um, we greatly appreciate you taking time to uh, help us better understand some of the systems and I believe you have a presentation um, that you will be making um, today so we're going to go through the presentation and then we will entertain um, comments from the board. Thank you so much sir and, and take it away. Madam President, thank you for having me. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, I appreciate you having me in. So um, I asked Ms. Tamika Perkins to join me today. We have a couple um, very engaging uh, presentations to give you within the grander scheme of what we're going to talk about today. I think there's no uh, way to start to talk today but to say that we're here in a fair part to discuss disproportionality on uh, juvenile citation data. I think that the disproportionality there um, is a part and parcel of the reasons that we're having such a cohesive effort on uh, the opportunity gap. It's part and parcel of why we're having meaningful discussions and efforts on our um, efforts at being better at accounting, at being trauma informed in our care and um, handling of juveniles when they do mess up. Um, kids are kids, they do uh, kid things sometimes. And uh, I'm proud to say that while we still have a, a problem with disproportionality, and I would never in a million years say that we don't have a problem with disproportionality. Um, I think our problems all dovetail into each other on those areas that we just talked about. And then I think we are by no means unique in the nation. We got problems as a nation we need to fix. Um, and at least part of that, a huge part of that, particularly in Anne Arundel County where we have been um, light on investment for the past 30 years, uh, might be a fair way to say it. Uh, we, we fit the norms that are out there. So today I wanted to talk about the fact in opening that uh, if you look to the back of the room, Deputy Chief Gerard Flemings is back there. Go ahead, Chief Wave, sorry. Um, <laughs> Deputy Chief Flemings came back on board after retiring with us in 2012 to help me uh, when I t in my first year as chief. And one of the first things that we talked about was this problem with disproportionality and what we could do to fix it. Um, we had a traditional model as it related to kids who entered into um, contacts with police through enforcement. Um, very shortly thereafter, we hired Ms. Tamika Perkins to my right to start to work on the problems. So we had a choice when we looked at data very early on in my tenure as chief. We could either ignore that we had a problem, we could wait until somebody in this nation figured the problem out and nobody had done it yet in uh, 200 and some years of our history, or we could get to work and roll our sleeves up and start working on um, consequences of the problem and continue to invest in uh, being proactive to get rid of the problem as we move forward in history. And that's kind of what we've done. So um, really, I want to be open and honest with everybody. We still have a problem. I think that the, the problem of disproportionality as it relates to minorities um, is in every bit of the law enforcement and criminal justice system in the United States. Um, if we are to take on faith, and I think we should, that the measure of a society is, is how it takes care of its least fortunate people, then we got a lot of work to do together uh, as we move forward in time. Before I go into the, the details, the minutia of what all we're doing to work on the problem, um, I want to acknowledge that and commit to the board and indeed to the citizens behind me that we've been working on it every day since I was a decision maker and we ain't never going to stop and I'm sorry for the teachers in the room. I love ain't. I can't, I can't stop doing it. Um, but you have my commitment that any good idea will steal it. Uh, any good program will try to import it. Um, and we'll keep working on this together because just as with the racism problem in the schools and at homes, we ain't fixing it unless we do it together. So with that segue, I will uh, start our program. I'm going to talk to you a fair amount today about everything we're doing with kids to lessen the impacts of what has been termed the school to prison pipeline. There's a, um, 
a reality to the fact that enforcement actions by police tend to create a paradigm moving forward in one's life uh, that can be negative. So we're trying to turn that on its head and we're doing all the things we're gonna talk about today um, to do that. So I think we can move to the next slide. Really quickly, as, as I took over as chief in the tail end of 2014, it became very apparent to me that everything good the police department did with its community disappeared in the bad budget years of 2006 to 2009, 2010, 10. 10. <laughs> when I lateraled from Annapolis City to the Anne Arundel County Police Department, we had whole units. And when I say whole units, I mean eight, 10 people who worked on nothing but positive interaction with the kids and indeed with adults. Our D.A.R.E. program went away, and I'm not here beating the table about D.A.R.E., but we need to be doing something positive with the kids. People with a badge need to be doing something positive with the kids in school. That had gone away. Our police and community together units had gone away. Our youth activities program had gone away. A lot of our positive crime prevention efforts had gone away, and it, it's much like a human body um, when one experiences an ar arterial bleed, you've got to try to keep the heart beating, and that's what the police department did in those bad budget years. So very quickly, we looked at that and realized that we had to start doing a lot of things to build positivity, particularly as you look at what was going on nationally in, in mid to late 2014 um, and early 2015. Um, so we committed to that very early, and we're doing a lot of good things. Dr. Arlotto has been a great partner for us, especially in giving us access to the schools. There's still a human reaction that people tend to see our uniform and say, what's wrong? What's happening bad? So one of the first things that you think about with kids is if you're going to have positive interaction with them and create positive paradigms moving forward, we've got to take that as our first reaction as a society out of the equation and make people glad to see cops sometimes. So when we looked at getting into the schools, we knew we had SROs in the high schools, some of the middle schools, doing everything I can to have an SRO in every middle school in the county next year, if that was going to be a question uh, later in the, in the program. But so we knew we had interactions at those levels. At the elementary school levels, we didn't have any interaction. And quite honestly, I'm not sure that uh, folks wanted the interaction at first because people react with what's wrong when a cop shows up. So we started our Lunch Buddies program in the schools. It gives a, a chance for cops to show up at lunchtime, eat with the kids, be a human being. Um, we try to really mix up the officers that go into the schools and interact with the kids because we want to give every kid a chance to see an officer who looks like them um, as somebody to look up to um, just as a positive role model and give the genesis of thought in, the, in a child's head that, wow, that guy or gal was pretty cool and maybe it'd be cool if I was a cop. So we started that early with Dr. Arlotto's help we had some fits and starts in the first couple years, but I'm proud to say that we're really kind of up and running in the elementary schools. And starting this week through the end of the school year, we got a state grant to have officers on overtime do nothing but go out and interact with kids in elementary schools on a positive basis. So you're gonna see a real ramping up of that interaction in the last few months of the school year. And then next year, we'll try to figure out how to keep that momentum going. Shop with a Cop is another program we've do been doing for years. I can't take credit for that one, but it is an incredible program. During the holidays, we have a lot of kids who don't have even a tree to look forward to to have something under or uh, a menorah to light. And the Shop with a Cop program uses the schools as an, a resource to identify those kids, to partner them with a cop, and, and to allow the cops to take them shopping for the holidays, I have to tell you that I've been doing it for years now, and I have yet to have a kid 
who doesn't buy everybody else in their family something before they buy themselves. So it's a pretty cool, uh, it's a pretty cool day. It's a touching day. I'm facing away from the crowd, so I'm going to tell everybody I don't have tears in my eyes, and if anybody says I do, they're lying. <laughs> so we're going to keep that up and try to expand it as time goes by. The optimists are a great partner, because, and Walmart are, is a great partner, because they help us get the stuff to the kids. Our national night out, we've really been trying to expand our youth uh, activities at these events to make them more attractive for kids instead of mom and dad just dragging them around and interacting with um, grown-ups. So that's something that you'll see us continue. And then both at Halloween time and during the holidays, we're really trying to step our interactions with the kids on a positive basis up. And I encourage the cops, even if they're not at one of our trunk or treat events, to have candy in their car and to interact with trick-or-treaters as they're going around in every community in Anne Arundel County um, so that they think about those cop cars as a place to go just like they do people's houses for something positive and for help if they need it. Move on to the next slide, please. We did move on to the next slide. That's how bad my eyes are, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't see it. <laughs> so our, our youth activities program. No, I'm good, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. So we talked about what happened in those bad budget years. And extremely early, Deputy Chief Flemings and I started to conceptualize a youth activities program. And we historically, we stayed away from the term police athletic league because we wanted it to be about a lot more than athletics. Um, so we started looking at how to do this. And for the first year, year and a half, we really robbed a lot of Peters to pay a lot of Pauls um, to get stuff going. And then in that second budget year, we were able to get the Local Development Council to fund our efforts um, in a meaningful way. That's morphed nowadays into a fair amount more money and a lot more kids that we can impact. So as you might know about the Local Development Council funds, we're supposed to use that predominantly in a three-mile impact area around the casino. We, we predominantly use that money in, a, in that area. And I'm not speaking out of school. I've told the Local Development Council this, but we cheat our tails off. Um, we bring kids from other parts of the county uh, into the impact area so that it is thus supported by the notion of the Local Development Council. We are attempting to impact the communities that need it most, and there's no way around it. The communities that need the relationship strengthened with their police department the most. And in Anne Arundel County, that's communities that struggle with poverty and um, are disproportionately African American. So we are targeting in a very good way African American kids, Latino kids, kids that aren't going to get an opportunity to go have a baseball camp if we don't put it on for them, aren't going to have homework help unless we do it sometimes. We'll never get to go to the museums or the aquariums. And we've really done gangbusters in that. I'm not allowed to talk about budget asks prior to budget time. As you guys know, it's against the law. But it would be a pretty good bet that I'm trying to expand some funding there into general fund funding so that I don't have to cheat as much anymore to get kids from other parts of the county. I will tell you that. Chief Jackson and I in Annapolis City have discussed trying to get his kids up to us. Um, it's, not, it's not not doable, it's doable. We've just got to figure out the logistics of it. And this year we folded our Midshipman Community Action Club into our mentoring program so that the mids are coming out and helping us interact with the kids um, and, and give us a force multiplier so we have more people doing it. So. Um, I would, I would say at this point that we positively impacted thousands of kids with our youth activities program. This is our fourth year up and running, um, and we're going to continue to do that. I do have one very telling story about police in the community as it relates to this youth activities program. Our first year, we were taking a group of kids to the National Aquarium up in Baltimore, 
and we were picking kids up at Van Bocklin Elementary School. And there was a kid on a bike going around us like a satellite time and time again. And as he would come by, my officers and, and I jumped in on the bandwagon also kept saying, hey man, all it takes is a signature on a piece of paper. You want to come with us? Nah, I don't want to come. Look, man, we want you to come. All you got to do is take us to your parents and get this piece of paper signed. Nah, I'm not doing it. And there was clearly an animus towards the police in this interaction, but the kid wanted to go on the trip so bad. So work on it, work on it. Van Bocklin tends to be the jump off point for us a lot because it's in, that, in the impact area. And my officers came up to me a month later and said they had gotten a kid on a trip. So it was a big win for us. In our world, we talk all the time about we have to celebrate small victories because we don't get big ones all the time. So that was a big celebration for us. I will tell you that as you look at disproportionality in enforcement statistics and discipline statistics, that the Mead cluster, I'm not surprising anybody sitting at the dais, is, is absolutely an area that we need to to be involved in, to make improvements in, and it is fortunate then that the Local Development Council has that area in its uh, three-mile impact radius because about 90% of our efforts go towards impacting kids in a positive um, manner in that cluster. Moving on to the next slide, and I'm looking close this time. So I think this slide just shows you kind of the gamut of things we're taking kids to do um, we had a dance camp last summer. We imported a dance teacher all the way up from uh, Georgia, who's kind of known on the East Coast. It was an extremely cool um, experience for me, who has absolutely zero exposure to dance. Um, it, was, it was very cool, and I was floored by um, the impact we were having on the kids with dance. Um, we're doing homework help. You can see up there we've taken kids to Orioles, the hockey games. Um, but we really try to keep a nexus to learning in, in our activities. So we're doing a lot of things other than just athletics. And um, for instance, we've taken kids on train rides out in Western Maryland so that they see the ge geography of Maryland change during the holidays. The, the National Aquarium trip has has given us great benefits. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the elementary school. Harmons, Harmons, Harm, Harmons Hebron Elementary School. We do a lot of things in that school as well. We're very welcome. The principal has gotten used to seeing us and I think uh, kind of grabs us, which is cool. Um, so it, it's working and um, we're gonna keep it up. We can move on to the next slide. I'm going to ask Ms. Tamika to, to start to talk with me now at this point because she, I'm going I'm to say this to the group. I don't know what the heck we would do with Ms. Tamika. I struggle without Ms. Tamika. I struggle, <laughs> um, I struggle to pay her what she's worth, and I know that's a very frequent real, uh, reality for the board as well. Um, this lady beside me is brilliant. She has a master's degree, or is about to get her master's degree, um, and thinks outside the box to such, such an extent that um, we'd be dead in the water without her, and, and uh, I would ask you to add your voices to not letting her leave. Um, so we're, we're trying to get a lot better at being trauma-informed. Uh, you know, we look at ACEs out in the community, I wouldn't have known what aces were other than playing poker um, five, six years ago. They matter. I think that they, they leave lasting imprints on kids. Um, and we're doing a lot to try to make us better at, even if we interact with a kid through an enforcement encounter, at turning that paradigm on its head, turning that pipeline on its head, and instead of looking at that encounter as a negative, turning it into a positive, and Miss Tamika does all of that for us. She has two part-time employees that work with her 
She needs five full-time employees that work with her. Um, the Handle with Care program was entirely um, her efforts that got us up and running from the police department's perspective. I know a lot of effort went into it otherwise, but from our perspective, she was it. I'm going to shut up and let you talk a little bit about that. Um, so we have been in full implementation. Can you guys hear me? Okay. We, we have been in full implementation with Handle with Care since 2018. Um, for just to give you guys a scope about that, um, we've had 241 Handle with Care notices sent this school year already. So it is making a huge impact um, on the on our students. Um, we're working with the school to constantly um, roll out best practices through um, that come out from the governor's office as to how to improve the program, um, make sure that the kids who need our help the most um, are getting that um, focused information. We were the first county of our size, one of the first counties of our size nationwide, but the first county of our size locally um, to roll out countywide implementation of the program. And so that's something I'm, I'm really proud about. Um, and we're constantly training our officers um, to make sure that we keep them coming um, keep the notices coming so that we make sure that all of our kids have the opportunity to um, combat the the trauma that they're experiencing um, we kind of am I allowed to brag a little bit sir <laughs> so we we kind of we kind of set the standard and we are working with the governor's office to help create the best practices guys for the state and so we do have a very robust program um, as far as handle with care goes um, and working very closely with the governor's office to make sure that if if there's new evidence-based best practices out there that we're one of the first to implement them so that's something i'm extremely proud about so the next thing i'll talk about on the slide is is our crisis intervention team so it's it's no secret to dr arlato because he and i have had a million meetings on this and and the need in the schools it's no secret to you ladies and gentlemen either because you're seeing the need you're seeing the stories um, our crisis intervention team has done wonders and it's early to talk about some of the programs we've been working on but I will tell you that what we're trying to do is look at a negative event in a kid's life where he interacts with a police officer in a manner or she interacts with a police officer in a manner that would have traditionally caused friction and heartache and take that as a genesis and plug being trauma informed into it through our crisis intervention team and our mobile crisis folks and to start looking for root causes in the home for behaviors and to start identifying kids who need more support uh, on the emotional health level to reduce that negative impact and it's not just altruistic on our part although Altruism is certainly a big part of it. Um, it reduces recidivism amongst these kids, and that's a win for the kids, and it's a win for society, and it's a win for the police. So um, we're really doing cool stuff with kids that have had problems in their life that have left trauma on them, trauma marks on them in a figurative manner, and trying to teach them coping skills and um, provide interventions before crisis happens. Last summer, we had what were termed CIT camp, and I'm only calling it CIT camp because that's who did it. Mobile and CIT trained officers and clinicians put this camp on. We had somewhere in the area of 12 to 15 kids who at the beginning of the week literally would not look at or talk to my officers and or the clinicians who by the end of the week were crying because they were leaving my officers and clinicians after camp. And we're trying to keep those relationships going. And as you look at us moving forward in time, that's the kind of stuff I need more funding for. So when I'm talking about future requests, you may well see me look for more funding for things like that. Um, if we did that with 12 or 15 kids, we all know there's 500 kids, 2,000 kids in this school system who needed it yesterday and last summer. So um, we ain't going to quit. We're going to keep it up. The Soapbox Derby is another cool uh, mentoring program that we've had. I think we're going into our fourth year. We've had some public-private partnership 
um, help us out. And what we're doing is we're pairing a child with one of our officers to go through the whole evolution of building a soapbox derby car together over weeks, participate in the racing together. And I got to tell you, we had so much interest from the community last summer we had to open it to the rest of the county government so we had folks from central services from the fire department um from parks and recs from all different branches of county government pitching in to help these kids chief flemings it was still a police car that won though right uh, not really. ah. <laughs> I hate to say it. firefighters <laughs> firefighters beat us so just goes back to what we're trying to do with the kids and and every kid matters here you'll hear us say all the time much like your your educators do one kid at a time um i'll talk about annapolis middle in a couple couple minutes do you is it now that we should bring your guests up or should we wait to another slide um, or the next slide next slide okay one more slide please okay so i'm going to be quiet here and let Tamika talk to you, and she has some guests that also want to talk to you as well. Um, so I'm going to talk to you really briefly, but I know um, I, I think that the students that I brought with me um, can probably say it better. I just want to give you guys um, a brief overview of what it is that we do within the department. Um, so we do um, what's called frontline diversion, which means um, we work with kids who are charged prior to any formal um, system involvement. So prior to the Department of Juvenile Services, prior to court, um, and my whole motto is meaningful intervention. Oh, sorry, is meaningful intervention. Um, this is not a um, meant to be a punishment. This is not, not meant to be a, a slap on the wrist either. It's meant to meet the needs of the child, um, link them with services, um, help restore the community, um, help change their perspective, meet the kid where they're at, and really try to make a, an early intervention change um, in our students' lives. Um, we do have a great partnership with the crisis intervention team. Um, it is so unique that we have actually been able to, to speak nationally and at the state level um, because we can divert and through our, divert through either our joints program or our teen court program and link them to our crisis intervention team to make sure that if this is a behavioral health or a mental health um, issue that is causing the, uh, the offense, that they're linked with services to prevent it from happening again. Because a lot of our families don't know where to go. And so if we can, can keep them out of the system while linking them with the services, I think that that's the best thing that we can do for both the child and for the family. Um, we do have a great partnership. Um, on our community conferencing because everything that we do is based in um, restoration. So um, the kind of consequences that we will do um, are some of the projects that you'll see up there, um, as well as community service. Um, we can do the counseling, we can do essays, apology letters, that kind of thing. And But I wanna make it clear that when I say community service, this is not, um, the type of community service that we all think of as far as like, you know, picking up trash on the side of the road and that kind of thing. That's not what we do. Um, we work to link them with organizations that um, are somehow related to their offense um, or somehow related to their job preference um, or their needs and their interests because we can really turn this into a positive. We've had people who from their community service are now full-time volunteers or employees. Um, they get letters of reference from it. So it's really about turning a negative behavior into a positive opportunity. Um, I started in 2016, at which time we switched to um, something called universal screening. So our diversion programs are not referral based. Um, every one for an eligible offense, um, first time offender, is automatically screened and asked if they want to participate in a diversion program. Um, the reason for that change is anytime you're dealing with referral based, you we talk about disproportionality, we talk about implicit bias, and that has, we've seen a positive impact because now about 60% of our diversion cases are minority youth. Um, so we are having a disproportionate impact. Um, I just wanna highlight some of the projects that you see up there because um, a project is just part of it, but if you can look at the red painting right there, that is a um, was made by a student who was a straight A student, but who got in trouble because um, there was some self-medicating going on because she was experiencing severe anxiety. Um, but she 
couldn't articulate what anxiety felt like. And she thought that there's no way that I can have anxiety because I'm a straight A student and it shouldn't be happening to me. And so that was actually a painting that she brought back to me as part of her project, a visual depiction of um, what anxiety feels like to her. Um, the comic book that you see where it says uh, New Leaf Middle School was actually someone who was charged but was really, um, it, it was rooted in bullying. And so this is a full comic book written and illustrated by a middle school student and that co the topic is an alternative reality of a middle school where there was no bullying. Um, the successful man poster down there is actually someone who came into my office, it was one of my most difficult cases. Um, but he had a history of fighting and what he said was you know I'm 13 I'm becoming a man that's just part of manhood so we had a really long conversation about that and we were able to um, get his father involved link him with the mentorship and so he was instructed to him and his dad worked on an essay for me about what it means to actually be successful and what manhood is about then he created that poster and with along with each of his justifications for um, along with each of his choices he had to justify why he chose them and money could not be the sole criteria um, so we work with them on anger management um, the help poster was um, a, an, a, a part of a PSA to help in the stigma um, between seeking help for mental health treatment and then the um, the woodworking, the, the leaf that you see there, another near and dear one to my heart because we were actually able to link um, that student and his family um, with someone who's involved in woodworking. And so that is carved and then burnt, the wood is burnt, the words are burnt on it um, by a middle school student who has since um, learned a trade. Um, and the, the special part about that one is um, we left such an impact on that family that he suffered um, the loss of a parent um, a year or so after he um, was involved in the program and the mom actually reached out to us because we worked so hard to get him on track that we wanted to stay on track and so we attended the funeral with him we really wrapped around him and he it, he's been doing phenomenally um, I think my, my crowning achievement, um, the one thing that I want to stress to you is that when, when we take the time to work with these kids, about 80, upwards of 80% of them do not have any additional negative contact with law enforcement within a year. Um, and that's huge to me. Um, upwards of 80% of our students who um, complete one of our diversion programs do not have any additional negative contacts with law enforcement within a year. And um, the reason why we track it at the year is that's just the national um, data mark, and so I don't have it beyond that. Um, but I'm going to be quiet now, and I would like for my three um, students, student participants to come up, and I just want you guys to hear um, from them if it's okay. Um, for confidentiality purposes, I won't be sharing their name. Um, but these are all Anne Arundel County School students um, who have had different involvement with our programs. Ladies and gentlemen, we also promised them they wouldn't get peppered with a bunch of questions. Um, and I'll tell you this, we actually offered them some options other than showing up today, and all three of them insisted on showing up. So we'll start with my um, young lady from the Annapolis area. Um, can you tell me um, what program you were involved in? I was involved in the team court. Okay. And um, can you tell me what impact, um, given having this second chance, has made on you? Um, it gave me a positive and a negative impact. Um, a positive impact, it made me realize how much a parent suff a parent struggles to keep a kid on track. Um, it brought me actually closer to my mom, even though during the process um, I did lose her trust. I didn't actually communicate with her. Um, when I wanted food, when I wanted to eat, I would cook it myself because of the situation that was going on. Um, I was actually a daddy's girl. So my whole life I grew up close to my dad, but the time of period that um, the process was going on, I was not close to him. Um, 
I was actually close to myself, so if I had a problem, I would try to figure it out myself. Um, I wouldn't ask help for anything. But um, now, in 2020, um, I'm a sophomore at A High, Annapolis High School. I am actually in the CASOF program for Foundation of Patient Care, which I will be attending my junior and my senior year. And um, we could get a diploma from Cat South, meaning I could start working at any, um, I'm gonna say nursing facility, or we could keep on going. But what I decided to do is attend two years at AACC, and then I'll probably transfer. And, and what type of relationships um, have you developed as a result of the program? Um, as a result of the program, um, I like I said, I've gotten closer with my mom, gotten closer with my dad. Um, actually, I met Officer Raiden and Joe Hudson, um, which been an amazing impact. Um, they check up on me once in a while. Um, I've actually helped them cook for the homeless a couple months ago, so it was wonderful. Um, we actually went to a baseball game. Uh, I think it was last year. Um, being around the little kids and like seeing how they develop and try to communicate with people is so nice. So, thank you. Yep. Um, and we'll next talk to um, one of our students from the Glen Burnie area. Um, so, can you tell me um, same question? How has this um, program involvement impacted you? It impacted me in a good way because. I stopped staying to myself and getting into trouble, and I built a better relationship with my mother than it was before. And what about in school? I'm not doing bad anymore. I'm doing good and getting, and getting good grades. Um, so, why did you, when we when we met, why did was it so important to you to speak here today? Because I was proud of myself for doing better than I was before. And what are your plans for the future? to go to college. Anything that you want to study in particular? Um, psychology. All right, thank you. And then um, my gentleman from the Mead area, um, how long have you been volunteering with our program? I've been, <clears throat> I've been volunteering uh, with Teen Corp for Anne Arundel County for three years now. Um, is it okay if I stay? Go for it. Okay, my name is Peter Stevenson. Oh. Um, I'm currently an IB student attending Mead Senior High School. I also interned for the state's attorney's office, and I've been a uh, I've been volunteering for Teen Corps for three years. And one of the things that I did is I I enjoy helping people. I aspire to be a judge for the state of Maryland in the future. And I went to the Baltimore City Teen Corps because I know that's where change needs to occur. And also, I went and I talked to the coordinators and the social workers there. I made a meeting, and they were saying funding, funding is in. There's not enough funding for these uh, teens. There's not enough opportunities for them. But then I said to myself, well, Anne Arundel County has enough funding, has enough opportunities. And from seeing that, I, the first time I entered teen court, I was interested. There's not many programs for teens specifically. And teen court, I was, I was given the engagement opportunity to be able to help others. And I was also given the, oppor <clears throat> the opportunity to sit as a student judge. And teen court was an amazing opportunity because I've met prosecutors on the way. I've met actual judges. And I mean, being able to be given the opportunity and see a new perception of everyone's lives, everyone's different in teen court. It's not like a specific uh, personality that you see. Everyone's different. Everyone changes over the course of time. And it's interesting being able to give, be able to be given the opportunity to talk to these people after they sit as a respondent, because I was able to see how have you changed, how have you reflected on your life so far, and to see that that was amazing to me to see how different people have changed over the course of Teen Court. Thank you, thank you, all three, um, and I, I don't think that I could say it any better than. Um, than these three have. So that's all I have for you. Thank you so much.
Thank you. I, I just have, I have to speak. I have to thank the three of you so much for speaking to us. I, I learned more in those five minutes than I've learned in months. I mean, that was just, that was incredible. Um, I, young lady, I was a psychology major and um, I went to UMBC. UMBC would be so fortunate to have you. Um, all of you have amazing stories. You have, you have amazing college essays that you could be writing and, and please keep, keep on track because these institutions um, need students like you. Someone who has overcome challenges and turned their lives around, you're, you're way ahead of where a lot, a lot of people w would be in their 20s. So um, just thank you so much for coming here today. Thank you. So I, I, I'm going to close on, on that slide with simply saying this. Tamika mentioned it. I want to say it again. We're having an impact with the kids we need to have the positive impact with. 60% of our diversion is minority kids, the kids that we're trying to make sure we get over the humps that get placed in, in front of them in life. Um, and I'm very proud of it. I, I hope you guys are today, too, after you've heard about that. Thank you. And moving on. Do we have another slide? Oh, SROs. So I'm extremely proud of our SROs. At the outset, I, I want to tell everybody, because it seems like a lot of folks in the county don't know this. There is a, a state mandated curriculum um, centering on being trauma informed alternatives to um, citation and arrest, supportive practices, coaching, mentoring. And one of our SROs, John Carrier, co authored that curriculum for the state of Maryland. Um, so the good stuff that we're doing is seen kind of inside the world of SROs and maybe inside the world of education, but a lot of people outside that world who aren't paying attention to it every day don't know that stuff. Um, our, one of our primary caregivers as a crisis intervention team officer, um, Alan Marcus was recognized internationally as the best crisis intervention officer on earth uh, last year. So we're doing a lot right that people don't hear about my promise is that we'll keep doing it right. Pretty proud of our, I'm proud of all of them, but in the last week or two I've had another um, shining example of why I should be proud of our SROs. Corporal Vasquez is our SRO at Annapolis Middle School. She is obviously a Latina um, and she has done a lot with the kids who've been impacted by gangs um, in the last couple years feeding into the Annapolis High School through Annapolis Middle School. She is the only certified instructor of Chinchle that I'm aware of in this area, which is a gang avoidance strategy for Latinas. And as a part of her efforts last week, she started a running club with her young Latina ladies um, in the school. She's got 20, 22 kids. Um, we were able to get um, some help to get them running shoes and a couple days a week they're in a running club um, keeping them busy in a positive manner and there's a million of those success stories that I could tell you guys today this one just happened to have happened in the last week or two um, so it's fresh in my mind we can move on to the next slide Ugh. I don't even know I don't know if I can make it through this one so if nobody's heard of Mo Gabba in the room. Mo is he's probably 14 now. He's a young man who's on his third or fourth fight with cancer. He's been blinded. Um, Corporal Chris Lindsenbigler is our SRO at um, Lindale. And there's no other way to say it than he and Mo have become kind of best buddies. He shows up at Mo's house. I think these two set a standard for relationships between cops and the kids that they serve that, that could be held up worldwide um, as an example of hope and investment. I think um, it shows really who our SROs try to be every day. Um, there's no doubt about it that SROs in school mean that there's going to be enforcement activity sometimes. It is a necessary part of the job. 
but the picture that I'm trying to paint for you guys today is that they don't consider it the primary part of their job. They consider it fourth or fifth tier in um, behind coaching, mentoring, keeping kids safe, and building bridges. Um, and I'm very proud of them. Next slide, please. More on the SROs. There's John Carrier I was telling you about with the Captain America shield. Corey Eslick, I'm ashamed to say I told him he couldn't have his own official Twitter a couple years ago, so he's been doing his own unofficial Twitter. Um, <laughs> that, and I'm really reconsidering, although as soon as I let people have Twitters, I'm going to have a headache out of it. Um, but you see the story there of him and the young lady that he developed uh, an extremely beautiful relationship with. And what I, what I find almost most gratifying about that is he has the same relationship with her father. Um, and he's been a constant source of positivity in her life. And um, the elf costume just shows you they're willing to be silly sometimes too, I guess. Moving on, please. So I think the watchwords um, that Tamika and I use, and we meet, uh, she falls into our chain of command um, just under the direction of Captain Fred Plitt, who's in the back. Fred, would you put your hand up for me? And um, so we meet all the time on how can we get better? How can I push money her way that she needs? How do we think outside the box? What can I cheat on to, to make wins for kids? Things like that. Um, and our watchwords really are being collaborative, evidence-based, because it's important to help the kids the way they need to be helped, and being uh, data-driven in our responses. So Mead is a perfect example of that. That's where the support, in part, large part, needs to be in the county, and it's going to be there from the police department. And I do believe that may be our last slide. So I'll take questions. Um, I'm going to... Uh start with Ms. Antwine who had re made the request in it, um, from the beginning and then we'll roll down starting uh, thereafter with Ms. Ellis, uh, Ms. Alvey and Ms. Shalheim. Ms. Antoine. I, I, I didn't get a chance to write down all of my questions yet. I got about 200 more. That's okay. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> I want to first publicly say thank you. We're glad to do it, ma'am. Service hardly ever is contingent on pay. It's hardly ever contingent on notoriety. Service comes from here. I've been in Anne Arundel County since 2004. One of my main concerns was raising my son as a single parent in, a, in another area. I have purposely chosen Fairfax County for safety and security. I s want to thank you all. Not only have you been very successful in keeping our county safe, but you've been instrumental in changing lives. I know that personally. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate the support. The request, of course, was made because of the information that was true but it also introduced different perceptions and it definitely put an incredible school feeder system in a poor light, including the SROs that I have witnessed. This is heavy. This is heavy because I've witnessed you all firsthand support students, students who trust the SROs, uh, SROs sometimes more than their parents. You all do, and you're shorthanded. We want to make that clear as well, that your, the police department is in constant need of additional people. But what I have appreciated most is the fact that even with everything you all are doing, you're here still. You're here to let us know as the public that we are committed to your safety, your security, and your students' well-being overall. Yes, ma'am. So, thank you. Thank you. The next thing I want to do, because I don't want to waste time crying, I want to thank you personally, Chief. I put out a phone call to you. You answered it. I wanted to come see you. 
you made you made room and everywhere I have been and I have seen you you have been consistent in your leadership and your support to our county so thank you personally thank you all right so now for the questions um, Often you talk about the barriers that are introduced when we are trying to collaborate as a school system between law enforcement and the school system and the variables that come into play to keep us from, uh, that challenges us in our success in doing that. Can you share some of those barriers, please? Sure. So one of my bigger frustrations is we spent a lot of time here today showing you kind of who we are, you know. Um, I think that that message doesn't get out enough, um, and that's a failing on our part, without a doubt. It's also a failing in the, the ability that I have to do it, you know, finite resources. Um, so marketing is not something that police are trained to do all the time. I think we need to get better at it so that all of the educators in Anne Arundel County have a feeling that we're not the enemy. I um, think we got some work to do on that. Uh, it's been a tough six or seven years nationally for policing, and much of it we got to own. Um, you know, I have a lot of talks with people about that national conversation. I try to drag them back to Anne Arundel County because I'm only responsible for Anne Arundel County. <laughs> and more fairly, I can only work on the problems of Anne Arundel County be an advocate outside, but um, we've got something going pretty good here. Um, there's always room for improvement. I think teachers and cops are on just naturally different wavelengths sometimes. I think we've, we've dialed those wavelengths into being closer over the last five, eight years, and I'm not taking credit for that, by the way, but at all. Um, we just need to refine that, I think. Um, I think communication is important. I think whenever you have 200 people communicating with 200 people, filtering occurs, if that makes sense. Um, filtering adulterates message uh, sometimes. So for instance, when, when you're talking about statistics, historically, I think we've got We've got the group of SROs, 20, I think we're 25-ish SROs, talking to 25-ish principals, plus your other 100 and, well, we've got 125 total, 125 total schools. So, and then what happens in the schools without SROs, you have all those police talking to all those administrators and teachers, and filtering happens, if that makes sense. Now, on a positive message, I think that's okay. Um, when we're showing up to be lunch buddies. When you're talking about the bad days, um, when cops do have to make enforcement decisions, I think we need to get better at making sure we're talking with one voice to one set of ears. So the message um, coming directly from us is my message. Not, I'm not always the one saying it, but my people know what my message is um, and then it gets heard with one set of ears. And I think particularly with statistics, we've had a problem with that, which is why you see differences, I think. Um, I think we're putting uh, safeties in place now to make sure that there's always, that communication is occurring at the lowest possible level, which is healthy. But then there's extra communication through singular points of contact higher up to make sure that we're all on the same sheet of music, if that makes sense. Yes, sir, it does. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, Ms. Tamika, I'm sorry, I did not write down your last name. So, I, is Ms. Tamika okay for now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you as well. You. When we made the request to get the um, most updated arrests and citations report, we're the layman making that request. We had no idea that you were a single point of reference for that, that you have to manually put all of that in and ensure no mistakes. Yes, ma'am. So thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's incredibly tedious. And, and to see your presentation today on top of that request, thank you. Um, thank you for what you do for our students, our community,
for our county. Thank you. Um, you all introduced what you call frontline diversion. You introduced a phrase called meaningful intervention uh, and enforcement activity. You have to do your jobs and that is to be respected and understood. And often those jobs are done in our schools. So I wanted to better understand how we could as a school system before you are involved introduce meaningful intervention your recommendations on that how we can be that front line rather than you in diversion opportunities for our students um, so I, I will say that that is um, an area that is my personal um, research project is how we can better um, collaborate um, as chief said I'm in grad school and that is my my area of research focus and so I am working on pulling what what else is out there because I don't have the answer personally um, but I'm constantly trying to educate myself on what the best practices are what guidelines are out there for us and um, I say in very very close contact with um, my chain of command regarding like proposals and, and what those best practices are and so that's something that we're working on i don't have an answer for you today um i don't know that i'll ever have an answer for you but i know it's something that i'm working that we're working on um and those conversations are happening and w we're working on putting something together to see how we can best collaborate can i jump in on yes, that? Sir. so i think exactly that question is why we had the shared training between the principals and the sros in january i think the understanding of unintended consequences <clears throat> is a biggie. The principal at North County High School, I should be ashamed of myself right now. Jeff Jefferson, Principal Jefferson kind of sets a standard on the differentiation of his maintaining good discipline in the school, right, in a positive way, and the police getting involved. And he's very trauma-informed. I'm kind of proud of him a lot as we talk. Me too. Um, he's a model that I think stands the test of scrutiny. Um, and so I, I think we are working on that. Dr. Arlotto and I talk about that constantly. Um, I'll, I'll use an example. Everyone knows we were having problems at the football games in the fall. So I think there was a belief from staff, and it's okay. I, I don't know teacher stuff. I don't expect teachers to know cop stuff. There was a belief that we could do certain things on escorting people out, but we can't. Maryland law prohibits the police from saying you have to leave and then escorting someone out. Our sole statutory fix is arrest. Right? So the custodians of the property, the, the administration, teachers, athletic directors, security staff, have to do those things and the police are there to make sure it stays safe. So that kind of detail is very important if you think about it, right? right. Um, and we're working together over time to get much better at that so that just that little thing I just told you is a big deal if you, if you think about it, the repercussions that it can have with police putting a hand on somebody trying to walk them out. We don't, we're not empowered to do that because the moment we do that, we've arrested somebody. Right. Do you see? So those realities are very important to get through. And historically, I, I think there was a big need and then we're getting much better at it nowadays. Did we answer your question okay? Excellent, thank you. Um, so w with your presentation, with your, you, you being here, I would like to pose a motion to the board. Your reports have helped us. Your work has helped us tremendously. Um, but once we get that, it's not okay for us just to have numbers and, and line items. We have to do something. In order to make good decisions, we have to utilize the data as you presented in your presentation for meaningful intervention, for support to these students to put them on tracks as the, as the other the students earlier um, testified to. So my, my motion is that the board requests the superintendent 
to work with the Anne Arundel County Police Department to receive and to generate an annual arrest and citations report and that that report once <coughs> once generated and reviewed be presented to the board no later than November of each year this report would be for the previous school year and not the current Ms. Hall, we have a, a motion and a second. Um, do you, it, did everybody um, hear the full motion? We, we good? Okay. We have a second. Now, I'm, I'm going to clear the board of the chief alternary questions because we have a motion taking precedent, and then whoever wants to come in on debate or comment. Seeing none, uh, Ms. Hall, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? I'm sorry. Ms. Shawheim? Aye. Ms. Antwine? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Lyme? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Alvey? Aye. Ms. Corkado? Aye. Motion passes 8 0. Ms. Antwine, did you have any further questions or comments for the chief? The chief was kind enough to give me his cell phone, so I'll, <laughs> I'll save him for that. <laughs> Just don't give it to everybody, will you? My bad, Chief. <laughs> no, ma'am, I do not. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Ellis. Thank you. Um, both of you, all of you, uh, that truly was one of the best and most informative presentations I've seen as a board member. I cannot thank you all enough for being here today. Um, Chief, I want to make a plug for you. I did attend the um, Hate and Bias Forum last week. I heard you loud and clear, so I want to, in case we have an expanded audience and others are listening, um, this is for our students, perhaps their parents or others who might be listening that are considering a career change. If you do not see yourself represented in your police department, Chief wants you. Please, Thank please you. keep that in mind. and. Um, I, I think you'll be well taken care of in your career. So um, I, I, I know how important that is. Um, I have one question. I, so I, I may maintain a pretty large presence on social media. I belong to as many groups as I can because I feel like I get a lot of information um, that doesn't come to us formally. And um, I, I was witness to a conversation recently about um, it, it was about police presence within neighborhoods. And, um, you know, we can talk about what we can do in our schools all day long, but um, we, we know the neighborhood presence is so important. And I know you talked about all the efforts you have um, and activities going on, but this conversation was particularly about um, a police beat and having, having particular officers um, maintaining a presence within um, confined neighborhoods and communities and really developing those relationships. Now this was uh, the conversation I witnessed would, would apply to Annapolis City, but I know there's other neighborhoods um, in the county. Um, can you speak to that a bit? Uh, I, I think the idea was sort of like the, the function that our SR, SROs serve in our schools, um, it would be a similar type of um, purpose within communities, within neighborhoods, that doesn't just apply to our youth because you, you need buy-in with, with the adults in the community too to be successful and um, steer our youth in the right direction. Yes, ma'am, it's extremely important. So it's a tenant of community policing also. Um, I think that the sweet spot in policing is being intelligence-led and then community oriented. So one of the one of the downsides, if you've ever heard the term CompStat, CompStat is the, the paradigm of policing in the early 2000s. And it's all about, you have numbers, you have a map, you have dots that are crimes on your map, put the police on the dots, right? But what that forgets is that human beings exist right. elsewhere, right? So. Um, what we try to do in the county is, is kind of find a sweet spot between definitely being intelligence-led, but staying community 
oriented and even more than community oriented down to individual oriented sometimes. I think um, CIT is a perfect example of that. Um, there's thousands of mental health consumers in this county that they are helping stay away from a crisis day er every day, you know, um, down to a simple phone call. Hey, buddy, you taking your medic medication this week? You know, um, things like that. So it's very important. In the county, if you remember at the outset of our briefing today, I told you all the positive stuff had gone away. So we're back to having a police and community together unit in all four police districts. It's two per district except for Southern where I've only got one up and running. We'll get there with our second. And then remember that the district commander and deputy commander have their police community relations council meetings that meet every month to talk about community stuff. And then I expect not just those packed officers, packed police and community together is packed. Not just the packed officers, but the beat cops need to be in our community uh, meetings monthly. Might not be the same cop because the shifts rotate, right? But they should know their beat cops. If you look at the old footbeat model of the 30s, 20s, before cars started taking off, particularly in, in cities, the great thing about that was it, it naturally lent itself to community policing because the, the footbeat cop knew everybody. He knew Miss Sally would tell him what was going on as long as people weren't watching, right, on the corner. Miss Sally lives 123 Main Street. She's going to tell me anything I need to know whenever I need to know it. He knew or she knew what families were struggling, where mom was working three jobs to feed the family, where the support might be needed in a positive way which kids he had shot at having a positive intervention with, which had gone so far that he probably didn't or she probably didn't have a shot with. So the, the relationship with the communities brings all that stuff to the table. There's no doubt about it. Policing is not about handcuffs. Should have never been all about handcuffs, but for a while it got that way. The relationships that you just dis dis discussed and that I've described here in the past couple minutes or how you keep that balance going, people have to get arrested. People have to get arrested, right? People do things wrong, they have to be held accountable. That's part of living in a, in a society. But there's a lot of positive you can bring even behind that. And that's, that's where we try to be in the county. And I'll, I don't wanna speak for Chief Jackson, but he and I have talked a lot. He believes in that 100%, <clears throat> so I think it's fair to assume that you will see much more of that moving forward than perhaps has been the case in Annapolis City. Thank you, and, and just to speak to a couple of things you said, I mean, uh, the conversation very much took a turn to the old days, and that's, that's kind of what drove the conversation. Um, but also, um, uh, shoot, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, anyway, it, it, was, it was about the relationships and um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, that there are efforts we'll never stop in that working. direction thank you so much yes ma'am thank you miss Ellis miss Alvey and then miss Shawhan miss Alvey so my goal is always to bring the conversation back to the students and um, <coughs> this is a really important issue and going to Annapolis High School um, which we have pockets of communities, um, pockets of students who are from communities that struggle um, with their relationships with the police. This issue really hits home for me. Um, so with that being said, you if this is of security concern, the question I'm about to ask, you can always um, tell me that it's you can't answer it in public. But after um, a student is arrested in or outside of school, and all the students who are watching that occur, which I have, what kind of efforts are taking place to restore the student body's faith that the, the police is there to protect them? And I know that's hard for me because I have a very positive relationship with my SROs, even if it's just over my parking spot every day. Um, <laughs> but it's hard for students to trust their SROs again if they've just seen their friend be arrested, um, which is a tough sight for the student who's being arrested and everybody else who's watching that happen. So I guess my question is then, again, like what kind of steps are taken to restore that relationship with the student body as a whole? Great question. 
So there's a couple steps. A, particularly for your school, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of your classmates have noticed that there's two, they're policed by two different color shirts, right? So um, the dark blue shirt needs to be more involved in, and this isn't in the school, but bear with me because I'll get there, okay? The dark blue shirt needs to get a lot more involved in the positive angles of policing. It's why I have pounded on the table since I've been chief to get Annapolis City into the SRO game. Um, it's not about money. It isn't about us not wanting to do it. It's about that police department needs to work on its relationship with the community that it serves. Um, so that's one thing, trying to work on that. It's, it's without a doubt that friction points occur, particularly um, allow, allow this observation. We use the word child. I'm not terribly sure you're a child to me, so I think that's kind of a given, right? You're a, young, you're a young lady, for sure. But when you're talking about a six foot two, 240 pound lineman on a football team, it's tough for us to handle that confrontation like we're doing it with a child. So I think we have to do that on the backside, on the supports that we're talking about. Order has to be maintained. It has to be reinstilled very quickly when you have a brawl in the school, which I'm also sure you've seen. Um, so it ain't necessarily officer friendly showing up in that situation, right? And I'm not sure I want it to be officer friendly showing up in that moment, in that situation. Um, but the supports have to come after. So step one, I would not have made a good SRO when I was a young officer because I didn't get the soft side of policing for several years. So that's step one. We have to choose the right cops to go into those schools um, who understand that after that encounter, it is absolutely their responsibility to try to build a bridge back with that kid the next week and that kid's friends the next week. We also have CIT and mobile who will and do come into schools after something kicks off, not just a negative encounter with police, but certainly some of the negative encounters with police. Um, I will tell you that we have to be we have to be welcomed for that, right? So some schools are more welcoming than others on occasion. Annapolis High School always welcomes us. So that's not a problem at your school and or Annapolis Middle School. Um, so the, the, the outreach after a bad day is extremely important. I agree with you. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm so proud of our SROs. And it, it, it's made even more pronounced for me because I understand I wouldn't have been good at that when I was younger. Um, so we tend to pick very mature, and I don't mean in age, I mean in, in um, their thinking, critical thinking, and, and very open people to be SROs in the school. And then anytime we have a bad day, you will see their bosses showing up as with mobile crisis, crisis intervention, just to extend that friendly hand the next day to say, welcome back to school, guys. Everything's good. We're going to have a good day, things like that. Did I answer your question okay? We could probably get better at it. I'll admit that. Thank you, Ms. Alvey. Ms. Shawhan. I don't think I could have said it better than Ms. Antoine and Ms. Ellis, um, so I'll just simply say thank you. Thank you for all that you both do uh, for our community, both in our schools and around the county. Um, the work that you do and that your officers do, uh, even when they're not at schools, when they're watching other uh, critical infrastructures and the like um, on their on their off time, um, I'm personally grateful for um, and uh, and yeah I, I I just was very impressed with everything you said at the forum. Thank you. And um, and I'm I'm just really grateful for your um, partnership with our school system and uh, with the relationships that your SRS form with our students every day is it's critical and even on those even on those bad days you know um, it's uh, it's it's everything in this day and age and not something that existed when I was coming up through schooling and yes. uh, and uh, so I'm just really grateful for for all of you and thank you for um, for being here today too thanks thank you ma'am thank you Michelle hi Miss Hummer 
Yes, um, just I want to highlight again and say bravo for the 80% of the students that are not having, go through your diversion programs and then aren't having any interactions. I think that's the goal for all of us is we're doing everything we can on the school level to try to help the kids make good choices. Unfortunately, sometimes they don't and then they come to y'all and then y'all are doing everything in partnership with us to make sure that those kids are learning from that mistake so they don't make it again and so that we don't end up I some of the best parenting advice I ever got was catch your child do, being bad you know start catch them young when they're doing bad so that you can teach them and help them to make better choices and that's what we've got to do with our kids so that they don't become adults that are having more problems and so that 80 percent rate that's fabulous and so great job Thank you. Okay. Uh, looks like we're pretty good shape. I just want to extend thank you first to Ms. Antwine, uh, my fellow member, for making the request. And Chief Altamari, you definitely took the request to the next level. And I think providing this opportunity for us to exchange more than uh, data specific points has been very beneficial. And uh, so the Chief and I also talked about maybe in addition to Ms. Antwine's motion of report, that maybe every four to six months you come down and give us an update on some of the progress that we're making with a lot of these aspects, just in a general sense, just like we had today, and afford those conversations to continue to open up. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much once again. And um, at this time, we're going to take a short, um, five, quick five-minute break to take care of the photos of our recognized of the months uh, that have been so patient to wait. Uh, unique to this morning because of Chief Altamere, and they will then we will resume with public comment.
missions we do not do on every meeting, but most certainly worthy of our guests in time. Uh, item 4.0 is public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on an item not on today's agenda may offer testimony during this public comment portion of the meeting. Speakers are allotted three minutes each and may not allocate their times to others. A tone will sound when the time has expired. The board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing this meeting. Student specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. It is not the board's general practice to engage in question and answer sessions with the speakers. For the record, please provide your name before speaking and handouts should be given to the board assistant for dissemination. With that, we have um, 11 people who have signed up either in advance or this morning. And so um, we've got quite a few uh, today. I'm going to be calling up a total of five people at a time. And first we have Lisa McCurney, Jacqueline Boone Alsop, Dr. Didone, Doning, sorry, <laughs> um, Miss India Oaks, that's so many, one, two, three, four, and Miss Tony Pratt. Good afternoon, Madam President, members of the board. I stand before you to speak of the epidemic of the hate bias incidents in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. I stand before you to carry the frustration of over 600 Anne Arundel County NAACP <coughs> members. I stand before you carrying the frustration of generations of Anne Arundel County Public Schools students and parents. We have been at this for years, and it doesn't seem to be getting better. The data suggests it is getting worse. Although we acknowledge that it might be the result of better reporting, yet every time another incident of bias or hate is <coughs> published, and there we are, and I've heard of three separate ones last week. These are not isolated incidents to us. They are ongoing, continuous assaults on our mental health and resilience. The principal sends letters home to the parents after the incidents occur. The board members should be also sending letters to the sco schools that they represent. Therefore, in concert with the Caucus of African American Leaders and other organizations committed to fight hate and bias in our schools and in our community, we had advised the following. The Board of Education to task the Citizen Advisory Committee to investigate why these incidents are arising in each school cluster and what can be done to reduce the incidents. Ensure the CAC includes the voices of the students and parents of that cluster. Make this a permanent tasking requiring the CAC to report regularly to the public venue. Create a permanent hate bias focus within Anne Arundel County under the direct and personal leadership of Dr. Alato. Keep the data visible to the public and speak on it, write on it at least monthly. Adhere to a zero tolerance approach to hate and bias incidents within Anne Arundel County Public Schools consistent across the entire system. This means maximum enforcement of consequences for verifiable hate and bias incidents within the limits of the student code of conduct. Establish equivalent consequences for any staff, faculty, or contractors found responsible for similar transgressions, including failure to report or to intervene. I have lived in Anne Arundel County all, my whole life. I was part of the last class, graduating class of the Wally H. Bates High School. I am in my fourth term as president of the Anne Arundel County branch of the NAACP. I've served on multiple county and state task force. I'm a registered nurse and a mental health nurse educator who has spent her career working with youth. Our county executive has declared racism a public health crisis. He's right. Our children are suffering from the pervasious hate bias incidents in our schools, and this, does, this has to stop. In conclusion, the Anne Arundel County NAACP believes strong 
consistent and ongoing actions against hate and bias incidents, including the actions we have offered in this testimony, is essential for the physical and mental health of our children and of their future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'm just going to call one more time. I didn't see Lisa McCurney um, that I had called. Seeing none, okay, that has expired. Um, next. Down the line. Um, Mary Didoni, Anne Arundel County NAACP member of the Education Committee. And I speak today for my position as a member of the Education Committee. We fully support the testimony of President Jacqueline Alsup, and we wish to reiterate, reiterate the following demand and offer several proposed actions. We reiterate the demand for a uniform, system wide, zero tolerance approach to hate and bias incidents. We request this body, in collaboration with the NAACP and other stakeholders, define in policy what zero tolerance means and enact that decision via either a new AACPS regulation or modifications of existing AACPS regulations. We propose that AACPS establish an online and constantly updated tracker for hate bias incidents. This tractor tracker should track incidents and their status toward resolution without highlighting anything that could give the offenders any additional motivation or motivate copycats. The Education Committee has developed some suggestions and we'll share them with the Board in a separate communication. Because of his position and power, we ask that Dr. Alato publicly and personally take ownership, executive ownership of an AACPS-wide program to identify, address, mitigate, and eliminate hate and bias incidents within AACPS and at sponsored events. We recommend Dr. Olato personally present and disseminate a monthly executive summary of the hate and bias incidents and trends within AACPS, including a monthly presentation before this body, posted video and text of the presentation, and a monthly guest column in the local newspapers. This would be in collaboration with the kinds of reports we will hear later this morning, afternoon. We know that we are fighting against a national trend abetted by bias-based reasoning, language, and behavior from the highest levels of public visibility down to the constant intrusion of biased language and hate into the lives and minds of our faculty, staff, and especially our student classrooms via social media and entertainment. To combat this, we need to show a different picture. We therefore request that AACPS make equally prominent their efforts and the statistics around recruitment and retention of non-white faculty and staff at all levels and in all disciplines. We again recommend that Dr. Olato personally and publicly head this effort and participate in quarterly reporting on AACPS efforts, statistics, and trends towards diversifying the faculty and staff at all levels and in all schools. Again, an executive function tied to the kind of report we'll hear later this afternoon. Finally, we ask this board to make their commitment against hate and bias visible and systemic through including an equity impact assessment in each proposed policy, regulation, and budget proposal, including an equity impact assessment of all existing policies and regulations. This could be performed in accordance with the suggestions of the MABE equity lens. These assessments should be made public and presented along with each proposed policy and regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning. Madam President, my name is Tony Pratt, and I'm also in agreement with the recommendations from the CAL and the NAACP, but I come on a more personal basis in reference to the um, hate and bias crimes in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Um, I'm a grandmother of a student that goes to Germantown Elementary, and she's been affected by two hate crimes that hasn't been reported. Um, the first one was a Caucasian student called her a nigger in Spanish. And a Spanish boy told her what he said. N no teacher called, no principal called, but I sent an email. And they made excuses to why the young boy said that. He was talking about the colors. That's not acceptable. It was never, never reported. It was never documented. I recently had a conversation and sent an email to ask what happened and what was the reporting process. Nothing happened. Just this week, I got a phone call home about my granddaughter hitting another student. Um, I asked what had happened. She clearly visibly got upset, and she wouldn't talk to the, the teacher or the principal or the assistant principal, and none of them looked like her. So as I was called to go to the school, 
and she began to tell me what had happened. She came home from school and she got in the van and she said, Nana, I didn't tell you something. And I said, what? She said, I didn't feel comfortable talking to the principal or the assistant principal or the teacher. She said, none of them look like me. And when I make complaints or I tell about things that happened to me, I get treated differently. She's in the second grade. We're starting a trend that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for her to go to school every day and not feel safe and feel that she has to do things that aren't in her character to keep her safe. We need to do something, and it starts with a zero tolerance. What are we doing with the authority figures and the teachers and the principals who are part of the problem? I'm here visibly upset not about our county just having the highest hate bias crime rate, but every day almost you hear about our schools, hanging nooses, swastikas, writing on the bathroom walls. And it seems as though we make excuses, but I'm tired of the excuses. I want action. Thank you. I believe we have a couple questions um, before we proceed with Ms. Oaks, um, or did you guys want to wait? Um, Ms. Antoine and Ms. Hummer. Okay, um, Ms. Hummer and then Ms. Antoine. It's Ms. Alsup and Ms. Dodone. Would y'all make sure that you share all of your the your suggestions and comments <coughs> so that we can all receive it and we have a chance to to review and look at all of your ideas and things ahead of time. I mean, yes, uh, we can look at it in depth and and really respond to it well. So, as secretary, I will sure those are sent as soon as we're back home. Yes, please do, so that I'm, I know that we would all like to look at those um, in more detail and, and carefully. Thank you, Miss Antoine. That was that was actually my request as well um, for Doctor and Doctor. If you could um, please make sure we we get your recommendations so that we can make informed decisions on. And while I have a live mic. Um, I wanted to request Dr. Alato. Um, she, she's um, the, the the grandmother has testified that every day there's a second grader that's afraid to come to school. Is there someone within the system that can work with her before she leaves today to get interventions for her grandchild, please? So, so you guys are on it. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Ms. Oaks. Good afternoon. India Oaks, Hillsmere parent, human rights lawyer, and Board of Education candidate. Former Canadian Prime Minister Lester Pearson once said, misunderstanding arising from ignorance breeds fear and fear remains the greatest enemy of peace. Those words could not be any truer when it comes to hate incidents. The racist incidents at Southern Middle and Chesapeake High last week are just two more signs of how systemic racism is within our county, and country for that matter. We cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them and given that these incidents continue to occur, AACPS cannot just keep doing what it currently does to address these issues. I have stated this for years, and I will keep saying this, sending letters home to families at the specific school is not enough. In the face of such hate, silence is deadly, and if we truly want to raise awareness on how prevalent racism is, we need to notify all RAACPS families every time these incidents happen. Just as we cannot simply tell families to talk about hate to their kids. Merely explaining to our kids what hate is, if the family actually does that, is not enough. Awareness is not enough. Knowing that racism exists is not enough for people, and if I may say, specifically white people, to want to see it eliminated. 
Too often racism has to disrupt the lives of people before they are moved to action. And we should not be educating our students to be in that reactionary mode. We must take steps to address the root causes of such hate, if we want to stop it. Just as having unity days such as today, although I don't see much orange in this room today, or professional development on unconscious bias, is not enough. If we do not have measures in place to track if what is being taught is actually being implemented. There is no question we have a great community to combat hate and bias, with groups like the Kindness Club in South County, or advocacy from organizations like the Caucus of African American Leaders, including everyone that is in the audience today, but these are the same people that show up at the Hate and Bias Forum, at town halls on gun violence. And so again, I say the current system is not enough. If we are not proactively reaching the people that may be next to incite such hate, we all need to do more, and we need to do it now. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Oaks. Okay, we're going to um, ask the ne ne next folks to come on up, please. Carl Snowden, Heather Coles, Don Zebron, Jessica O'Kane, and Mike Shea. When you're ready, Mr. Sun. Madam President, members of the board, <clears throat> my name is Carl Snowden. I'm representing the Caucus of African American Leaders. I'm here to underscore two points. One, extremely disappointed that the Board of Education, where we formally made a request that the CSC be involved in conducting an investigation. I had originally communicated a year ago, almost, sorry, last year, uh, with the previous president, got assurances that we would be moving forward, talked to the current president, and quite candidly was very disturbed to read in the paper that the president, I assume speaking on behalf of the board, that a decision had been made. No consultation, no discussion. There is a statement that was once made by a man named Bull Connor, and he was talking to Martin Luther King Jr., and he defined racism and white supremacy. He gave the best definition I ever heard. What he said was that racism is a, quest, is a situation where people with power, people who are in positions of power, make the following statement. It's just a question of mind over matter. We don't mind and you don't matter. Excellent definition, in my opinion, of racism. To hear and to read that the reason this issue of racial incidents that recess, according to the newspaper article, recess, and the fact that you have the CSC dealing with the issue of recess, there's not enough time to deal with the issue of racism. How insulting. Do you have any idea what that says to people who happen to be people of color? Our children subject to nooses, racial threats, tell us that you don't have, that this is not a priority. There are two final things I want to say before the time runs out. Generally, I try to work with people. I have a great deal of respect for the county executive, but I'm here to tell you I think he made a terrible mistake when he decided not to take a survey, the one, the first of its kind in Anne Arundel County, to see how pervasive the issue of racism is in the county. I think that was a mistake. I think we need to know what we're dealing with, and having a survey would do that. And lastly, the reason I wanted to see ASC involved, I think parents need to talk to parents in the feeder system. 
Chesapeake High School, where one of these incidents took place, why shouldn't parents who are part of CSC talk to their fellow parents about these incidents and to hear from them what their recommendations would be as to how to curtail it? Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, are these questions to the person testifying or in general? Probably, probably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ma'am? Okay. Members of the board, Madam President, uh, Dr. Alato, good morning. Uh, my name is Dawn Zebron. I am a resident of Pasadena. My daughter is a sophomore at Chesapeake High School, and I'm 100% opposed to the cell tower proposal for our campus. I emailed each of you a copy of my testimony along with a petition with 340 signatures of people that are also opposed to a cell tower on our campus. I've sat in here and I've let, listened to the Shady Side team um, talk about the science and harm to our, their children from cell towers that were proposed for their school, and this board stopped construction of the Shady Side Tower. My question is why would one be allowed on any school grounds after that? I have volunteered at our schools for the last 20 years. In the time that I, I have learned that AACPS follows an evidence-based best practice approach, we set up a task force of 70 plus people from across the county to research best practices and approaches to tackle big concerns like mental health and suicide. And there are limitations on what we can and can't do for liability and safety reasons like we can't have a cool BMX bully prevention assembly or a community bond fair. But it's okay to put a 5G macro cell tower emitting electromagnetic radiation on campus a few hundred feet from where t our students are eating lunch or just a few feet from where they play sports for hours every day. Um, but it, uh, is the tower benefiting the people placed at risk the most? No. There's cell service around all three schools on campus. There's some not go so good inside the building areas, but that's because it's concrete and brick, and it's not the tower is not going to change that. I've spent hours looking for evidence saying these towers benefit our students and staff. The only evidence I have found is the growing science behind non-ionizing radiation being harmful to developing brains. The radiation from tower antenna changes DNA over time. Developing brains absorb the radiation ten times as much as adults. Biological, mental, and behavioral changes are seen. This is from peer-reviewed evidence-based medical journals from renowned doctors and scientists, leaders in their field. This is not their first rodeo, asbestos lead paint roundup jewel. This is peer-reviewed and evidence-based by renowned scientists and medical doctors. National Institute of Health PubMed Journal states there is clear cause for concern in the scientific medical communities. Based on this growing evidence, the National Institute of Health made recommendations in August and again in November 2019. No cell towers within 1,640 feet of schools or hospitals. We need to practice the pause here, think first. Is it needed to provide students FAPE? No. Is it safe? The medical science says no. Is there a risk? Yes. Is it worth the risk of our students? No. Can it be placed somewhere else? Yes. We don't want or need this tower on school grounds and request this board give equity to our community and find an alternative site not on school grounds for the tower. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Coles. I too have a student at Chesapeake High School. He's also a sophomore, and I wish I had the time to talk about the cell tower, but I also like to speak on the hate and the bias in our county. Um, first thing I'd like to say is that um, I am 100% against hate and racism in this county, and I feel that I should not be alone in being so bold in making that statement. I would love to hear that come from our board if at all possible, but um, I understand that if that is too much of a request. There's two things I'd like to speak on, and that's one, a baby was here earlier, and that baby started to cry, and I thought that the child wanted her mother. I couldn't give that to her, but what was given to her was a pacifier, and I would like for that not to happen to me and the people that are talking about this issue today. Um, first thing is, Halloween in 2009, I was shot with a BB gun, trick-or-treating with my children in a neighborhood that I lived across the street from the house. 
the individual who shot me didn't realize that I was his next door neighbor because he was aiming for my child in the stroller. Um, I say that to say, 2000, this year, this Halloween that just passed, um, there was a speeding driver in my neighborhood. <clears throat> I asked him to slow down and he didn't, so I took action. When that individual got out of his vehicle, he came at me as if he wanted to hurt me. I probably would have wanted to do the same. The only difference between this Halloween and that Halloween was that every adult jumped in his face also. Just like we say the Pledge of Allegiance here, it needs to be stated every single public meeting that we are against hate. We are not for the bias. I'm tired of being pacified. I'm tired of being told, okay, yeah, go send your kid to the school that you know they don't want him there. You know, I'm tired of that, and it's not okay for that to go down. I'll give you another, uh, another instance. Last week I had to call the police because a driver that worked with my company was attacked by a, um, a resident. Now, when I told them that this individual was spewing hate words, he's trying to get in his truck, he's being rude, the, I pl the police got there within maybe 45 seconds. And what impressed me was when, you got, when he got out the car, you could tell he meant business. And that's what I'd like to see from the board here or from everybody in this county, that we mean business and that we're not going to pacify the issue of racism anymore. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Shea. Mike Shea, President of South Arundel Citizens for Responsible Development in total solidarity with the NAACP on this real school issue. Process, transparency, and honesty. These are the reasons Milestone was thrown out of Prince George's County. Enough is enough. It's past time for our school system to get back to the mission of education and stop using our resources to subsidize Milestone cell tower business plan. As we share, as we shall share um, in future board meetings and upcoming board meetings, Milestone has continued to work against your direction with your senior administration staff. This has corrupted your staff and diverted resources intended for education. Through persistence in finally getting a well overdue Maryland public information request from your information officer, we obtained over 200 pages of emails that blow the whistle, showing the collusion that has corrupted our school administration. It is our attorney's letter of October 18, 2019 that stopped further review at planning and zoning on behalf of this tower project at Shadyside Elementary School. When reading these released emails, they show the school administration inappropriately and illegitimately assisting the cell tower company. These efforts are contrary to the board's vote and directive of December 19, 2018. I've been through the 203 pages of inappropriate emails and have categorized them into 12 areas that demonstrate and illustrate what's been going on behind the shady side community's back and more importantly, your back. At future meetings, I will continue to share the story of what we have found. It is our intention that you should remove Milestone from our community and all new proposed projects at Anne Arundel County Schools. Having your staff go rogue is a management problem and a misallocation of resources away from the mission of education. Let's back up to the 6-3 vote on December 19th, directing Superintendent Arleta to stand down the Shadyside Milestone proposed tower project. Let's repeat the 28 words of Eric Grannon's motion. The motion is the superintendent take all action necessary to pause the placement of the cell tower at Shadyside Elementary until further direction from the board otherwise. This vote was 6-3 in favor of the motion. What is it that Milestone, Dr. Alito, and the school administration did not understand? This issue was tabled. We get back to process, transparency, and honesty. These exact issues the community has been bringing up to this board now for years during multiple board changes. We've said in the past we're not going away until the Shady Side Tower proposal went away. Now we're not going away until Milestone goes away. Thank you, sir. We have a couple of questions uh, or comments from board members, I should say, probably. Um, Ms. Antoine and then Ms. Shawhan. Ms. Antoine. 
Thank you, President Corkadell. I appreciate all the testimony to include the cell phone towers. All, any, any testimony is important to this board. Um, I am disheartened, though, that I hear words like insulted from our public and especially our leaders in the public, words like unsafe, pacifying. These, these words should radiate with us. We should take action beyond what we're already taking. But let me take the time to tell you all, we are at constant, at constant work in eradicating hate and bias in our schools. Behind you is a staff that will put in overtime, undertime, time, time, time to do this. Dr. Alato himself writes columns every month. He is, anytime he's invited anywhere to speak on this issue, he's there. We are working as a board to do what we can to make decisions properly to ensure that we are keeping an eye on our bottom line, which is to teach and learn, our students to learn and our teachers to teach and have that ability to do that safely and soundly. The poisons that are in our system, we didn't request, but they're here. And so we will be continuously doing what it takes to ensure we introduce a presence that says we have a zero tolerance for this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Antoine. Michelle Hunt? I want to echo what uh, Ms. Antoine just said. And I am 100% against racism and bias in our schools and in our communities. So I wanted you to hear that from me. Thank you. 100%. Um, it, racism has no place in our schools. Hate has no place in our schools. Bias has no place in our schools. Bias and hate also have no place in my mind in the community at all, period, ever. Um, and I definitely appreciate the NAACP, the Caucus of African American Leaders, and your testimony today. And to that end, and I know we, we've talked about it a little bit in the, in the past, um, but I, I think we should bring it back up. And so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, and move that, uh, that the CAC uh, look into this on an ongoing basis um, alongside their other um, tasks because this is important and we need it to stop. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, and it looks like we have a couple comments. Um, Ms. Antoine and then Ms. Hummer. Ms. Antoine? I have a friendly amendment. Sure. <laughs> This is definitely an important motion. We have talked about this publicly and in closed session, but it needs to take a priority. So my, my friendly amendment would, would be that it, it is prioritized over everything else that the CAC is being requested to do at this time. I'll accept that. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Hummer? Yes, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I. I've been listening to everything they said, and I um, am especially very interested in Ms. Dodone and uh, Dr. Dodone and Ms. Alsop's um, suggestion about some uh, system-wide committee or something to look into these issues greater. And so while I'm not opposed to the CAC, it seems to me that this actually could be something that is broader that, and I, um, for the CAC right now, that 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 is not necessarily the best venue to, to have them be a part of it, but for us to look at something on a broader basis. So I'm not gonna support this today, not because I'm against us looking into it, it's just I would like to look at everything and consider and find the best avenue that we could have this. Because as we know, it is, every, one, every time we hear of this happening in our schools, it makes me sick to my stomach. Yesterday, I'm sure many of you saw in the news, there was a, white supremacist neo-Nazi group that puts stickers all over Annapolis Town Center. We're seeing, we turn around and it's everywhere in our community. It's so much bigger that's there. And so we need the parent voice that we get from CAC, but we also need the student voice in there. We need everyone to come together. And so I would really like to, us to pause on that and say, let's make it a priority to find a bigger method that, to bring everyone together on this rather than um, the CAC, which is, 
is parent volunteers that are coming without necessarily the expertise and guidance, and I think they would want to be a part of something larger that helps them to do that work. Ms. Ellis and then Ms. Antoine. Ms. Ellis. Thank you. Um, I actually uh, agree with what Ms. Hummer is saying. I, I want to add, um, so I, I agree that I think it's something that needs more focused attention and should be bigger than the CAC. This is not to say that the CAC should not be involved and I think CAC should have a presence on that committee or whatever group is, is investigating this, um, this topic. And beyond just representation, I could see the CAC being an arm of this effort where they, in other words, they can still go back to the CAC as a whole to gather information, but I do think that that should fall under a larger and more focused umbrella of some sort of, and I don't know what we want to call this, if it's a task force or some sort of um, organization or group that does have some more um, expert um, representation to, to drive this. Um, so for that reason, I, I don't want to vote in favor of putting the entirety of this issue on the CAC. I would like the CAC involved in whatever larger effort we come up with. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. We have Ms. Antwine, Ms. Schalheim, and then Mr. Lodd. Ms. Antwine. The request from Dr. Snowden back in November was that the hate and bias report that was requested in April and presented, I think, in September, be reviewed by the CAC and introduce outcomes um, to help us shape decisions. This was in November. Whatever happened, I'm not sure about, especially after hearing his testimony, I'm a little concerned. I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, but we cannot wait. We can have the CAC lead that type of task force, but the CAC is our citizen advisory committee. They need to have input from the citizens and they can engage effectively. That is their point and purpose. I, I agree, Ms. Hammer and Ms. Ellis, that we definitely need to involve other arms, and I believe the CAC should not be restricted in that outreach, which I understand is, has been concerns before. So if we are to introduce a bias and hate work group, I guess is what we're calling it, my recommendation is that the CAC leads it. Thank you, Ms. Antoine, Ms. Schulheim, and then Mr. Lott. I also don't agree. I, I also don't disagree with Ms. Hummer and Ms. Ellis, but I'm really tired of kicking the can down the road and down the road and down the road and when and how and what and like, oh, we need to wait on this or wait on that. No, no, this is, this is racism and hate in our schools. This negatively impacts our students, which are the focus of everything, on the daily. Imagine a student seeing those things in a bathroom stall or elsewhere and it it impacting them on the daily so i'm i'm just tired of reading about these in the paper i'm tired of seeing press releases saying that what's that and second getting it second hand or, or first hand or reading the press releases or whatever seeing the the letters that go home to parents this is not a this is not enough and i'm i'm tired of waiting so um, if we're going to do those things and have it be part of a bigger thing, then let's come up with a bigger thing now. Let's, let's go. Let's do this because I don't want to wait anymore. Um, and uh, and I, I just don't want to wait. The time is now to, fin to finish this. Uh, 
So um, I, I, do, I wanted to say a couple of things and, and input too, um, as we're making that, if I could. Uh, I don't have a button, obviously. Um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, just a couple notes. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the capital reaching out to me in response to a reach out, I believe, that came from your organization. Um, I don't believe they ever have enough space to give a full answer, so um, I, I, I don't believe the capital misrepresented, but I think um, the abbre abbreviation of a phrase to um, a 15-minute conversation clearly does not depict that. And I was disappointed to find that um, you did not see my email requesting a meeting to have this discussion um, interactively so that we can come to a solution, um, and I was hoping to be able to bring it to the dais. Uh, with a little bit more information. So um, that stated, those are things that have happened. So please accept my apologies. Um, there was no misintent there. Ms. Howard's letter did serve, I think, in the beginning it had specified, and my goal was to, and what the board had discussed, was to get with you to discuss such a work group in lieu. Um, I do have concerns about the logistics of the CAC. Um, the agenda item that Ms. Schalheim was um, hesitant to actually fills four seats and we do have others who are still not continuing to attend. So quorum issues and their existing stuff do remain a just, it is what it is, it's an operational thing. Um, I do want to make mention that the CAC is undergoing a transformation. Um, Michelle Heim and a couple other members um, had suggested last spring recognizing that we're transitioning. So the role, original role and definition of the CAC has definitely dynamically is in flux and will continue to be in flux through the remainder of the year till we're fully elected. And by that I mean that as appointed members of the board, uh, the CAC truly was the eyes and ears on behalf of those appointed folks. Um, what we're seeing, I, I would think that my fellow elected members would concur, is the desire for the constituents to work interactively with the board members direct. So some of our initial feedback over through the fall from the CAC has included concerns that uh, the, the community is not engaging them as much as they used to. Um, Ms. Howard's letter did speak for itself of how, uh, of some of the implications that we were hoping to incorporate with it. Um, that stated, I, I have moved to expedite the CAC's nomination so that we can fill that today. Um, and if my members join me in the motion when we get to that moment in time, which will be uh, a little, uh, it's definitely going to be after lunch, <laughs> most certainly. Um, I'm not opposed to the CAC um, starting to, to get started. Um, I would like to, um, if the members are accommodating, I don't believe Dr. Arlotto and his staff would have had, would have enough time with us formulating maybe the framework today um, with how those details and resources for deployment. So I would suggest maybe that we as a board consider working uh, with designees from the stakeholders who are making the request and who have a clear and evident vested interest uh, to work collaboratively perhaps with a group to formulate. So in other words, you know, maybe we could motion to get it started and to designate a couple members of the board to work collaboratively with everyone so that we are well, so that we can specific, with specificity make the request to the CAC and make the request to the citizens at large, see what stakeholders we want to have at the table. Um, of course, as I shared with you, Mr. Snowden, in meetings, um, I'm always hesitant to do, do duplicity with the same people over and over again. So my only uh, request of my fellow members is to consider that we have some ongoing things that will have outcomes that will include the mental health task force, that does include the GAP group, um, that does include work that I believe the EAC has been working on in collaboration with some of the stakeholders. Um, there's a total of about 40-some individual projects and policies and actions going on there. I just want to make sure that what we're going to do is going to be most effective and can address the now as well as, as, well as build the foundation for the future. I agree. We, we, we just keep in seeing every single week this is, 
This is definitely out of control um, and uh, as a society, um, and we have an obligation to keep, uh, to keep ourselves safe. So with that in mind, I I'm willing to support a version. I'm hesitant to work out, hash out too many details here, not having the relevant resources that are avail, uh, are avail. so I believe if the motion were uh, broad enough to allow for more intimate work to be conducted, not here on the dais during, in the middle of our business meeting, I think that uh, we, we should be able to come up with something really good. Um, uh, okay, no, we'll but, but there's a motion on hold the on, table hold on. already. Um, so uh, with that stated, um, uh, we're starting to get to repeat, um, so I I'm going to say um, is we have a motion right now. Is, the, is this an amendment request to the motion? Okay, so well then we'll, we'll wait till we'll dispel that. Uh, this is the business at hand. Is there any um, other comments to Ms. Schalheim's statement? I have Ms. Ellis here and I have Ms. Schalheim. I'm gonna hold yours um, back obviously, Ms. Ellis. So Ms. Schalheim, um, I, I will not be comfortable supporting the current motion because of the reasons we already stated. Um, I would offer either, um, and uh, really I, I think it has to be a different motion. So I wanted to, um, so I, I guess I wanna defer back to you um, to see if yeah. you would sure. like to alter yeah I'm gonna motion. I'm gonna go ahead and tweak my motion a bit that um, that the board lead the effort I, I just want to just make sure that we're part th for the benefit of these guys here and the public so are you withdrawing the motion and and reinstating a new one I was amending it but I uh, mean, uh, whatever you want well because we already have a second I, I just want to make sure I, if it's a slight change it would be an amendment to it and otherwise we could just redo it too it, it's your choice um, I just want to make sure Let me read it first and then we'll get to that. Okay. So um, that I move that the board lead the effort um, with staff and leadership, with staff leadership and support so that it affords the full insight and responsibility um, and involves the stakeholders in um, eradicating hate and bias. I also wanted to say one thing about um, your words. Um, I don't want to be mischaracterized. I'm, I was against putting it on the agenda today because we found out about it today and we have no other information on the people with the CAC. So I just want to make it clear that not against getting people on the CAC so that they have a quorum, okay? I just want it to be broadcast to the public in advance with the rest of our agenda and I want to know who these folks are beyond their name and what, what cluster they are. And I think that that's fair because I'm not a rubber stamp. Um, I have Mr. Uh, Mr. Leib and then Ms. Antwine um, on this motion. Thank you, Madam President. I have no doubt and I'm certain that uh, employees of our school system, the folks in our audience also have no doubt that we join Ms. Alsup, Dr. Dodoni, and Mr. Snowden in their goal to completely eradicate not only our community but our country of these heart-wrenching incidents that continue to break our hearts and break us apart. I agree with the comments of, I identify with the comments of Ms. Hummer and Ms. Ellis and also Ms. Corkadel. And uh, rather than get all bent out on how to put a motion together, I don't see why we need a motion to just say that this board will dedicate its effort to work with the leaders in our community to make a much more visible effort and public effort to eradicate these actions in our community, to identify, publicize, and eradicate. I believe that's something that we can just commit to and then put the working group together and do it. I don't see why we have to keep tripping over motions, et cetera. We all have the same goal. We agree to that goal. We should be able to come together and put together a working group or however you want to call it to attack this and make progress. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leib. Ms. Schalheim and then Ms. Antoine. I think we need a motion because we haven't done that yet because we keep kicking the can down the road and these good people keep showing up with the same testimony over and over um, 
and I'm sure that they all have things they would rather be doing than sitting in our audience for hours waiting to speak. So um, while, again, I agreed wholeheartedly with uh, Ms. Ellis and Ms. Hummer earlier, it's a timing issue for me and the time is now, so let's start a working group today and get this started with staff, with staff involved. Ms. Antoine? <coughs> I have to agree with um, Ms. Shalheim. This not only was the request made, and, and the request was an achievable request at the time, now it's escalated. So a motion is definitely necessary to help us keep track of what's going on. We, we can shape as we go, but right now we need something on the record that says we are, we truly have a zero tolerance for this and we're ready to go. And I think uh, Ms. Alvey. So after hearing the debate, I'm, I'm understanding that the original motion has been altered. So if this is okay with Ms. Schalheim, I have formulated a, um, a structured version of that motion um, that I feel will, will incorporate all the discussion. So, I have here that I move to establish a temporary board-led work group, um, board member-led work group, excuse me, to address bias and hate in the Anne Arundel County public school system immediately with further conversation on the structure and goals in another agenda item at a future meeting. I'll totally accept that. And in lieu of my previous motions, plural. Oh, yes, I'm withdrawing mine in favor, and I'll second it in favor of <coughs> the more the better articulated version of my motion thank you <coughs> okay so um, just to clarify we have a withdrawal of the second motion of Ms. Schalheim in um, and uh, replaced with Ms. Um, Alvey's uh, motion and a second Ms. Antoine did you want to speak to that yes particular? Uh, yes Ms. Mm -hmm. um, Alvey thank you for always taking what we have up here and making sense of it um, but I have a uh, point of clarification, if I could. When you say temporary, so do we need to introduce a time frame for that? For that, um? I would be hesitant to introduce a time frame currently because we don't know what the goals and the structure will be. So that's why I just said temporary. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just one more comment before we go to vote here, and that's for myself. Um, in that, I would suggest <coughs> that um, after it. It should miss all these motion passes. Um, that looks pretty probable here. Um, <laughs> not to uh, preclude anything, um, that we take a minute to gain consensus to designate our uh, board member yeah. today on the dais so that the public knows who that they can be looking towards um, as our representative, because this would truly be a representative of the board mm -hmm. uh, being on uh, overseeing that, is the way I'm hearing it. And so um, I would just ask that we could do that, um, not in the motion, of course. Um, so, Ms. Antoine, you had another comment on her motion? Um, I have another comment on the comment you just made. <laughs> so I understand that we are leading as a board, right, because we're the one board. Are you introducing a separate member to represent the interests of the board? Is that what you're introducing? I believe that would be appropriate if the motion passes <coughs> to have a designee because um, I'm, as much as Ms. Ellis and I would love to get involved in everything, I, I think it's more appropriate for a member to do to take the lead on this, if sure. not, and, and have an alternate I'd like to have as well. If, 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 I, if I may request that you as a president who does a fine job at appointing if you can take the time um, once, if, if this passes, to let us know whom you're recommending. Um, not, not here, of course, but after you've deliberated, please. Okay. Thank you. We can handle that in closed session as well. Absolutely. Um, seeing no more comments, um, do we have, we do have a motion and an opportunity for the public to speak on that. Uh, would any members of the public care to speak? Um, I know we're right in the middle of public comment. Yes. Dr. J. Danny. I'm standing before you wearing two hats. You can see them, right? The first is the NAACP hat. 
Before our President Jacqueline Alsop had to lead, she affirmed that we are in support of something happening today and we stand ready to support you. We are not only as deep as the few members you see here. This white woman has the privilege of time. I have with me so many parents and educators. We stand ready to serve. I'm going to put on my other hat as a member of the joint initiative to eliminate the opportunity gap. In that group, I head up the subcommittee on systemic racism, a subgrouping we created ourselves among that group, among that body, from public input. And we have been hearing from the public, and this is a big part of it. We are putting forward a recommendation. We will be putting forward a recommendation for a standing body to engage with all elements of the opportunity gap, the discipline gap, and ongoing public accountability. I can affirm as the chair, leader, uh, whatever, administrator of that little subcommittee that I will bring this recommendation to engage on an ongoing basis with hate and bias within AACPS to that body. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I'm sure the board, I, I believe I can speak on behalf of the board of how my, the gratitude that we have for you guys' willingness to take your time to help us solve these important problems to all of us. And, and clearly your service uh, on that committee um, and all the subcommittees that you serve, you, you, you wear so many hats, <laughs> not just those two. So I just wanted to uh, and extend I the appreciation. The We have a motion and a second to vote on. Seeing no more action, uh, Ms. Howell, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Alvi? Aye. Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Motion passes 8 0. Thank you all very much. Um, we have one more um, person signed up for public testimony. And um, that is, and, and also say if anyone else uh, has not signed up but would like to speak, um, you can join Pilot Earl Smith. Sir, please. Hi, my name is Pilot Earl Smith, and I live in Shadyside, Maryland. I came here last year a few times to ask, the, to ask you to stop the building of a cell tower in Shadyside Elementary School. I was so happy when you voted to halt the tower project, but I recently just found out that the cell phone tower project is still being worked on. I was shocked and confused, so I felt I needed to come back and remind you about the vote you made. Kids in Shadyside do not want a cell tower at their school. I was so proud of my community coming together to help me protect me and all the kids in Shadyside. I was so happy that when my voice was heard. I really trusted that you were thinking about the kids you represent. I thought you voted against the tower, but apparently the vote didn't mean anything. When you voted to stop the Shadyside cell tower last year, I believed you. What happened? I think your words should mean something. Your vote should mean something. And I think I should be able to trust you. Can I? I just uh, want to say that um, you you have a, a, a gift of words and of speaking um, that definitely moves a room. So thank you so much for staying engaged because you know you're a model example of civics and how the engagement can really go a long way and how one voice from one young gentleman um, in one one very small community can have a very big impact. So thank you for your continued engagement. I think you have a very bright future ahead of you no matter what you do because those communication skills go a long way in every industry and uh, I look forward to continuing to serve you as your district representative. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Um, Ms. Shawhan, you had something on, on his testimony? Yes. Okay. So I, I just wanted to say that um, we did pass a resolution here and um, sent that message pretty clearly to the county executive to um, to find an alternative location for that cell tower site. So that's, I believe that's up on our website. At least I thought I did, saw it. But um, you know, we did we did vote uh, 
to um, for the county executive to explore other locations for that cell tower site. Yes, Ms. Schalheim, and that I believe that is tentatively scheduled for the agenda coming up um, later this month, uh, too, as per the request on the dais by Mr. Leib and Ms. Hummer. Um, um, we have two more um, individuals. If you could just please, just as a refresher to what I said in the, oh, going on about an hour ago when we started <laughs> public testimony. Uh, all good. I, I think the public's important, of course. Um, could you please state your name uh, for the record? Uh, I'm Thornell Jones. I joined Boy Scouts about 70 years ago. The first thing we did was um, we studied first aid, for getting ready for a campery. What I found out in first aid is the first thing you have to do and constantly do is stop the bleeding. That's what we have to do about racism. We have to stop the bleeding. We ne also need to understand what our roles are. This, this committee here is a policy board, but you have a CEO who has the responsibility for action. So Dr. Arlotto, you must continually, clearly, and definitively state that the schools will not tolerate any racism from teachers, staff, students, and even parents. The buck stops at the schools. There's no other organization in our society that can keep racism out of our future. We have taught unbelievable stereotypes through our schools by the way we teach by our curriculum. We've got to stop doing that. We have to pick books that depict the real history of the US. We have to have all of our teachers understand racism. I'm not talking yet about implicit bias. I'm talking about racism. Racism itself is not acceptable. Restorative justice is an option rather than suspension or jail or those things. What we do with restorative justice is it's an educational process. It's how we learn to understand how things affect one another. And it's not the words that I'm talking about, but the words do generate action. So what happens when people leave school with racism or implicit bias is they impact the work and the health and welfare of everybody in the society. So we have this economically, racially separated society because of the things we learn. And so therefore, we have to stop teaching that. And everything that we do is teaching. So everything that we say is teaching. So I'm asking for, uh, by the way, we are, we're doing a good job. We're trying to teach implicit bias to the teachers. But what I keep hearing from teachers is it's, it's not uniform. Some teachers are getting it and some aren't. So I'm asking for an audit of every teacher's time spent in professional development and anti-bias training. And by the way, who's doing the presenting and how have they been trained? Thank you very much, sir. Um, Ms. Van Busker. Good afternoon, Board of Education, Lisa Van Busker, we're going to start school later. Um, wasn't necessarily planning to testify about this issue, but then um, so a new study was released and I saw it um, just the other day. So um, a new Michigan State study of 250 Asian, Latino, and African American students in New York City found that a good night's sleep does adolescents good beyond helping them stay awake in class. Adequate sleep can help teens navigate social, challenging social situations. The study, which focused on ninth grade students, found that adequate sleep allowed students to cope with discrimination and challenges associated with ethnic or racial bias. It helped so help them with problem solving more effectively and help seek peer support when faced with hardships. Findings of this study have important implications, said Wee Yang, an assistant professor of human development and family studies at MSU. Understanding how sleep helps adolescents negotiate social challenges may consequently elude elucidate how promoting sleep may improve adolescent adjustments during high school and beyond. The study did not treat sleep as a consequence of discrimination, Yang said. However, our team did identify the influence of discrimination on same-day sleep in other studies. 
These studies show that on days when adolescents experienced ethnic or racial discrimination, they slept less and also took longer to actually fall asleep. And so, as I've reiterated before, sleep and our school start times cross many uh, elements of our students' day. Um, and this is a very new, interesting uh, implication that the sleep helps them with their resiliency in dealing with the mental health challenges, as we know, but now also some racial and discrimination biases. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Antoine, you had a comment? I, I just had a question. On, Dr. Jones just shared that he understood that not all of our teachers were getting the implicit bias training. It was my understanding, uh, Dr. Alato, that, that we're not only ensuring that, that, but this is an ongoing situation. So could you help us understand the status, I guess, of um, that training? I'd be glad to try and help. I, I can't speak for um, the presenter. I, I don't know what information he has that I don't, but we have, um, uh, we continue to uh, offer our training to our teachers. Um, there are certainly teachers that could be absent on a particular day, um, uh, either not feeling well or choose to be absent, and so we then have to work to find ways to um, get them engaged with the professional development they've missed. That's ongoing, it happens in schools. Um, uh, all the time. Obviously, th we've, we've made this um, a, a primary importance, um, but the key is time, right? So when we have a half a day to deliver professional development four times a year and somebody misses it, we now have to find time where I can take them either away from children or stay after school or on a Saturday to get that professional development. And that's really hard to do in a school, in any school system. And so um, we need more time for professional development. Thank you for that. And Dr. Jones, if I could share as well publicly, even the board this year was trained on implicit bias. So it is definitely a strong effort within our system. And thank you for letting us know. And I know that. Thank you. Uh, one more comment, Ms. Shohan. I just have a question for, for you. Um, because of the switching of the, the different um, agenda items, I actually had some questions about something that falls under safety and security. I didn't want to do it when the chief was here because it didn't relate to him specifically, but it still fell under safety and security. And I was going off of the, the publicly posted um, agenda. So when can I ask those questions? It's for staff. Um, well, uh, we are, uh, logistically speaking, um, I would prefer we use our request for information log, but I'd, I would have to defer to Dr. Alato as to the availability of staff at this moment in time um, because they had not uh, prepared for one. So Dr. I, Alato, I, I did send I, these I in advance. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Alato, I will defer to your judgment on that on as to whether or not you want to, uh, I mean, we're going to be taking public testimony on 5.01 and 5.04, but there was no presentation. Is, is staff available to address Ms. Schalheim's questions? I'm assuming Ms. Schalheim is referring uh, when she talks about safety and security to lead testing. Is that, is that right? correct, yes. Okay, so that's, yes. That, so that's what she's referring to, safety and security and lead testing. Um, and I believe she's got some questions. She forwarded us some questions I that, that the team got a chance to review and, and uh, we were gonna provide answers. Um, but if you wanna take time now for her to ask those questions, I guess that's something you certainly can do. Okay. Um, as, a, as opposed, of course, to as you said, where we get the long questions, we respond, and then we post them to the board site for everybody to see the responses. That's the other option. Okay. Um, well, so the agenda did specify when we got to the agenda section and we adopted the agenda, it included an omission of, of a report to it. Right. Um, and we are at 1.30. Um, uh, so, so let's, let's ask the questions after, uh -huh. after lunch. Um, it, in lieu of a presentation, I'll ask my questions per that agenda item. Um, okay. Uh, well, I was going to break for lunch after we got through those so oh, that whatever, um, yeah, we have whichever. a person, at least one person, who has signed up for testimony whichever on there. Um, so is the staff available to answer those questions? I, I mean, I, I, I kind of, uh, you know. I 
I'm not sure if it's our general practice if something is to be put in um, in advance like questions that are put in through our private site and then for us to get answers um, doesn't that have to be done for each board member through that and not in front of everyone if that's not what we decided on earlier with the agenda because wouldn't that be unfair to the other board members who don't get to just ask questions but you can just ask questions in the interest of time and just getting this moving along, um, if Dr. Arlotto, is staff available at this moment in time or not? For them? Certainly. Mr. Sheknovich will try his best to answer the, the Shawhan's questions regarding lead testing. Thank you. Yeah, because I, I had actually, I was going to request um, an actual presentation on, on the lead stuff because I had quite a few myself, but we can we can start here and we'll, we'll get going. Um, so. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are on item 5.01. Uh, there is no staff presentation uh, because uh, that was Chief Altamari, and we are now with questions uh, starting with Ms. Schulheim on 5.01. Yes. Um, Ms. Schulheim? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I first, and thank you for that, President Corbett, not to waste time, but we're here to make decisions in real time publicly. It was brought to our attention, not in closed session, that this was going to happen, this change in the agenda that was publicly announced, but, but as we sat here. And I also prepared some questions, uh, and I understand about efficiencies in time and otherwise, but these are, these these have to be addressed and we have decisions that have to be made based on that so we i i just would prefer if we don't have discussions on board members asking staff questions publicly during these meetings that's a given and we do not have to go to dr Alato and request permission to do that we have to be able to work as a board to get our to do our jobs we request recommendations and advice from dr Alato for sure but this about do we I, I didn't, that, that didn't go over well, in my opinion. We have business to take care of. The water testing results came out this week. We have questions and we do not necessarily, it's definitely a courtesy, but we do not necessarily have to formulate our questions in advance either or put it in a log. We need to be here taking care of business publicly. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, so anyway, I wanna thank you all for, um, for this, I um, I was able to do this in advance um, because I I, uh, I had time over the weekend to, to prepare this. So and I did set it as a courtesy in advance. And so I'll just start with the question with with my questions. Um, have the testing protocols, in light of the fact that we just got all these new results in, have the testing protocols changed between the time the first samples were taken in 2018 and today? No. No, okay. And are we ensuring that, I assume it's the same contractor from, from 2018 to, to today? We utilized two contractors, two contractors at sorry. first because we needed to accelerate the work to meet the time frame. Uh, we had a primary contractor that undertook the bulk of the work. We had a second contractor that helped us in the uh, meet area because they could get access to the post and some of the secured sites. Now that we've gone over that initial first wave, we are utilizing only our primary contractor. And how are we ensuring that the contractor is following the testing protocol consistently at every sample that they're taking? Are we, are they being QC'd in any way? So to begin with, uh, both the contractor and the personnel are certified, trained, and audited by MDE. Okay. Uh, so not just the lab on the back end doing the analysis, but the actual sample takers have to be certified and retrained and audited by MSDE. So that's on the state agency side. Certainly their contract is with us. So staff from the facilities department are also ensuring that to the best of our ability, you know, they are comporting with the requirements that MDE has established. Not running the tap first and then taking the sample, for, ex for example. Right. Got it. So 
there are 18 schools that tested this year that had results that troubled me. So some of these schools had consumable outlets that were tested in 2018 and they were positive again. For example, Annapolis Middle had some consumable fixtures tested positive in 2018. Then those same fixtures tested negative spring 2019, but then tested positive again in December 2019. And for others, consumer, consumable outlets that previously were negative are now positive, and some examples are Corcoran Middle. Corcoran Middle had a whole new list of fixtures that didn't previously test positive. And so the schools that, that I'm talking about are Annapolis Middle, Brooklyn Park Elementary, Central Elementary, Central Special, Chesapeake Bay Middle, Co Cochrane Middle, George Fox Middle, Glen Burnie Park Elementary, Hilltop <laughs> Elementary, Lindell Middle, Lithicum um, Elementary, North County High School, uh, Oakwood Elementary, Ruth Parker Easton, Shadyside uh, Elementary, Sunset Elementary, Tracy's Elementary, and uh, Woodside Elementary. So can you confirm the events that take place when a, for just the public when an outlet at any point in time, 2018, early 2019 now, is what happens when that fixture is found to be positive? Sure, our practice comports with uh, state law. State law at present is that within 24 hours of becoming aware that the outlet uh, has uh, a lead level test result that exceeds the actionable level as prescribed within state statute, that fixture has to be uh, turned off and disabled. That fixture then cannot be reactivated for use, for consumption, until it has been uh, either remediated and retested or retested. In both cases, you have to have a acceptable test result come back from the laboratory before it can be placed back in service. Okay, so they're not necessarily all turned off and then replaced and then retested. So our practice has been actually to do that. Okay. So the, the law allows you to simply retest. We have not taken that course of action. Our course of action that we have decided upon is that they are turned off, replaced, and then retested. But that's an internal decision that we've made okay. uh, here at the board. Thank you. And so, for example, so Shadyside Elementary had a, had a whole list in 2018, and then they have a whole new list today. So is that particular school on well or city water? Shadyside's on well water. Well, okay. And so I assume that that water per state law has to be tested regularly as well for a whole variety of different things. Is lead included in that? So there are Separately. separate regulations, but yes. Uh, uh, well water has to be tested for uh, chlorine, iron, pH, coliforms, metals, um, nitrates, organics, copper, lead, et cetera. So there's different statutes. Um, but yes, well water is actually more extensively tested than uh, municipal water systems. Uh, certainly at the point of source, we utilize uh, Maryland Environmental Services, MES, which is an agent of the state um, and authorized under MDE. They both, they operate, they plant, uh, they do the testing uh, of the uh, water products, uh, it's logged, that's audited by MDE, the parent agency of, uh, or sister agency of MES. Then separate and apart from that, separate and apart from that, we have the contractor that we use for our lead testing program at the consumable outlets that does testing at those points as opposed to at the water origination or source, which is where MES does their testing. Okay. So a well school really has two different sets of testing protocols for two very different purposes. There's a little bit of overlap, um, but o both are highly regulated and we comply with all of those provisions under both the um, water generation side as well as the point of consumption side. Okay, and I appreciate that. And I just wanted the public to hear that there are two separate sources of testing that occur. Um, but then it's weird that they, some were negative, some were positive that are now negative, some are negative and now positive. And so are we, and I know that school is up there in age, are we, and I've seen this, I've seen this in other places where I've lived, where the pH of the source water is such that it reacts with the, the piping mm -hmm. and the walls and then le it leaches lead into the water. This was a systemic problem in Mississippi and Jackson when I lived there. 
And um, so I heard about it. I know way too much about this. So um, are we addressing, is the, has there been a pH problem? And then are we addressing the, the pipes and the, and the walls? I, I'm not sure when that school is slated for updates. So, and I do understand that it's sort of an older school, but can you talk about that? So to begin with, your, your recollection from Mississippi is correct. Uh, pH is an influencer, is a correlation between pH levels and uh, the ability of uh, lead to leach. Uh, however, at Shadyside, uh, the pH level is tested and logged daily. It has to be at a neutral level. There's a prescribed band. Good. And we have, not, we have not experienced a pH divergence at that school. Um, and again, uh, you know, unlike private domestic wells at my house, I don't have a professional well operator that's you know certified and trained and taking tests every day and logging and sending stuff out to labs. So pH is a very carefully controlled piece. I mean, you're only speaking about lead, and that's the purpose of your questions. Yes. But on our side, uh, corrosiveness of our HVAC equipment, there's a tremendous uh, potential, downside potential to having pH out of calibration in either direction. And because of that, we very tightly try to control that uh, within a very narrow band of neutrals so that we're not um, in any way adversely impacting uh, people or things. Okay, and so I just have one follow-up question. So when we, when, we ha when we see these schools that have, again, that had po positives that are now negatives, but they have a whole new list of positives, are we, are we looking into the piping within the walls or in the cases if it's city water, are we are we test are we inquiring with with um, the city the city of Annapolis or the county about pH levels and and all that to see if it's not if it's not our issue our pipes and our schools if it's source water that to con contain some of these because I think I mean some of these some of these really scare me you know um, and um, and since this is you know somewhat a preventable thing like I just want to know how we're addressing. So yeah. there is a, an entirely different set of regulations on potable or municipal water systems. The Department of Public Works, um, both the city and the county separate, but follow the same regulations, manage that. It, if it is a municipal water source issue, then 100 out of 100 fixtures in the, build, in the building would come up high for lead. So if it's coming in through the main six inch line into the building, right. and if it was high for lead, all 100 fixtures in the building would have a lead issue. That is not the case. So, you know, by by that process of deduction, A, we we have results from DPW. We know uh, what they test for. They share those results with us. That That's not a concern. Um, so when you have sporadic, you know, if you've tested 120 fixtures in the building and six have elevated lead levels, clearly that speaks to it's not a, a Anne Arundel County Department of Public Works issue. It's localized to those outlets. Um, it is for the reason, I mean, it's for the reason that it's essentially acknowledged that lead levels will fluctuate over time. It could be because of usage or non-usage or uh, stagnant lat latency periods for water. That's why when the, when the bill was crafted, it wasn't just a one-time test. So there's a test and then there are pedi periodic retests as established you know within a statute sure. again knowing full well that over the course of time through whatever reasons you know lead levels can fluctuate okay. so you know I, th I think the crafters of the state's legislation knew that were well advised and constructed that testing algorithm and that testing algorithm was then translated into regulation by the Maryland uh, Department of the Environment explicitly to take that into account as well. I definitely appreciate your answers to all these questions. Thank you for taking them in advance and allowing me to, to speak them even though we, you didn't have a, um, cause I don't think it would be you, That's, that there wasn't a presentation for, for the, this particular um, uh, agenda item. So anyway, thank you for that. Uh, I, have, I have these in case you need them. I printed all, all 18 that were sort of troubling some of the had the overlaps and whatnot so if this is of help I will give this to you and thank you for continuing to um, keep our kids safe by addressing the leaded water problem yes, so thank you 
Thank you, Ms. Shalheim. Is there any other uh, questions on item 5.01 from members? Seeing none, any public comment on 5.01 safety and security report? Seeing no motion, um, item 5.02 bullying prevention report. Ms. Jackson. Good afternoon, President Corkadel, Vice President Ellis, members of the board, and Dr. Arlotto. For the record, I'm Monique Jackson, Deputy Superintendent for Student and School Support. I am providing an update on bullying prevention as requested. As of February 28th, we have received 645 bullying forms, representing a slight decrease from this time last year at 667. We hope that this trend continues as our students find ways to celebrate similarities and differences. We continue to utilize curriculum opportunities to be proactive in reducing bullying, harassment, and intimidation, especially at the elementary level. Second Step Emotional Learning Kits have purchases for the remaining 23 elementary schools have been completed. With the support of the Safe Schools Grant, we are now working to incorporate this program into all of our middle schools. The next Bullying Prevention Committee will be held at Corcoran Middle School on Monday, March the 9th at 315, where we will analyze and discuss how we captured the student voice. Middle schools under their universe Unity Day message participated in the Kindness Cup Challenge, which was launched on February 10th. This kindness campaign serves as a proactive bullying prevention initiative that supports improved school climate and student engagement. During the campaign, middle school students were challenged to complete 1,000 acts of kindness within their schools. The student acts of kindness were recognized by adults and displayed on bulletin boards throughout the school building. Three middle schools completed the challenge and earned a Kindness Cup trophy. I'd like to congratulate this year's Kindness Trophy Cup winners, Marley Middle School, two-time Kindness Cup champion, Severna Park Middle School, and Central Middle School. Trophy presentations will be held this month. I would like to challenge everyone to continue to foster a culture of kindness that will increase compassion, unity, and respect, starting with all of us in the room today. Thank you. This concludes the update, and I'm available to answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Antoine. Thank you, President Corkadell. I have a question about, um, in terms of our bullying forms, for our younger students who are experiencing bullying, who are just learning to read, write, and otherwise, how do they report bullying when it's happening to them? So we always encourage our students to report to a trusted adult. And so sometimes that occurs, I'm at home as a, a youngster, and I believe I've been a victim of bullying, and I tell my parent, and my parent goes online immediately and completes the form. Sometimes, um, this is what happens most often, um, they see their professional school counselor in the hallway or at lunch, and they report it to their professional school counselor as one of the trusted adults, their school administrator as such. So um, we don't see um, students actually completing the forms. It's usually an adult on behalf of the student. Okay, and I guess I have a following question. If, if say, I'm a first grader, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to express that quite, quite as much. I don't, I don't know, mm -hmm. right? It's been a long time since I was first grade. Mm -hmm. But um, when they go to these trusted adults, is the, the teacher or, whom, or whomever they go to how do they know what actions to take after that? Because would they not have to then understand the whole situation because it's not necessarily coming from the student as I'm being bullied. It may be coming in a form of he didn't want to play with me today, right? Correct. Correct. So, so um, our teachers are trained to, um, if they're in a situation where they don't understand um, that uh, scenario, for example, um, to report it to either the school administration or the counselor. 
um, as they do with many things. Um, but I want to back up to a statement that you made um, that our students may not understand. We do a really great job of developing a counseling curriculum where they actually do understand. Um, my own, and I talk about, and I can talk about this from personal experience, my own students, my own personal children um, come home, especially through their counseling curriculum and second step. And that's what we teach them, how to articulate their needs through the counseling curriculum and second step. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, seeing no more questions, I'll just do a personal extra shout out to Marley, Severna Park, and Central Middle Schools for doing an outstanding job. I love these challenges. And um, they take them very seriously. Oh, I know they do, and they do an outstanding <laughs> Especially job, too. Especially the middle school principals. <laughs> well, you know, when, when you see something good, the good energy mm -hmm. perpetuates, Absolutely. just like the unfortunate occurrence of bad. When a negative thing happens, it, it bubbles out, and so we need to plant those seeds most certainly. I think the, the kindness in planting the seeds is literal and figurative. Thank you so much, Ms. Jackson, Thank for you. taking time. Um, I know you guys put in a lot of work for these reports. Next is item 5.03, diversity and inclusion. Ms. Jackson. Good afternoon again, President Corcadell, <laughs> Vice President Ellis, Dr. Olato, and members of, of the board. For the record, I am Monique Jackson, Deputy Superintendent for Student and School Support. I am providing the monthly update on diversity and inclusion on behalf of Dr. Gillens, who is, training, who is currently training our equity leads for the March professional development. The incidents of last week of hate and bias are absolutely horrible and must stop. I have a unique perspective as a parent, alum, and community member of one of those schools. So for all of us that are on staff of the executive team and senior staff, this is very important and personal, but especially to me. As of February the 28th, there were 182 incidents of bias motivated behavior or language. This number represents an increase from this point last year as bias language was instituted. Yesterday, I was interviewed about the school system's response to these acts. And part of my interview was in fact quoted, but I'm now taking this opportunity to outline the other points that I did give during that interview. Our school system takes a strong stance on incidents of hate and bias. We have a code of conduct that outlines consequences for acts of hate and bias, hate and bias, as well as bias language. And to be very clear, when we identify and verify the student who has committed this act, they receive consequences as are outlined in the code. We don't only react, we are very proactive. And I'll repeat that. As a school system, we do not only react, we are proactive. First, we start with our children. We start with our earliest learners in elementary school with a research-based systemic approach through counseling lessons, rich, diverse curriculum, diverse media centers that become the hub of teaching and learning and recently introduced second step and restorative practices. These activities are designed to afford students the opportunity to interact with peers and develop relationships. Our middle schoolers engage in advisory lessons and activities, restorative practices and co-curricular activities designed to continue the theme of relationship building throughout their middle school years. And finally, at the high school level, we continue to utilize restorative practices co-curricular activities and extracurricular activities, as well as advisory and curriculum, such as the GCC, to elevate the student's sense of responsibility in the greater school community that they are a part of. Our children are often exposed to hate and bias in the community outside of the school day. The technology that our children have access to at home gives them greater access to both the good and the bad that's happening in the world around them. Any child with a smartphone device or smart device probably saw the recent article about the racially insensitive comments directed at black business owners. Our children are watching and therefore they are mimicking the adults in the world around them. And to that end, we have community meetings all around the county to facilitate conversation about how to engage communities in the quest to eliminate hate and bias. 
And I will repeat, our children are watching how we behave and interact with each other. And as such, our school system participates in and facilitates professional development. In January, several board members, community members, and members of the Anne Arundel County Public Schools team attended the National School Board Equity Symposium in Washington. I was honored to be asked by Dr. Olato to be part of that team in attendance. And many of us intentionally selected the session titled Combating Hate in Schools, Offering Best Practices for School Administrators. We hoped to hear from national experts on the best way to tackle hate and bias. And they offered the following suggestions on how to turn things around. Empower educators to address issues in their classrooms. Become upstanders, because bystanders contribute to the problem. Bystanders contribute to the problem. Establish a culture of inclusion. Build staff capacity and knowledge. Use inclusive language and set a positive tone. Create and enforce policies and procedures. Establish a reporting system and engage the community. So at the end of the session, I was given the opportunity, or rather I took the opportunity, to interact with these national experts. I told them about our district and what we were doing and that we essentially met all of the criteria that I outlined above. And so I asked them, I said, what more can we do? Or is the answer, do we need to do something different? And their response was to simply continue what you are doing, but to engage the community in and with that effort. The Office of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement continues to be intentional in their efforts in assisting schools in eliminating all gaps and promoting inclusion. I just spoke about Dr. Gillens and her team as they are giving professional development to the equity leads for the March 24th professional development modules. That will include implicit bias part three, which indicates that there have been an implicit bias part one and two. Participants will identify cognitive biases and their impact on the classroom, describe the brain science behind the way humans make decisions, and plan for and ensure decisions are made with the best interest of students. Culturally responsive teaching and the brain, part three. Participants will recognize their own cultural reference points and explore strategies to widen our lens and manage our responses to students. And trauma investigated, invested classrooms, part three, where participants will be able to identify characteristics of trauma invested practices identify ways to create a culture of safety for students and adults and to understand how systems of meaning can impact students outcome student outcomes and identify student need versus student behavior and ways to respond appropriately and finally planning practices programs and school-based decisions through the equity lens which was mentioned in public testimony today Participants will explore the equity lens and literacy frameworks to develop equitable programs, practices, and decisions within our schools. A survey will be provided to all staff to complete to inform the Office of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement next steps for next year's early dismissal equity professional development. So as you can see, our school system response and proactive measures are more than sending a letter. And although, that too is very important. Thank you, this concludes the update and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Shawheim, then Ms. Antoine. Ms. Shawheim. I just wanted to thank you as always for the work that you do um, and uh, you know, we chit chat also um, behind the scenes on some of these things and um, I appreciate everything you do every day, everything your team does every day everything that Maisha Gillens, Dr. Gillens does every day. And I also recognize that this, that this problem um, in our schools is the result of decades and a very long history in Maryland, a very long history in the United States, and it cannot be corrected overnight. And so where, where the board can and has um, 
helped with that effort. Um, I, I don't can't speak for the board, but I'm, I'm always willing to to do um, whatever is required to help um, eradicate hate in our schools. And uh, and I just wanted to to um, echo what you were saying so that the, that the public hears that this problem is is uh, long in the making and also takes more than a you know a 30 minutes that come to resolve so I appreciate your work every day thank you thank you thank you um, miss Antoine miss Jackson I definitely appreciate that you took the time to expound upon what was shared um, in the papers uh, concerning hate and bias and the school's position on it. I also appreciated what you had to say in the paper as well. Um, I, I had a question about, you mentioned throughout your, what you just shared with us, that there are actions, are ongoing actions, and that some of the requests that came in today we're already doing. Would it be, well, I guess I have to turn to Dr. Alato. Dr. Alato, would it be possible once we do get some of the recommendations from the public to, um, for, for you all to identify what we're already doing so that we won't duplicate efforts. Yes, ma'am, but many of our public partners meet regularly with Mrs. Jackson and um, uh, Dr. Gillens in a number of different formats, um, including the NAACP, representation from the caucus and others. Um, so they're, they're well aware of the work that, that is ongoing. In fact, they, are, they continue to contribute and help us do that work better, making suggestions. So um, uh, we will, of course, always want to enter. We, we don't want to duplicate. We want to strengthen what we're doing, and we want to implement what we're not doing, right? And so we'll always take the opportunity to share the work that we are doing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Seeing no more questions, do we have any testimony on item 5.03? Seeing no movement from the audience, item 5.04, um, as previously stated, um, we will be having a workshop that I encourage um, those of education minds to attend. Um, and all member, all people are invited to attend. We do not hear public testimony. Um, that is, uh, that'll be an opportunity for us to get uh, dig deep um, with the consultant and the staff on transportation. Are there any questions of the board at this time? Seeing none, we do have one person signed up uh, for comment, Ms. Van Buskirk. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Board of Education, Lisa Van Buskirk, Start School Later, Anne Arundel County. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion next week with Prismatic. And so my question is, because I don't think it was clear on the press release, like the October 2015 school start time workshop, will this one be recorded and broadcast? Um, so you can clarify that later. Um, but my testimony today is, um, today I'm going to talk about another form of high school transportation, and so that's students driving themselves. And I'll let you think back to February 20th. It's 1.30 a.m. and you just finished a marathon of session discussions of FY 2020. One, your brain hurts like you just finished chemistry, physics, biology, homework, or wrapped in, in a history lesson, and you start to drive home. It's dark, lighting isn't great, but at least there aren't too many cars on the road at this time of night. Now, did you wake up at 6 a.m. and drive to work on about, about four hours of sleep or less? How much caffeine did you drink that night before and then that morning? Think about like, doing that again and again and again like 79% of AACPS students who don't get eight hours of sleep. Research following Fairfax County's 50 minute delay from 7.20 to 8.10 in high school start times continues to be calculated. Last month, a study published online as an accepted paper in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine found that the later stool start times were associated with a significant drop in vehicle accidents involving teen drivers. Results show that the crash rate in 16 to 18 year old licensed drivers decreased significantly, significantly from 31.63 to 29.59 accidents per 1,000 drivers over the delayed start time. In contrast, the teen crash rate remains steady throughout the rest of the state. And I quote, accidental injuries, including motor vehicle crashes, are the number one cause of death of adolescents in the US. And anything we can do to mitigate that risk should be considered, said senior study author, Dr. Judy Owens, professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and director of sleep medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. 
We know from independent data sources that after a change in school start time, students get more sleep, which leads to multiple benefits, not just for individuals, but also in terms of a huge economic implications. Teenagers who get more sleep are less likely to make poor decisions, such as not wearing a seatbelt or engaged in distracted driving, explained Owens. One of the potential mechanisms for this reduction in car crashes is a decrease in behaviors that are related to risk taking. Before she moved to Boston, Dr. Judy Owens testified before this Board of Education in 2013 or 2014, before my time. She is the lead author of the 2014 American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations, and it was her colleague uh, and fellow author, Dr. Wolfson, who testified before you in December and also mentioned the drowsy driving implications. Dr. Owens' comparison of car accident matches those of comparing adjacent Virginia counties, Virginia Beach versus Chesapeake and Henrico versus Chesterfield, with both early and late start times and other school systems across the across the country that have found fewer teen driving accidents with later school start times. Would your driving have been better on February 20th if you had had more sleep and could wake up even an hour or two hours later? Please keep that in mind with your discussions next week with the Prismatic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bamba Bambas Kirk. Um, we are going to um, take a break for lunch and enter into closed session during that time. Our Oh, yes. I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see that. Um, okay. Ms. Schauheim and then Ms. Ellis. So I guess this question is for Dr. Alato. Will next week's um, workshop be either audio taped or uh, videotaped and stream lived or any combination of those? I don't know. Okay. Can we find out, please? I will, I will talk with the team. But Thank I, you. The, the answer is I don't know. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ms. Ellis. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the board go into closed session to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice on a legal matter. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Are we in consent? Okay, we have consensus. We will be uh, back in 20, about approximately 20, 30 minutes uh, tops.
back into session. I want to thank the one person sitting No, nobody's really here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. I oh, know. Uh, all good. Um, next item, if I could please have attention of everyone. We are officially in. Lord. Um, think of the poor audio people out there trying to Yes, we do. Um, item number 6.01, public address system replacement at Point Pleasant Annex. Item 6.02, psychiatric services. And item 6.03, scoreboard and marquee signs. I move signs. to bundle. Second. We got a motion to bundle and a second. Okay. Any comment? OK, no comment. Do we have consensus? Yes, yes. Having consensus. OK, um, do we have a motion or uh, concerning our bundled items? Yeah, how about my recommendation? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then you can motion on the recommendation. Okay, Dr. Alato, your recommendation, <clears throat> yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam President. I recommend the Board of Education um, uh, approve, I'm sorry, I'm looking at award the contracts as listed on today's agenda, 6.01, 6.02, and 6.03. So move. We have a motion and a second. No, seeing no comments. Any public comments on those items? Seeing no public comments, Ms. Howe, please call roll. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Alvey? Aye. And Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Okay. Next item is item 7.01 and item 7.02. Dr. Arlotto? Um. Yes, ma'am. Regarding seven uh, seven point zero one, um, administrative personnel appointments, I'm recommending the personnel listed in the attached sheets be promoted and or appointed. We have a motion and a second. Any comments on personnel? Seeing none. No public. Seeing no public testimony. Ms. Howe, please call roll on item seven point zero one, personnel administrative personnel appointments. Ms. Schulheim. Aye. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Alvey? Aye. And Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next item is item 7.02 personnel. Dr. Alato? Yes, ma'am. I recommend board approval of the actions as stipulated on the attached sheets. We have a motion and a second. Any comments? Seeing no comments. Any public testimony? Seeing no public testimony, Ms. Howe, please call roll. Ms. Schalheim? We're on seven. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Alvey? Aye. And Ms. Corkadel? Aye. And Ms. Ellis. Uh, could you please call Ms. Ellis, please? I apologize, Ms. Ellis. Aye. Motion passes 8-0. Thank you. Next item is item 7.03, the agenda preparation and distribution second reading. Ms. Ortiz, good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Oh, I got the short chair again. Okay. I hate the short chair. I'll do it when the camera's not on me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 7.03 is um, policy BCA, uh, board um, agenda preparation and distribution. Um, it went on a 30-day public comment period, um, and we received no public comments. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any requests for questions. I do have one or two. Okay. I have one. Okay. Ms. Antoine. Um, Dr. Alato, with our new app, 
would that be a source for um, the public to get this agenda, the new AACPS app application on, on the cell phone? I, I don't know. I have to find out. Okay. I, and the reason I'm asking is because I wanted to be able to amend it to this to include the application if, if it wasn't, but I didn't know that. The, oh, good. Um, so I just didn't know how far along we were in the development of the app. You're taller than me. Sorry, I was conferring with Mr. Burns. What's the question? So we, we just got the new app. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, and so it uses the, the AACPS website in here, and I'm trying to amend to include the AACPS application as well as, as a point of access it's pretty broad. For, for the agenda. But I didn't know if the app was. So there's a Board of Education app on the app where you can access the same web page that you can on our website. So you can get to the agenda if that's your question. It's already on the app. But there's not, there's not a board agenda button if that's your question. They can access it on the app via the website. Right, so for, so they would, uh, so end users would have to go maybe Right. Right. Similar to yes, more conveniently, they can just go to this, the site. That's yeah, I have to look and, and see. I mean, we can have some conversations upstairs about whether that's possible. I mean, have you had those conversations? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Seeing no more questions, do we have any testimony from the public? Seeing no motion, um, thank you very much, Ms. Ortiz. Item 7.04 is. Uh, up for first reader again, the board member ethics and professional standards. Um, just as a point of history um, on this matter, um, if you recall, there was quite a bit of discussion and um, before we went through the policy like we traditionally do and afford courtesy to staff, we did have a number of motions, um, lastly of which included a uh, reprimand back to the policy committee um, that was adopted and they have since reviewed it. With that being stated, um, uh, usually the, ori what the originators or originator or originators do get a chance to speak in some point in the beginning of, of that and Mr. Gilliland um, who had joined me with this did not have that opportunity. So um, I'm going to provide him with that as the intro um, as the first reader uh, the, this afternoon. Um, Mr. Live would like to walk through since this was a unique revert back um, along with a couple of his members and then Ms. Ortiz is going to give an overview, not read it line by line or anywhere near that, but give a better understanding so that we have a good framework and then we will open it up to discussion motions and amendments as such so that all of our core base information is clearly stated before we move on to action. So with that stated, Mr. Gilliland. to the board for I, I, what I believe was a lively discussion last month on, on the policy and then um, I would be remiss if I did not say thank you uh, to Ms. Ortiz for, for all of her work and effort um, multiple times and um, I'll just say this is uh, something that uh, became near and dear to me uh, uh, almost a year ago. I would say it was late spring last year when we um, were passing our financial disclosure policy and uh, for obvious reasons, we, we passed that uh, unanimously and, and, and certainly that um, is an essential policy for the board to have. Um, what I noticed at that time, and I know I made a comment from, from the dais, that there were aspects of that policy that did not include some of the other ethical aspects, forgive, forgive me for using the word multiple times. Um, so there were some gaps. And, and I think through some conversations, we, we stepped back from the financial aspect uh, and, and delved more deeply into the uh, non-financial ethical components that um, I think um, morphed into um, uh, a, a policy that, that was before us last month and then you know, with some adjustments, um, I, I believe under Mr. Live's leadership and, and certainly with uh, Mr. Ortiz's um, support I, I think has has come back to us. I, I, I do believe um, that there are going to be some some uh, amendments today that that may fine tune um, or, or at least bring some clarity to 
to um, what we have before us, but why this became more important to me, um, you know, we made the, the request, um, I, I think it was just as uh, Mrs. Corkadal became vice president last summer and, and, and we worked on this throughout the fall uh, on and off. Um, my concern was, uh, and, and, and I don't mean to um, single out institutions, I, I think this stuff happens in, in so many places, not just in Maryland, but, but throughout the country. Um, we had a, a series of resignations from the Maryland General Assembly. Um, some were resignations. Previously, there had been you know, some, some discipline occurring in the General Assembly. And I thought, what better time than to have the board fine tune its ethics? Um, and as this was coming to fruition, we had additional resignations from the Maryland General Assembly for some <coughs> poor judgment, some poor ethical behavior, and I think because of that, and again, I'm not saying that anything unethical has happened here. It has not, um, to my knowledge. Um, and, and this is not singling, yeah, to my knowledge. But this is not singling out any board member, but it's protecting the board and protecting uh, our stakeholders, our students, our teachers, uh, taxpayers, and the community at large. Should there be a violation of ethics, and, and I think, as we'll see in some of the definitions, or, uh, some of the um, amendments today, potentially adding to the definitions or bringing clarity to definitions, that I think leaves no doubt in the people's minds that this board takes its ethical responsibility seriously. And um, I, I think ethical behavior starts at the top uh, of an organization. So here we are today. Um, Madam President, I thank you for, for bringing this to the table. Thank you, Mr. Gilliland. Mr. Lyme. Thank you, Madam President. <coughs> <clears throat> Prior to Ms. Ortiz reviewing revised policy, board member ethics and professional standards, I'd like to extend my personal and professional thank you for the dedicated efforts of the policy committee to bring this draft of policy BK, bravo kilo in Navy terms, back to the board for first reader. Board members Candace Antwine, Rita Alvey, Julie Hummer, staff members Jeanette, of course, Bob Mosier, Walter Federwitz, Darren Burns, Nikki Burns, Diane Howe, and CAC Rep Julia Howells. Uh, together with a great deal of discussion, we reviewed 41 recommendations from board members, staff members, and interested citizens to delete, add, or modify the initial draft of this policy that was previously presented to the board for first reading on January 22nd. I'd like to make it perfectly clear that while all, all board member recommendations were reviewed and discussed, not all reached a level of concurrence by the committee, and therefore not all are included in the policy before you. However, that being the case, the committee's work resulted in a unanimous vote to move the policy to first reader and bring it before the board today. Again, many heartfelt thanks to my fellow committee members uh, for their dedicated efforts in bringing this policy forward. I don't know of any committee members that have something they'd like to add. Um, this is just commenting on the policy work. We'll get to the policy right. itself. I, I, and I would, I would beg to, to give Ms. Ortiz her time prior Yes, to Madam President, gotcha. Uh, I want to commend you, Mr. Leib, for facilitating something that is, can be extremely tedious something that can be extremely controversial, as well as uh, introduce dissension between members. The facilitation that you did was beautiful, it was timely, and it allowed consensus. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Hummer, did you have something on, on the policy committee? Uh, yes. Yes, just real quick. So again, um, there was very in-depth discussion on this on all areas. and. Uh, enormous input from everyone. I particularly, along with Ms. Ortiz, I would particularly like to thank um, India Oaks, who is um, in her, in her uh, she was here earlier, but in her role in the public, she is a compliance officer. And so she has experience with this, and she gave us some very valuable input, and I believe many, we took some of her recommendations, and I think that makes this policy significantly stronger. So I want to thank her for all of her work and suggestions that she put into this as well. Thank you, Ms. Hummer. Um, Ms. Alvey? So I'll just like to echo um, the remarks of my policy committee colleagues, but 
to add, I want to express the importance of this policy um, and the reason why I feel that we took sufficient time to really review it and make sure that everything um, was to the best that it could be before it came came to this dais, um, and particularly for students, how important it is, as Mr. Gillen said, to for us as board members to hold ourselves to this very high ethical standard, um, because there are younger students out there who are watching this work and watching what we do um, and hope to have this position one day, and the way that we carry ourselves makes a huge impact on that. So I just wanted to add those words. Thank you very much. With that stated, um, Ms. Ortiz, if you could please just give us a uh, sort of that uh, top uh, two second overview, sort of overview. Sure, I um, think a lot it. of what I was going to say has already been said, so I will not be repetitive. But I just wanted to point out that the policy encompasses already existing obligations of board members, and so it's just in one policy so that we have one frame of reference um, and is in accordance um, a portion of it with state public ethics law so that's the ethics piece of it which is the third section um, there's some professional standards so I reorganized it to kind of be very clear as to what's aligned with the state public ethics law versus just professional standards. And uh, thank you to Ms. Antoine, because she suggested that we update the, um, the title of the policy to be more reflective of what it has inside of it. And so we have things that are in the handbook that board members already receive and sign to you know, follow. And then we have things that are um, aligned professional standards and according with the, the administration of the school system that are in accordance with state law. And so um, a lot of this is, is, is aligned with state law and um, some of it with your handbook. And again, a thank you to Ms. Oaks because she did provide some really good um, feedback that I think helped to bolster and give more teeth uh, to the policy. And so um, with that, uh, one other thing, I, you know, I looked at various uh, sources. Obviously, the state public ethics law was the primary source document and state ethics commission, but also the state board of education. So some of our language comes di directly from the State Board of Education Governance Manual, right? And so for consistency's purposes. So with that, I'll leave it at that, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ortiz. And I, just before we get started, I don't have specific amendments um, or comments to any one section. I've, re I've reviewed it, and if I do have additional, I'll definitely uh, share that out with you in advance. Um, but um, I just do want to personally thank you guys for this. Um, and as Mr. Gilliland had pointed out, you know, I too had a moment. It was different than his moment in the spring. Uh, mine goes back to my, my campaign um, when I was working on an issue actually with the, the, one of the Capital Gazette uh, reporters and had identified that well, it would be nice if it would all be put together. And so I want to thank my, um, our former president. Mr. Gilliland for uh, allowing me the opportunity to uh, team up with him to recognize something that I, I think was uh, definitely um, worthy of this board's um, consideration. So with that stated, we have Ms. Ellis and then Ms. Shaw. Hi, Ms. Ellis. Thank you. Uh, first, I, I can't help but chime in and, and thank everyone for your hard work on this. Um, I. I had concerns and was a bit uncomfortable with the original um, presentation of this policy, but um, that's not that's not to be disparaging in any way. But I, what I my point is, I am so appreciative, particularly of Mr. Leib, of of hearing concerns and and um, and taking a, a real leadership role in um, in moving us forward. So I, I greatly appreciate that. And um, that being said, I have read through the policy. I have a couple things um, to either ask or point out, but, um, <coughs> but uh, well, I'll just get started. Um, so to reiterate, um, Ms. Ortiz, th this is not new as far as any law or code we're already required to follow as board members. Um, so it's intended to create transparency and acknowledge the existing law. Um, as this policy is a collection of existing law, code, and established rules for board members, um, 
I wonder if we could reference the existing um, law or code that anything in here is coming from in the policy. And I'm sorry if I've missed it, but, um, and um, that's so that the policy remains compliant is not, and is not deemed by anyone to be all inclusive of the standards to which this body is held. So in your purpose, um, I referenced the state public ethics law in there. And so that's the ethics uh, portion of the, um, of the policy, which is in accordance with the law. And then there's other sections where we specifically say in, a, in accordance with state law. Okay, I, I guess I was thinking um, it would be helpful to anyone um, reading this to have, I, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move in sort of to the next part of this. That I, to get perspective, I thought, okay, let me see what the county council has. And, um, and when I went to their website, I saw um, the only thing they reference is the state law and then the duties of the county ethics commission. So I don't know if, do they have an actual yes. code? Okay, yeah, I couldn't it find it online. Somewhere in all of my, so right. yeah, I mean, they so, have it in code in the, and so some okay. of the language. That's helpful. Because it's aligned, so right, so we have the state public ethics laws, and so um, local bodies and state and local boards of education are required to have policies and regulations in place that align with the state public ethics law. And so what you'll find is, so this is Anne Arundel County, just on conflict of interest, and they identify all of their local ordinance codes that deal with specific issues that you know we also address here. So all of the language is very aligned. There are little tweaks here and there because obviously as a state official versus a legislator versus a county official versus a board member, there will be uh, differences in roles and responsibilities. So those specific things are tweaked, but essentially it's all aligned. And Ms. Corkadell had shared this little public ethics law yeah. booklet all, all that, <laughs> that the oh, county used to hand out to employees. So yeah, between the county and then I have, you know, the state public ethics law right. and the state ethics commission breaks it down. Um, further with specific guidance. And as Mr. Gilliland mentioned, so our policy BAF, which is ethics and conflict of interest, already talks about use of prestige and conflict of interest, but it's almost like in passing because it, the financial aspect really dominates that policy. However, the State Ethics Commission, which is the state body who has oversight over ethics for the entire state, including for local bodies, they have a bunch of documentation and resource and guidance and language and they really spell out what is a conflict or what are common conflicts of interest, what are common use of prestige issues that may come up because, you know, people may have questions and because the, the state regulations, you know, don't, uh, aren't as fleshed out. Um, so they really break it down. They have a whole slew of opinions, legal opinions on these matters as well. And so that's where that language came from. Okay, thank you. You're so um, so I, I wanna make it uh, clear, first of all, that um, I am fully in favor of transparency and accountability for board members. Um, I, I just wanna be careful that um, that we don't have any language that is subjective and sets up a scenario that encourages the policing of fellow board members. So that's where I think a few of us really took pause a few meetings ago. Um, so going back, when, when I was on the county council uh, website looking for their code, um, again, they, um, they quoted state law or referenced state law and had the actual Public Ethics Law, Article 7, Section 1 to 1 or 2, or something like that. Um, I would like to see anything that is in this policy um, that comes directly from other law or code or um, that it's specifically referenced. 
I think it's helpful. So you want a line by line reference of the law? Uh, if it could be uh, perhaps a, no, not a not a line by. I don't want the law quoted. I want it. I want the the. I want it named. The law. Yeah, right. So it is. It's in the purpose. It's the state public ethics law. If you Google it, it'll come up. So the reason why we don't put code, we've kind of stayed away from um, stylistically from putting specific uh, sections of the laws because they change. And so what happens is that then we would be not, you know, would be something incorrect. So the state public ethics law in Maryland is very, I mean, well known for at least those of us that have been doing this work, um, you know, legislative work and ethics work. Um, and so it's one of the strong, probably the strongest, strongest uh, public ethics law in the mm -hmm. country, if not one of them. Um, so literally a Google search will take you right there. So that's the that's the name of it. It's the state public ethics law And so that's how it's referenced. Well, my concern is if that law if your concern is that We don't be too specific because it could change the wording that's in here is Specifically from that law. So if it does change we it, would change it Because that's my job is to right now. We're in the middle of session. It's crazy lots of bills so whether it's me or someone in the future that would be their responsibility to be keeping track of that. And actually, there are lots of ethics laws right now being considered by the General Assembly that I'm tracking that I haven't, uh, you know, don't necessarily, uh, may not impact us, but depends on whether or not they get amended. And so then, as I do with any law and any of our policies, so the vast majority of our policies are in accordance with state law or pursuant to state law. Mm -hmm. And so anytime the law changes, we then change the policy. Same with state regulations, because state regulations have been changing quite a bit lately. Mm -hmm. And so we have to update them. And so that's part of m one of my many responsibilities is to stay on top of that and to ensure that we're uh, aligned and that we're updating our policies and regulations to be compliant with state law and regulations. All right. Um, and then a couple other things. Um, the, looking at section C, um, line B. Can you tell me page number? Um, page two of five. Second line on the page. Um, it reads that could render the board member biased and unable to prioritize the interests of the school system. I much prefer the wording, the interests of the student, staff, and other stakeholders. Um, I'm concerned that I, d I don't see the, the board as here to prioritize the needs of the system, it's the people. That's why we're here, to make the system work for the people. Um, so maybe I think that's what the ref, we use school system I mean, that's a stylistic thing. When we say school system, that's what we mean. We, we don't just mean like central office or just staff. So that's, right. that's just a I'm stylistic thing. I'm aware you drafting. don't mean yeah. just central office. Yeah, but my so that's just a style thing. Right. Um, to me, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know how other, I'm, I'm going to throw things out there right now, and then I'm happy to wait for a second reading to And we actually actual have amendments. other language. I mean, if there's consensus around something like that, there's other language already in here that spells it out. You know, AACPS students, staff, community parents, guardians. Mm -hmm. So if that's, that would be a technical type change that I could do if okay. there was consensus that you wanted to be more specific yeah, like on it. that because we do have language. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so yeah, under position. Um, line four, it says the best interest of students, public education, and AACPS as a whole. I just prefer that wording than what we have up in B. Um, I think that's technical. Yeah, okay. that's a technical Great. change, and I can just add that. Fabulous. Okay. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, and then the bottom of that page, last item. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not even sure what I'm about to say. I'm reading my uh, note right now. Um, oh, so I agree with the spirit of this statement, but I'm, I'm not sure how, how it would be fairly enforced. Keep the discussions and board meetings focused on the critical issues of governance in order to have public sessions 
conducted in an efficient professional and business-like manner. That's certainly my my goal and my hope, but I, I don't know how, I mean, the last item. So that language just says background. So um, it was recommended by Ms. LV um, to have some similar language. The state board has language. Um, and so what we had discussed was, you know, they have the, I kind of merged two different statements on the state board governance manual because um, so one of part of this is the state board has refrained from comments concerning family members, personal philosophy, personal experiences in order to have public sessions conducted in a professional and business-like manner. And so we talked about that and we talked about how, you know, the board meetings really shouldn't be about people talking about their personal things all the time, but there will be times where that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, the policy committee members thought that they liked the second half of that statement, but not the first half would be too restrictive and unrealistic because whether you're talking about, you know, community events or Ms. LB, for example, she mentioned her experience as a student member of the board and things of that nature, that it would be hard to really com fully comply with that. And so what uh, we did is we added the um, other language from the uh, state board where it talks about really focusing the meetings on the issues of governance. And so merging that to really, you know, the, the point there was to ensure that um, the meetings are, you know, business-like and moving as efficiently as possible. So that's where that language came from. Okay, so I understand where it came from. I, I still have the same concern, um, which is um, how do I, so and it goes back to my statement that I don't want board members to sort of policing each other. Um, that it's very subjective as to um, critical issues of governance. Um, as far as what's being talked about in a meeting. Um, I, I th I'm very comfortable and I think we all have had conversations with each other. Hey, we need to get better at this um, and fully agree. Um, but to put it in a policy, I'm a little concerned with the wording that it's a bit sub sub subjective. So and I think the conversation was, you know, it's a state board language they manage to uh, run their meetings effectively and are able to, you know, comply with it. And so I think folks were comfortable with that, with the with the language and the intention. Um, again, I'm not I'm not taking any hard stand on anything today. I'll wait till second reader um, to really be concerned about amendments. But um, I, I'm floating things out there because I want people to think about this. Um, and then. Page three of five. I uh, item eleven, third line. Um, I'm sure this comes from somewhere, so maybe I'm wrong to be uncomfortable with this. Um, I agree with the statement, but I'm. Uh, it almost it almost could imply that board members are communicating and conducting business. In other words, I'm concerned about OMA, you know. Um. Yeah, so that's not, so I failed to mention this uh, previously, but board council was also involved in reviewing this and okay. provided feedback and he didn't have any concerns with that or didn't raise any concerns, I should say, with me with that language. And so that language is in, I believe, in your handbook and the superintendent's contract in some way, uh, some manner. Okay, and so I, hear, I just, I've heard a lot from the public that at least in the past, a lot of members of the public have been concerned that that the board is conducting business and, and making decisions um, and things out here are just a formality. And I just want to make sure it's really yeah, clear. Yeah, I think the word collaborate and not. conducting business are two very different, have different meanings to them. And that was well, discussed except that at the, as, at the as a body, committee. we can't collaborate behind. Like we can't, we can't. Sure you can. So with the budget, for example, a member submitted all of their budget amendments in advance and saw them in advance. So that's not conducting business. There wasn't discussion. discussion. Okay. There, were no, there was no, um, you know, opinions or, you know, or, or, or any actions being taken. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of like 
providing that information and everybody had that information in advance okay. to I kind of prepare. So I mean, that would be a good example, I think, of collaborating. Okay. I, um, and then two more things. Uh, no, one more thing. Um, no, actually two, sorry. Um, page four or five. Um, and forgive me, Mr. Grannon, if I'm overstepping, but I believe this is where you had made a recommendation that several of us agreed to. Um, three, uh, three, three, I, I, I. Um, engage in any conduct or activity that would impair a board member's impartiality or independence of judgment in carrying out, and I, I thought we tried to narrow this to quasi-judicial responsibilities because the concern that it, it implies that a board member cannot have feelings or an opinion on something and even have an, in the past taken action on that. Um, I mean, you know, several of us, um, ran on a platform we were very clear about how we feel about a certain issue and we want to make sure that again I keep going back to I don't want misinterpretation and having board members policing each other and and you know someone claiming well you met with this person 18 months ago so you're in you're partial you know that kind of thing right so that language was amended a little bit because before some folks were having concern with the word advocate in there, although right. that would still apply, but we just changed the wording. Um, and so the whole part about impartiality or independence comes from state ethics. And so there was conversation and we did consider that amendment to just keep it as quasi-judicial and the policy committee decided to keep it as the full authority of the board. And for example, um, your legislative function of, of adopting policies right you shouldn't be adopting policies that could result in a personal financial benefit or sure. personal benefit to you so that's your legislative function okay. right? right and that would be in violation of state ethics law okay. um, with regards to the executive function so for example a board member should not be um, contacting school staff to enter into a contract with a particular vendor that's going to benefit that mm -hmm. board member's child's or children's school on a particular issue um, and then go in the, then if that contract comes before you as a board member and you're voting on it right so that would be um, a huge conflict so on the executive yeah. side procurement matters are big issues you guys have contracts that you um, that you vote upon regularly you know I'd say at every meeting and things of that nature and so that would be the the executive function of the board and so that's why after discussion the policy committee thought that it was wanted to make sure that all of that because there are different scenarios that can come up in the different functions I think the quasi judicial one is the most obvious one right. when it comes to appeals but then you have a lot of other uh, functions and decisions that the board makes in the legislative and on the executive piece which may not be as often um, as a mm -hmm. quasi-judicial piece or as obvious, but certainly can come up. And so then the decision was to keep all of that just to make sure we're covering our bases. Okay, and I, I appreciate that, like I agree with all of those reasons. I'm j I just have some concerns about the interpretation of the policy sometime in the future. Um, so that's why I'm bringing up my concerns. And finally, and this is kind of a, this is, it's a side note, but to me it's important to mention because this I, I, I don't have a concern with it in the policy, but uh, the mention of the board ethics panel. I actually uh, had to look that up because I don't know who's on it and you know so I saw it on our website, um, but there's there's no there's no information for the public on how that panel is um, selected. So if you look at policy BAF that the board, recently reviewed and passed there's a whole section on the board ethics panel I'm just there in suggesting with the since law. we I mean we have like biographies of the people on there it would be good I again I'm pretty sure the county council has something about how anyway I think it'd be great on our website um, 
to have. Yeah, yeah. I would say I, I'm happy to work with you and get us connected with staff to yeah, figure thanks. out how to modernize our ethics panel interface with the public. Um, because that was actually one of my, my, my driving courses, too, on my other work. Thank you. Um, do you have anything else to say? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next, we have Ms. Schalheim and then Ms. Antoine. Ms. Schalheim. Okay. Thank you. So um, first, I want to thank Ms. Ortiz and her staff as well. I don't think her staff get mentioned enough, and I know that they do a lot of hard work, too. Uh, Mr. Live, the Policy Committee, for taking this very important policy back and having another crack at it. And I very much appreciate um, your efforts and your consideration of all of our suggested edits. Um, I also don't want to be misunderstood in any way. All of us must always hold ourselves to the highest standard. I do, however, have several amendments uh, I'm going to be presenting today um, to this draft policy as written. I ask my colleagues to think about each amendment as well as this and current, this current and future boards including the student voice, which will soon be, and all of us will, except for the, well, the student by students, but all of us um, sitting up here will soon be um, elected by uh, voters of this county. And so just be patient with me and my explanation of each of my edits. At least three of these were previously mentioned by Mr. Granin during the February 5th meeting, and I, I agreed with all of them uh, then, and I will be motioning for each if he doesn't bring them up himself. All right, so let's hop in. Um, so I move to specifically define in section C the phrase improper influence. Uh, so if, because it's mentioned in the purpose and then at least twice in the issue. So I think it's important to have a, um, a specific definition of that. So that is a first motion it is second okay and so like I said this text occurs in section a and then in section B three and before and so our policies must always be you know specific of course and well defined to avoid misinterpretation and also and most importantly to ensure consistent enforcement some of our current and future board members may not have a government background or a political background so mr. Leib I took your advice after I spoke with you and reached out to Mr. Gilliland. And we spoke for an hour about this phrase, improper influence or even the appearance of improper influence as, it, as what it means for government officials and, and, states and state employees. And I would still honestly be scratching my head about what it is and what it is not if I didn't reach out to my colleague who is a state employee and also has been an elected official and therefore the subject of state ethics laws in both capacities and as a board member. So. At a minimum, we must, uh, def the phrase improper influence must be defined so that all current and future board members know what it is and is not an example of improper influence as defined in the Maryland State Ethics Law would include such things as like, I don't know, receiving a discount on a good or service for voting a particular way, that would be improper. But improper influence is not listening to constituents, students, community groups, and local and state elected officials or being a member of community groups and nonprofit organizations. And so, like I said, I, I really want us to um, consider the, strongly consider defining that in the definition section because we're not talking about um, the financial, uh, since these are the non-financial ethical uh, components, um, I think it's really important that we know that so we don't, uh, use, so this phrase can't be used against current or future board members, including our student member. And so I'm just going to read an example. So let's just take, for example, the Crofton redistricting. So I think we can all agree that that was a stressful time. For several of us, that was our first experience with redistricting, at least as board members. And there were passionate voices on both sides of Route 3, and most of us met with community groups um, and members of the community on both sides. I assumed we all listened to everyone, and we that we talked to and we took their points of view into consideration when making our decisions. And if the cross and redistricting was in your district or directly affected your district, you were listening to your voters, your people. Were any of us improperly influenced or had the appearance of improper influence? Of course not. We were listening to our constituents because that is part of our job. And our constituents were participating in the democratic process and lobbying for what they want. And then once our minds were made up, 
a lot of us talk to each other because that's what typically happens when a vote is forthcoming. But what if a member or members disagreed with another member or members about the Crofton redistricting? Could they then accuse another member of being improperly influenced or having the appearance of improper influence because they, just because they met with voters and listened to their concerns? So my fear is that the phrase in question, if kept undefined, can be applied to any member for any reason at any time and our important part of our job is listening to our constituents, listening to all sides of an argument, um, informs our decisions on everything from voting on redistricting to voting on new courses such as the GCC. And every elected you know, person in this county, state, and nation ran on a platform. And this platform likely included goals that the candidate would like to accomplish if elected. Does that then mean that every member of the board now and in the future could be accused of improper influence? if other members simply don't agree with another member's educational philosophy or stance on an issue. And so um, I just ask that we, and this certainly goes uh, for the student as well because they, they also run on, on platforms and, uh, and, then, um, and then try to execute those if they are successful in becoming the, um, than you know, a student member. And so um, we just need to properly define it. And so that's where I'll leave that first amendment. But I, like I said in the beginning, I have, I have several amendments. So that's the first one. Okay, so um, Mr. Granin um, uh, and then Ms. Antoine. Ms. Michelle, I'm going to entertain a friendly amendment. I, I, I agree with what she's saying. And um, I mean, not, not that it's the end all and be all, but I have practiced law for 22 years. I've never heard the term improper influence it's, any it's all over state ethics commission guidance she pulled it and language the and the state board of education well, uses then, okay, it throughout then, then, as then well maybe, then maybe the, this takes care then there should be a definition of it they somewhere. don't define it but i would say that conflict of interest is defined and so improper influence would result in a conflict of interest well, the, the, the comment that i was going to say is that would Ms. Schaumheim be open to using the term impropriety i think that's a, a much clearer term than improper influence. I, I think that in, in, influence brings into it the kind of stuff that you're talking about, taking into account our role as advocates and elected officials or appointed officials. Nonetheless, we all represent, whether we're elected or appointed, we all represent constituents. And I do think the influence kind of makes it a little murky there, whereas if it said to help, help avoid impropriety or even the appearance of impropriety, I think that's a much clearer demarcation of, of basically misconduct. Okay, I definitely accept that so long as we change the wording in every place where it says influence, in, influence to impropriety and then take out the word improper, right? That, that would be yeah. my suggestion. Yeah. That we replace so globally my, improper influence with impropriety. Right, and then, and then define it in section C. Because I, I think as, as left unchecked, undefined, someone could come to someone else just because they disagree with that person and then say, well, you were improperly influenced because you had a conversation with X, Y, or Z. I don't have a government background, um, so like I said, if I hadn't talked to my colleague to to get educated on this, I still wouldn't know what it is. So you know, I think we should include it in the definitions. Thanks for that. Anything else, Mr. Grannon? No. Nope. Okay, um, Ms. Antoine, um, on on the motion um, at hand. Oh, mine is actually. Uh, yeah, that's why I was earlier. saying that yeah. because I know that you had already. I can turn light, it off so. until she's finished. Yeah, why don't I? We'll do that. I'll turn you right back on as soon as we're. Appreciate uh, it. Oh well, that, that didn't <laughs> sound. <laughs> oh, leave that one alone. Okay, <laughs> um, move, moving along. We have. Um, I do have a question on on Ms. Schalheim's, um thing. It, if we were to so improper influence, it it, it does sound like you know there is a, a vagity there, but. If the state law is using it, the consequence of replacing that, does that nullify the impact of the replication of it throughout? Um, so my only concern with defining improper influence when the state law doesn't define it is that we're making up a definition that's not in state law and this, the state ethics policy is in state law. Um, you know, I have the state ethics guidelines here and, and it literally says to avoid improper influence or even the appearance of improper influence. And so that's my hesitation in defining something that the state hasn't defined and we're making up our own definition. I think conflict of interest really covers it. Um, 
And I would just say that impropriety, impropriety is not quite the same, I don't think, as improper influence, because the whole point of the state ethics law is to deal exactly with that, the influence, the improper influence of elected officials, state officials, local officials from you know, interest groups and things of that nature. And that's why it was passed, and that's why it's so uh, stringent. And so you know, I understand the, the concern with subjectivity or the appearance of subjectivity, but I always hesitate for us to define something that the law hasn't defined if we're basing it on the law. That would be my only comment. Okay, so you know, well, Thank you. Yeah, I, have, I, have a, I have a follow-up to that as well. Well, what's the I'm point sorry. of having duplicative? I don't know. Okay, um, Michelle Heim. So yeah, I, I, I know you took it from state ethics law. You took it from page nine, and that section talked about improper influence in the form of a public official or state employee's financial affairs. In fact, the whole sentence refers to the state business and reads, quote, is evident that the people's confidence and trust are eroded when the conduct of the state's business is subject to improper influence or even the appearance of improper influence. So the subject of the sentence is state's business. The state ethics law is an 156-page document plenty, with plenty of context around phrases such as that. I believe this phrase was taken out and now is applied to a, a policy that is not about, is about the non-financial ethics components. And so we are taking it out where it's talking about financial dealings and then we're putting it in here to talk about non-financial ethical components. And so th it is subjective in my view. So we either need to define it and I believe we can under that. I even came up with a with the definition um, that I will definitely speak to later if I'm if this goes through. Um, or, or we need to strike it because that sentence was just fine in, in the purpose without without the and. You know, we could just say the board recognizes that in accordance with state public ethics laws, this policy will help ensure the public of the impartiality and independent judgment of board members, period. That, that covers it. So, like I said, look, that was taken out of page nine, and the context around it was all financial stuff, and it was put in something that talks by and large about non-financial ethical So components. I'd like to point out that the State Board of Education has the same language in I their know, governance. I know, but they're not an elected body. And they're not body. financial. Yeah. So. So, yeah, I'm just saying, like, I, I see your face, and I, I heard your tone last time, you too, when we talked about this, and this is not a stab at, at you, your staff, or the writing of this, or the policy committee. I'm just trying to make it as tight of a ship as possible so that it can't be misinterpreted. That's also my goal, yes. Later, by this board or by, car or by future boards. So. Okay, um, uh, we don't have any more uh, comments. Are there any public comments? Seeing no movement, Ms. Howell, please call the roll. Ms. Ellis? I'm sorry. Wait, 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 we need to restate the motion. I need to know the motion. <laughs> yeah. So okay. I don't know where we where we left it. Well, um, it, 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 well, we have a first. Wait, wait. Please let me speak here for a second. We had a motion by Ms. Schalheim that was seconded. That motion was not rescinded um, and replaced with anything. And there was a friendly amendment that you had suggested a replacement of the language of the word improper influence to be your language. And so that was accepted as a friendly amendment. That's a word replacement. That's fine. So that is the motion. Um, is to have it. it defined under Section C, uh -huh. um, that language. So it is no longer improper influence being defined in Section C. It is impropriety, uh, impropriety being defined in Section C. Right. Um, and so that is the motion. Um, uh, uh, although there was discussion about um, improper influence swapping out, the motion is, is as such. Uh, I have a point of information. Yes, sir. I have a point of information before we vote on the motion. Just stepping back for a second from a larger perspective, if we're governed by state law that has a provision on improper influence, what is the effect of any additional language that we promulgate that says the same thing? We're already governed by state law, right? So if we violate state law, uh, whether it be improper influence, conflict, any, we face the consequences for sure. that. 
what what does having it in this policy what does that add to that oh okay I think the reason and Ms. Corkadell Mr. Gilliland can speak more to this than I can but I think the point was to just because folks are unfamiliar with the state ethics law and we're not familiar with sort of the requirements under the state ethics law and because our current uh, ethics and conflict of um, interest law is very narrow in you discussing uh, conflicts of interest and use of prestige the goal was to have sort of this one policy that encompasses the legal requirements as well as other professional standards so that board members would have one document to refer to and you know be informed about what the requirements are particularly in the law okay this is the same question to follow up so I, I guess I understand that for areas where we we would be extending whatever the prohibition is so you said there would there was an area that was kind of narrow in state law for areas that are actually basically coextensive with state law wouldn't we be more transparent to the public instead of saying hey we decided to basically make up these rules and you know uh, apply them to ourselves because we think it's a good idea which this kind of has that appearance wouldn't the, the more transparent thing to do to say the board members are governed by state law acts and have a link to where whatever the law is so the public can see we're actually governed by that law we didn't just decide as good governance to impose this on ourselves and in any areas where we decide to go above and beyond state law we would make that very clear and say the board members on separate section conflict members, board members are governed by state law xyz by and the way we are deciding to go above and beyond that and add the following this document doesn't do that this document kind of cut and paste various things and it's not evident to the public what the underlying source of the of the enforcement is yeah, I, I'm just saying that this is a, actually a little bit confusing to me when I look at this purpose. You know, it, it makes it sound like this is something we're doing ourselves because we think it's a good idea, as opposed to here's a state law, we're absolutely bound by that, and now we're deciding to go as, or we're proposing to the public, by the way, that we go a step further. And here, and maybe there's a, there should be a reason for that if it's not immediately apparent. So that that ends my comment. Okay, um, Mr. Gilliland, um, it looks. Uh, I guess we're still in common here. Mr. Gillard. Thank you. And, and Mr. Grannon, I, 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 I hear you. I, I think um, and this may not answer your question in its entirety, and it, it, it's certainly not, um, uh, I, I'm not necessarily debating this. I, I think one of the goals was to put this stuff in layman's terms, too. Um, because, you know, as, as we saw even last meeting or two meetings ago when we were discussing this, when a reference was made, I think it was Mr. Lai made a military joke and you joked back, you know, you're going to take attorneys out of, take work away from attorneys. Because the cross-referencing and, 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 and everything that's necessary sometimes to follow law, and I don't mean any offense to our attorney friends, that can be so convoluted at, at, at times that you then put it into layman's terms where you, you need it to be explicit enough for somebody who says, you know what, I see that's the boundary and I, I should not be crossing that boundary. And I, I, I'm not saying that this is answering your question or, 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 or not, but I, I'm, I'm just at least giving a perspective as to where this evolution came from. So to put it in layman's terms for anyone who may not be an attorney, may not have a government background, who needs to know don't touch the oven when it's hot or your finger is going to get burned. Um, and, and so I think when some of this was spelled out, potentially maybe above and beyond what was initially required because I think you made a good, a good point there. Um, that's really the purpose or the intent. So if, if, if that needs to be modified by way of, of, of comments and purpose, I, I'm, I'm certainly open to that, that, that delineates state law from something that's beyond state law or more restrictive than state law. But, but again, I, I think the goal here was for people who don't have a legal background or a government background, you know, here's the, the police line, do not cross it. Thank you, Mr. Gilliland. Uh, Ms. Shawheim? That definitely illustrates my point, is that we're trying to establish a line that we don't cross. And with the wording as it stated, I don't know where, I mean, as a layman, I, I didn't even know what that meant. I was like, okay, so if I talk to a voter, oh my gosh, am I gonna be accused of improper influence or even the appearance of improper influence? I did Google the state document, as you, are now aware and like I said uh, the wording all around that sentence on page nine was about financial affairs and not the non-financial ethical components and so I definitely think we, we need to 
define it specifically in section C or strike it because that sentence is really good without the and and the other stuff. I know that we say improper influence or even the appearance of improper influence in BAF, but that is appropriate because that, that is the document, that is the policy that talks about financial dealings, et cetera. And this isn't set up for that because we already have BAF. We already have the financial, the conflicts of interest one. So if we're talking about non-financial ethical components, we need to, again, specifically define what, it, what, it, what improper influence means. Could I to call my colleague and talk for an hour about that or, or, or strike it because it's applied, I believe, correctly in policy BAF. I'm a little concerned that it's not in this particular one because this is, again, the non-ethical components. The non the non-financial ethical components. Okay. Um, we, we are discussing still the specific motion, and I, I just want to kind of, I, I know we're, it, it almost sounded like we were getting away from the motion, and there'll be plenty of time to talk about uh, the other stuff. So um, we had, do have a motion we're entertaining, um, Ms. Ellis and Mr. Ladd. Thank you. Yeah, after, uh, after considering all of the discussion, I, I I have to say I agree that if the sentence read, the board recognizes that in accordance with state public ethics law, this policy will help assure the public of the impartiality and independent judgment of board members. Improper influence or appearance of improper influence would indicate impartiality. Mm -hmm. So it is already covered. Um, in the beginning of that sentence. Um, I know right now the motion that we are discussing includes, I believe, to help avoid impropriety, but I, 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 I see the case for just Discussion. ending the sentence after members. I'll, I'll withdraw my friendly amendment. And I'm totally fine with just striking the wording. Um, uh, okay, well, have to dispel of a motion here, and at, because we just ran, we, we just jumped it right on over. So, for the this is parliamentary, no, no, no diss on anyone, but we we have an obligation to follow parliamentary. So, there was a motion on definition section, and so we are either going to debate that and then vote on it, or we are withdrawing it, and then a new motion can be entertained. Which are we doing? Point of order, I'm sorry. Can I clarify mm -hmm. something? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, Because okay. I might be confused. I thought we were talking about the amendment in the purpose section, not the um, She had, uh, her, her motion was to have defined, her original motion was to define improper influence. And then a friendly amendment to change improper, the word improper influence to something else occurred um, but the request for the definition for it to be included in the definition remains. So that is the motion that we are on. If the motion is changed, we need to withdraw that original one if it is no longer germane and a friendly amendment and reissue the amendment. So if Ms. Schalheim would like to withdraw her motion and restate a new one or somebody else, she can. So yeah, I want to uh, can I do a point of clarification, please? So I understood her saying wherever that was referenced throughout the document that we would we would change that. So uh, if well, if well, well, that's no longer a friendly amendment of changing a word that changes substantive and it, it's just a formality. If we could just yeah, say my, it. my request yeah, let, my request for clarification is this, please. Um, with with uh, Vice President Ellis, you are recommending an amendment to rather than. The friendly amendment, to put another term there, your friendly amendment is to delete the, the, um, the I guess, the term or phrase improper influence? And, and okay, so my understanding was we were talking about the wording and the purpose, and that's where Mr. Grannon offered a friendly amendment to begin with, and Ms. Schalheim's amendment said changing that wording and or defining it in definitions. So I, I'm still caught on the fact that I thought we were discussing the wording that is in the purpose. And so I was recommending that we. Um, so that uh, was statements that were made after the motion um, was granted and seconded. 
And so you can, uh, I mean, there's no motion that would have an or case scenario um, unless it was under a different circumstance. So okay, we wouldn't do one or the other and yeah. vote to do one or the other. Yeah, That's me, what here we are, would be here to vote for. So uh, as I stated, we can either vote on the motion or Ms. Shalham can withdraw the original and restate it as as she would like or defer her, withdraw and defer to someone else to All restate. Right. So I'm going to withdraw it and replace it with striking the phrase from the purpose section on the second line so that the, the, the second sentence ends with members and the, the, the text that would be, would be um, stricken. stricken, thank you, is and help avoid improper influence or even the appearance of improper influence. Because like I said, this comes from ethics law where it talks about financial stuff this is the non-financial ethical component. Do I have a second on that, by the way? Second. Great. Okay, uh, just to restate this, um, because I think we've debated most of it um, have, yeah. already, Mr. Lab is going to uh, be chirping in a comment. So we will. your motion is just, to, uh, just for now, is to strike um, the word and through the word influence in section A. Correct? Now, yes, I will okay. have others, like I said. Well, of course. Yeah. Um, so that is the motion. It has been seconded. Mr. Leib? Call the question. Good. <laughs> Do we need to vote on that? No. no. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Hall, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Yeah, aye, for the reason that uh, that is already governed by BAF. Ms. Schalheim? Aye, same. It's already in BAF. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? I, I had a question that I was going to ask that uh, I, I didn't get a chance to ask it before the, um, uh, the, the vote was called um, uh, about its reference with, with regard to the State Board of Education. And, and so for that reason, I, I, I've got to abstain. I, 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 can't, I can't vote on something that I'm not certain of because I didn't have my question answered, so I abstain. Mr. Lyde? Nay. Ms. Hummer? Nay. Ms. Corkadel? Nay. Nay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, motion, <laughs> motion fails um, four, three, one abstention. Okay. Ms. Shalhan? All right, you so like just keep rolling. Yep, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna done. keep rolling. Okay, so <laughs> keep going. since that failed, then we need to define improper influence in section C, what it is and what it is not. That's my motion. Second. All right. Do we need to debate any more of that? Or We're good. You guys. Well. Um, so. We're simply voting to define it. Yes. You had mentioned that you had a suggestion. I have a suggestion. Okay, but I don't know how good it we is, can just I'll okay. Say, I can so I, I, I guess what could happen is we could vote to define it, and then that could come back to us. Yeah. Back to the deficit. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to understand where we're yeah. going. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any further debate on the motion to add the definition? Seeing none, any, nope, don't see anything out, out there. Uh, Ms. Howell, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Ms. Antwine? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Lime? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms., um, I'm sorry, Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Motion passes 8-0. Okay. All right. Um, just, uh, just as a point of information, that needs to happen before it can go out to the public for first reading. Okay. Um, so. Or it would be a second reading. We're a first reading. Ah, okay. My next one is section D, uh, numeral one, part. Four. So I move to let's see here. I move to to strike this text 
Um, well, actually, I moved to to end the sentence at whole because I don't. Um, Because I, I don't know how we're going to define special interest group. And does that, like a, like a nonprofit, like a, 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 a company, an individual? So I think it's a little subjective. And so I'd, I'd like to end the sentence at whole. So that's my motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. And Ms. Antoine. I I agree with that, um, especially after after the discussions that we had earlier. I can see see that point. I would also I don't know if this aligns with her spirit and intent, but I think it should be become not four but but one. In this case, so you move it up to as the first priority for us. Sure, we can do that. We can reorder them suggest we do that as a separate motion because it's not necessarily germane Understood. to the sure. motion at, at, as fine. a whole. Um, so, um, yeah. when Mitchell has done, we can add that in. Or okay. okay, I don't see any further comments on that. Um, Ms. Ms. Howell, please. Oh, we do have one, Mr. Lett. Just for the benefit of the public, how about we, <clears throat> we read out, you know, what this, what it is in, in the policy and then how it would change so people know what we're voting on. I'm happy to. See what I'm saying? Uh huh. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Out in TV land. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Do you uh, read the whole, the whole section first? Read and the then, original yeah, and then sure. the amended. Um, okay. I think that's a great idea. So Thank the original you, sentence is sure. it's on, again, page 205 for those out there listening under section D. Roman numeral four, the original sentence reads, make decisions based upon the best interests of AACPS students, public education, and AACPS as a whole, and not those of any particular special interest group. So that's the original sentence. My, my um, motion is to end the sentence after whole, and the sentence would then read, make decisions based upon the best interests of AACPS students, public education, and AACPS as a whole, period. Okay. Um, I have a, Mr. Granite? I, I guess I have a point of information. I guess I phrase it as a question to Ms. Ortiz. So, I mean, if we're doing this as a legislative function, each of those terms should have separate independent meaning. So if we parse that as edited by Ms. Shalham, and I, I agree with her amendment, by the way, but. The things that are left are AACPS students. That should be clear. That's what we're all kind of sworn to, you know, those, those are our, our ultimate uh, bosses, right? That's who we're working for. Public education, does that mean public education interests beyond that of AACPS students? Yeah, I do. I'm hoping. What, is, that, is that public education, like, writ large, somehow bigger than the current, whatever it is, 85,000 students or however many we have? So it's public education. As a board, you're the oversight body of public education in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. So that's what that would refer to. And then AACPS as a whole, I guess I take that to mean all of the members of the AACPS community who are not students? Yeah, so you're looking at um, the employees, um, stakeholders, uh, the community. So that's the language that we use throughout other policies just to kind of encompass um, the entire AACPS community. We could just have it read AACPS students as independent as employees in the community. Okay, I don't see any more. Um, debate on this well I'm sorry I was just thinking of one last uh, thing I mean can you can you think it I, I just want to make sure that I'm not you know kind of navel gazing I mean could, so and it, to put a fine point on it something like for example compensation of of school personnel could be viewed somehow as more aligned with AACPS as a whole than the AACPS students like I, I'm not I, I'm not trying to be obtuse I'm trying to really get at Maybe it should just stop at ASCPS students is, is, what, is where I'm going with this. 
Yeah. yeah, so I think the the board has oversight of the school system and part of your oversight duties is to ensure so you know the the efficient and adequate and you know good operations of the school system and while students obviously are the priority of educating our students here in the county the school system is more than just students and so therefore you're making decisions all the time on you know whether it's teachers or other staff or even like curriculum for example right you vote on curriculum so there are lots of other things that fall under not just people or stakeholders but other decisions that impact the entire school system so I think that's what that's what we mean when we say as a whole it's just all of the decision making of the board and, and your and the decisions that you're making right when you make a decision when you vote it's your vote is based upon or your action items are based upon what you believe is in the best interest of students and the school system okay thank you Okay, um, Ms. Hall, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? And this is the motion just to stop at whole and strike yeah. everything after that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, because I think the term special interest is vague. Ms. Schulheim? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Live? Nay. Ms. Hummer? Nay. And Ms. Corkadel? Nay. Uh, motion fails 4-3 all right um, uh, my next one is on the should, should, we, should we table this because we have nine members to vote on this well uh, I assume she's going to come right back out I, I, it's still not nine I know it's going to get more difficult to change things well we have a second reader I know we do. Um, well, let's go to the the, le the hopefully less controversial then, because I think I could get fiber on this. So, um, from three section three B two three. three. Wait, no. Um, so it would be page five of five. B, uh, Roman numeral two. Um, I would like to to strike himself or herself and replace it with themselves or some sort of they because we all means all and I don't want to make any assumptions about my current or future members' gender identity. Understood. I struggled point. with that because normally yeah. I say like, the student and the student's parents because we don't use like he she yeah so I, yeah it's a technical, a technical I can because I was like okay so that's a happy okay yeah, yeah. I saw that and I was like well, yeah that was and what you I know was that like, I'm, I don't know if that's the best wording but and you know how I feel about like the other our other inclusive um, no. guidelines so. sure no absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. I'll find another okay let me just say um, point of information if, if I may I, I I just think the way around that is it should be consistent with um, B1 board, board members, board members yeah. and then get rid of a board member and then board members and then you can use uh, the, the plural yes. yeah, Thank yeah perfect Thank yeah. you. all right see that I would see have guys? It, <laughs> no no I'm just yep. you're funny all right um, so <laughs> can I can I tackle some of the yeah go for it go all for right it. so I thought that one of yours from before mr grannon was on page five of five b item one and i thought that we it was to insert after interest and i'll read the whole sentence um in its quasi-judicial capacity so then the whole sentence would then read uh b uh uh five of five b um roman numeral one so it's kind of at the top of the, the page? Yeah. And um, so currently the sentence reads board, bleh, currently the sentence reads, board members shall seek in an advisory opinion from the board ethics panel regarding a potential conflict of interest in accordance with this and any other applicable board policy. So I want to amend that sentence to then read, 
board members shall seek an advisory opinion from the board ethics panel regarding a conflict of interest in its quasi-judicial capacity in accordance with this and any other applicable board policy. So that's my motion to add the in its to specify that in its quasi-judicial capacity. Is that what they're talking about here, though? I think so. I don't know. I think so. Because this could be a financial conflict of interest. Yes, but we have BAF for that. Yeah. Oh, do we have a second? Sorry. Second. <coughs> yeah, we have a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we have uh, Ms. Hummer. Um, um, I would be, by just putting in quasi-judicial, as Ms. Ortiz explained to us earlier about how the conflicts can Im influence on an executive or legislative as well, and I think the quasi-judicial, it, the conflict of interest could occur across any of our um, duties, not just for um, the quasi-judicial part. So I wouldn't be in support of that because of the reasons that she gave us before and the examples she shared with us. Okay, Mr. Granin. Yeah, for, so for Ms. Ortiz, what conflict of interest would there be that's not governed already by BAF? So, so again, BAF, so this is, this is an extension of the non-financial aspect of BAF. BAF only makes a fleeting reference to use of prestige and conflict of interest. The rest of it is devoted to financial um, matters. And so in this policy, um, you know, as was stated earlier, the purpose was to kind of flesh that out, to give examples of the things that would come up, could come up as a use of procedure conflict of interest. And so, um, as I had mentioned earlier, you could have a situation where it's not a financial matter, but it's <clears throat> a decision where a person has a personal, a board member has a personal benefit that's not financial, but another personal benefit, and there could potentially be, you know, making a decision, or it could appear that they're making a decision based on that very personal financial benefit. So again, if it's like a policy with very specific, you know, language, or trying to have a particular policy um, on a particular issue, that could somehow have a personal benefit for the board member or family member of the board member. Um, or if it was something like, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, on the executive side, you know, if you have a board member that's involving themselves in procurement matters, that while they wouldn't have a personal financial benefit of a particular contract, they would have another personal benefit of, let's say, having a particular service at the school of their child, and they're involving themselves in trying to ensure that the school system enters into that sort of a contract. So that wouldn't be a financial benefit, but it's another benefit, and that would be inappropriate. And not governed by <coughs> BAF already? So it is governed by BAF, and this explains how it's governed by BAF. I think the concern was that BAF makes it seem like there are only financial conflicts of interest that could occur when really there are other conflicts of interest that can occur in accordance with the state public ethics law. And so while the state public ethics law doesn't get into like all the details, the State Public Ethics Commission does, and they provide guidance on all the different ways, and while some of it is related to financial matters, others are not. And so that's where the other, you know, personal benefits to a board member that are not financial in nature. So, I mean, it, it, with all respect, I mean, you, you, I think you started out your answer with, it's not, it's stuff other than financial. BAF is financial, but then financial came back in. So, I mean, just to, just to give the most basic example, if I'm advocating for better lighting, at, you know, at schools of a certain age that haven't had their lighting updated, and it turns out my kid's gonna go to one of those schools in three years, that's a conflict of interest? No, I think if you're trying to have your, you know, your child is in a school and your school wants a particular service or product, and that's not available to any other school, it's just a very particular thing. So it doesn't have to do with lighting, right? Because like lighting, we should have appropriate lighting in all of our schools. But it's a particular amenity that has, that no other school system has the, no other school in the school system has the benefit of. But you as a board member, you know, want to engage staff in trying to enter into this contract 
with this vendor for this particular amenity for your child's school or this particular service, like let's say it's an after school program we're, or we're, something. We're, we're already prohibited from <coughs> engaging directly with staff. We'd have to go through the superintendent. So we'd, have to, we'd have to convince the superintendent that, you know, Davidsonville Elementary should have, uh, you know, I don't know, water beds or something like that. And <laughs> then, you know, before, before we could get water beds, then he would have to, you know, make the staff do that. Sure, I mean, even if you contact the superintendent about the request, that would still be improper, even if the superintendent ultimately says like, no, we can't do that, that's improper, that's, you know, in violation of state ethics and our policy, that, w that action in and of itself would be an improper action. Okay, but it, I said that, that was an absurd example. We, I, we think there should be a pilot program where, where kids should have iPads. Let's start the pilot program at Davidsonville <coughs> Elementary. What do you think about that, Mr. and Superintendent? He's either going to weigh it and think it's a good idea or not weigh it. I, I, I don't understand. How does this come into play? So then it, it, before I could make that request to Dr. Alato, I would need to get an advisory opinion from the board ethics panel as to whether it's okay that I seek a pilot program that students get iPads. So at I wouldn't say that that would be a conflict. I don't. I wouldn't say that having an iPad because we do provide iPads to our different, you know, some of our schools and, and our students. Not at Davidsville so Elementary, you don't. So I, 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 somebody's getting an amenity that my kid's not getting. Um, maybe that's a conflict. I, I just could. Can you articulate one example that's not a financial example? Well, no, I'm not asking you. I'm, I'm asking the board. I'm asking the, bo the board's specialist in this. As can, I can stated, or I'll state it again. You have. <laughs> Okay, my question is not directed to you, Ms. Hummer. Can okay. you give one example other than that's not a financial example? So again, if, you, if you, your child's school, your child's middle school, let's say the PTA wants to use a particular product at the school, uh, let's say there's a particular app or service or amenity that they want that nobody else has, nobody else uses, the school system has not budgeted for it, it's not something sanctioned uh, by AACPS and a board member is insistent that the school system meet with the vendor, meet with the parents, consider this contract and enter into this contract for the benefit of that school and that board member and that board member's you know, child, that but would you, be inappropriate. But your example presupposes that an individual board member could make Dr. Lotto do something that he doesn't think is in the best interest of students, which we're not able to do. So it, you don't have to make him do it. The request in it of itself is inappropriate. So the, regardless of the action, which I, uh, you know, know that Dr. Lotto would not move forward with that, um, the, the request is, is inappropriate and un unethical. Okay, so how does an advisory opinion, if something you're saying it's, it's so clearly, on, how does an advisory opinion from the board ethics panel, how does that work? How's that gonna, what's the mechanics of that? So is there, is there a request made, <laughs> obviously the, the board member that's making the request is not going to presume that the request is inappropriate. They're gonna make the request to Dr. Alato, then he's going to say what? Sure. I don't think that's quite kosher. Go seek an ethics opinion from the board ethics panel first. I mean, that's a possibility. I don't work with the board ethics panel. I know that board council does, so he might be able to provide more insight on the functions of the board ethics panel, but presumably you would have, you know, you could have a situation where the superintendent is saying, hey, listen, you know, I don't think this is, this is appropriate, you, board members. I mean, you have folks request opinions from the a State Ethics Commission regularly on things that they're, you know, unclear about that may kind of toe the line. So that's not uncommon. Um, have, have you ever seen in your entire tenure with the school system a factual situation occur that would trigger this provision? So I'm not going to comment on that. Okay, well, I'm going to take that to be no, right? Because a board ethics panel, anything that <coughs> coming from the board ethics panel would have to be public, no? Mm -mm. No. Okay, how are those issued? I don't, like I said, I don't work with the board ethics panel. I don't staff them, so I'm not sure how they do, you know, conduct their work and issue opinions and deliberate on those matters. That's not something I'm involved in, so I can't answer that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any further comment, Mr. Brannon? Uh, yeah, I guess our board council's here. If board council, could you illuminate us on how the board ethics panel issues its advice? Mr. Burns. And advisory if, opinions, are they written, are they oral, are they informal, is there any record of them? Copies. 
Mr. Mr. Rand, uh, President Corkadel, Vice President Ellis, members of the board, uh, in response to your question, uh, first, first thing to know is um, in many years of serving in different legal capacities for the school system, uh, I can tell you it's a very small number of matters that have been referred to the ethics panel beyond its yearly review uh, of the disclosure forms and things like that. Um, usually what prompts uh, the panel to be convened and consider a matter is some sort of complaint or a self-request, meaning a member is concerned about something, and this happens in many scenarios in public service, and wants to get an opinion ahead of time to advise them, him or her, what they're going to do. Again, the number of times in this school system for this board and others in the system that have actually invoked the need to go to the ethics panel is a very small number. And have any of those instances been non-financial? Uh, you know, it depends on Meaning how you, if, they've on how you uh, if they've occurred already, they've occurred under BAF. Right. If, if, it, if it's for that reason and also how you define financial, for instance, it may be something at the edge of financial, such as, you know, there's a business and the founding member has an interest in it, although I would never gain from it. They could, you know, and, and they're trying to explore those edges as opposed to direct financial interest. But having said that, um, your first question was what would happen, you know, what would happen, and it is usually a written, I mean, I've never seen it not be a written opinion. And again, I'm talking a couple decades worth of experience. As directly working with the ethics panel over the last several years, it's only been in the annual capacity. There's not been one instance of an ethics panel being convened to determine an ethical issue or an alleged violation. So there hasn't been a recent opinion. In the past, when there was an opinion issued, it was issued to the party or parties who asked for it. Shit. It was cataloged and kept on the record for the ethics panel, and wherever that was at the time. And I believe that if there were not some basis in the law that required withholding whatever it said, it, it may in fact be a public record. So it would be sub subject to public information. Yeah, well, again, unless there was an independent basis, such as, for instance, if it involved personnel matters. And, and you could have something like that. Right. Um, but or, the, the ones you're aware of occurred under the BAF regime. And, and well, <laughs> and the numbering system that existed a long time before that. I mean, BAF is. I, I mean, BAF so, and its predecessors. Yeah, it, it, okay. exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think, and I, I want to answer it accurately here. I'm trying to remember whether any non BAF or its predecessor ethics complaint, per se, that required an opinion from the panel had been asked for in the last 15 years, I, I cannot think of one. Okay, so I just want to make sure everybody's aware that in, in our board council, who has you know knowledge and experience with this, actually did answer, contrary to some of the murmurs up here, that these advisory opinions are public. They're public records. So they're, 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 not, subject they're, to not, any, they're not hidden. Subject to any restriction that might apply to the individual case. Or redaction for a specific issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything further, Mr. Granite, that you wanted to ask? Uh, no. While you have, okay. And uh, Mr. Gilliland and Ms. Hummer. Mr. Thank Gilliland. you, Madam President. I was just going to say very quickly, BAF, you know, people and I, I own a printing company, um, and I've had to recuse myself on votes, not because BAF required that I do, but there were instances when I had some of my suppliers appear on bids. When, when I file my financial disclosure form, I don't have to note my suppliers. I don't have to note my clients. I just have to note my business interests. And then I even note my nonprofit board interests, even though I get no financial benefit from the, the what is it, four boards that I'm on now. Um, obviously, we've not had to vote on nonprofit issues. Um, but having said that, um, I've recused myself on matters that I probably didn't have to, but I, I went above and beyond. And, and I think that's why B2 is here, or which one are we on? Uh, I'm sorry. B1. B, B1, sorry. I, I started wearing glasses three months ago and I already lost them, so. But um, the, uh, that additional restriction, again, I, I just think goes to that next level. And, and that's why I, I, I think it's helpful to have it. Ms. Hummer? Yes, so I just, I will give a personal example that I didn't go to the board ethics panel, but I actually went to board council to see if I needed to go to the board ethics panel. There was an issue coming that had the potential of coming up that involved um, 
board property that is near my community and based on community involvement so as to make sure that I would have accordance. I was advised by council that I would need to, re I should recuse myself. So I didn't take it to the board ethics panel, but that discussion was had. That would have been an executive function. It would not have been in any way financial, but it would have been a conflict. So that was something to check on. During my time on the board, I know of at least one instance where we had a board member who did go to the board ethics panel to get an opinion on a potential conflict of interest that came back before she um, accepted a, a, a work type situation. So there, so there have been ones that have gone in and she came to board leadership and said, this is my issue and I'm going to present it to the board ethics panel and she let them know and then she abided by their advice. Thank you, Ms. Summer. Um, I, I'm going to just weigh in a couple thoughts that I'm thinking of uh, if it may be helpful to the board in deciding their outcome is that, um, you know, I, I got to thinking about what Mr. Grannon said that, well, we're not allowed to do that already for the superintendent. And I thought about that and at first I said, oh, that, that kind of makes sense. But then I got to thinking about the power of the influence, um, which is the same reason why um, when you have a boss and you have an employee that there are certain things of, of assumptions of power that an individual has. We as the oversight as, as all, albeit divided by nine, are equally bosses and I would never want someone, it, for me this is about the transparency to the people, I would never want someone to have an impression that because they will be impressed that you are, you're his boss. So that, that appearance to me would somehow I, I think be better served. I, I've worked with ethics panels and ethics in the past in governments um, in both state and, and county level and I know that the value that even our, our, some of our former councilmen like Mr. Fink and our former county executive had and in, in his executive roles um, have well served to um, make sure that the public knows full well that their board is always operating. Because I look at some of this language and how it's, how it's functionary is to the person who may be observing. In many of the cases, and you weren't here for Mr. Gillen's introductory statements, but um, you know, we had, a, as he mentioned, a series of folks who uh, were compelled to resign for ethical issues that were non-financial in nature um, from the General Assembly. And in some instances, uh, to the best of my knowledge, these came to light um, as a result of public and others. And so from my perspective, this is not about member to member because most ethics things come in from the public. It reduces its, I would think it would be naturally re a reduction if the people knew within, within the more plain language, you know, as opposed to a simple state reference um, to n understand where their representative's boundaries are. So from my perspective, this is about, you know, just making sure that my people know that I'm not being influenced. And so that's where I, I tend to land on, on that side, uh, to err on that side. Um, but I have encountered, and I won't go into it, we're, we're already at 410 and <laughs> we, um, I'm not gonna go into personal examples, but I have personally um, engaged <coughs> ethics panels on that. Um, I've gone through extensive you know, training. Um, but most of the time it, it requires training. And I, I honestly think that that would, resolve a lot of board members too is because usually when you have these you also have training associated to better understand your role as a board member um, and then this stuff is more for the public to understand what it is you're you're under um, which is why I'm never a fan of just referencing out in these in these matters because that is for us internally that is not out in public and um, I have had experience where um, this is before I sat on the board where you know a, a resident was trying to find out about ethics as it related to the school board, and th and that was like a three-day project, um, <laughs> and um, that that that's where the seed was planted for me. Um, I I don't want to reiterate that you were not here at the time. So in, in a lot of these manners as such, I, I'm a, I'm aired to uh, I, I'm tending to err on the side of keep it in when possible. Um, and avoid that in its entirety. Because as I said, I, I've never really encountered a lot of member to member. Usually this is the exterior to the interior, um, that, at least in my experience. Um, Thank you. But I, I know we need to be vigilant about that, of course. Yeah, I would, okay, so I'll withdraw it, but I have others. Um, so I will draw that motion. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so um, I see the writing on the wall there. Um, 
So, but okay. So the, my next one is on the bottom of page two. Um, D one Roman numeral eight. Um, I like the spirit of what Miss Alvey was going for. I do, but I think this is very subjective text. Um, so I move to strike it in its entirety. That's my motion. Anyone want a second? second? Okay. So I got a second. All right. So my, my, my thought around this is what, what specifically are we trying to address here? Um, who decides what the critical issues of governance are? Um, to me, it seems um, where a, a member can decide where if we have a disagreement on what, uh, let, me, let me see here. Like my other motions where a member or members can decide on what is and is not critical when it really just boils down to a disagreement on an issue. So a topic that is critical to Ms. Alvey, for example, might not be critical to Mr. Grannon. A topic that's critical to Ms. Corkadel might not be critical to me, vice versa. Also, what are the definitions of efficient, professional, and businesslike? Our definitions of those might be wildly different. And so I just find this sub text to be rather subjective and therefore impossible to fairly enforce something that could be okay to have in our handbook, but in our policy, I'm, I'm, I'm real worried about the subjectivity of that, critical issues of governance being the, the predominant phrase that, that worries me, because critical to whom? So that's my. Okay, Ms. Antoine? Um, I would request that you please withdraw that one in the absence of Ms. Alvey, who's not here to defend it, and maybe we can discuss it at second read because we're, we're unable to successfully defend it for her that's true and in her that's absence true. okay so y'all be be mindful that this one will come back during second reader i will table it till then um all right moving on yep of course i totally get it um i i thought that i know that she has um schoolwork and whatnot to deal with all right so page three of five d one Roman numeral ten. So second thing, second <coughs> second little paragraph down from the top. So I also move to strike this section as um, as well. So my move is to strike D one ten on page three of five. If anyone wants to second. Great. All right. So what are we? What is the author trying to address here? How are we defining sufficient time, thought, and study? Is an hour sufficient? Is two hours sufficient? What if you're a really quick study and you don't need an hour or two? So what is, um, what is the definition of uh, unethical or unprofessional bi partisan bias? I, I'm not sure what that means either and, and who would be the judge of that? So again, this language to me feels rather subjective and can potentially be misused by current or future board members. And I, I just, I think we should just ex it. That's my thought. A second. Yeah. We have a motion and a second. Yeah, I know. Discussion? Um, okay, I don't see any other discussion. Um, I do believe this was one of the ones submitted, um, Ms. Ms. Schalheim, that you had submitted with, along with yours, with Ms. Oaks. No, this yeah. was not, these were not my words, no. Uh, they no, came, no that came from Ms. Oaks. Oaks. When you had made your request, you said to incorporate Ms. Oaks's as well. Was this uh, Ms. Oaks's words? I, yes. Yes, yes so for the so most I just part, they were her words. Mm -hmm. On that, um, yep. because of the previous email. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't understand how we would define sufficient time, thought, and study, <laughs> so. I'm, okay. I'm in disagreement with that. Okay. No, I just wanted clarification because it, of the previous sure. correspondence that you sure. had provided to sure. us. I don't have any further. I don't see any further questions. Oh, questions. okay. So some of these, yeah, I guess I'm having a little trouble. Maybe it's just my, there's, you know, there's a lot of text here and I'm trying to take it all in. Some of these are your statements that I, I take to be sort of for the good and welfare of the operation of the board. Let's just say, for instance, that it's 
stipulated. There's no debate over it. It's stipulated. Some board member says, I did not give sufficient time, thought, and study to, you know, whatever issue X. What is the consequence of that under this policy? That's what I'm, where, where, where is the, where does the shoe drop after X is invoked? For a violation. That, I mean, that's a question for you, Ms. Ortiz. So that would be something for the board to decide if you have a member that's consistently unprepared. No, not consistently, know, just or, once. I'm just yeah, saying that once. would be for the board to decide. I can't, you know, I, I can't speak for board or board leadership on that. Well, I'm asking what does the, po what does the policy provide for? So this language came, as Ms. Corkadell mentioned, from Ms. Oaks, and the policy committee discussed it, and they decided to include it in the policy. And then, so a shortfall under X, just for example, and again, there's no debate. The person says, you got me. I didn't devote sufficient time, all, all, all that flowery language. Does that then constitute a violation of the policy? Yeah, you're in violation of the policy. I think that may be an instance if you haven't, you know, read the materials before you and you have to vote on something, maybe the person, you know, the person should recuse themselves or abstain from voting if they haven't read the information. So again, that's something that, you know, board leadership or the board as a whole would decide whether there's any action that needs to occur there. Okay, well, may maybe this could be resolved when we get to four, I, I guess, where I'm going, Michelle, it doesn't, it doesn't offend me to have this kind of, you know, general welfare kind of language. What offends me is, I guess, when it gets to 4A, you know, and to me, anything short of what's provided by state law for, um, I don't know if state law provides for anything other than removal of board, does state law provide for anything other than removal of board members? Does it provide for censure or sanction or discipline of any other kind other than removal? So the law doesn't state that, but it's common practice amongst boards and boards of education, other boards and similar entities. No, but does this, does the, does the law Mer doesn't state Does Maryland censure. state law provide for the state board of, I'm not talking oh, about the this state board. board, the state board of education to take any action with regard to a local school entity board member other than removal? That's a good question. Uh, I, actually, uh, I, I think I question. can, it, if the board member would like in our, in our attorney's absence, because well, we did me, have to go, I, I had a briefing. Yeah, if the president that. knows the answer, sure, um, great. So um, there, there's two, pla there's two places which, uh, by which board members are, uh, the board as itself um, has granted itself authority for disciplinary. And the first exists in um, the, the handbook itself. And that is based on parliamentary. So we are required to follow the standard parliamentary procedure. It's in Robert's rules that actually says that if a board member feels aggrieved or it, there is a violation, then at that point they would develop a writ. And on the dais, they would say that I feel that this person, that board member X, did something. And then the board would then vote and depending on what it is, what that action would be. Maybe it's a censure, removal, you know, similar to what the General Assembly does. Um, these are, it, and, all, and most bodies have that, uh, take a variation of it. Now we've been blessed with not having that experience, uh, shy a couple near, near misses um, from time to time uh, uh, overall, but that's already in place. So this is just of, which ones do we want to trigger that? Because those things already ex sort of exist between the parliamentary and the handbook and the, some of the overarching duties and responsibilities that how it's conducted as parliamentary, what takes place, what the onus of the board to self-govern already exists in those overarching. Did I get that right? Yeah, and just to <laughs> add to that, so, <laughs> I think I got that and right. I don't know every opinion <laughs> of the so. state board, but there aren't too many dealing with removal of uh, board members, but there have been, in, so, so while the state board, as far as I'm aware of, has not um, determined whether to censure a, uh, a local board member, they have, however, upheld local board decisions to censure or discipline 
board member, their own board members, or they've kind of recused themselves saying that's the, you know, under the jurisdiction of the local So that's of part education. of the appeal. What, what, right. is, what is in state law is that any decision of the board, and that would include a disciplinary action, let's say, you know, you know, you got upset at Miss Ellis for persistent behavior or maybe just a one-time thing, and, and that's that self-governing of ourself, of course. Um, she does hog the day as uh, up here she with all does stuff, all, Always gosh. talking, nonstop. <laughs> but in that example, my understanding is, and, and, and we can definitely verify this with Mr. Burns, but uh, my understanding is, is at that point, if that motion is made, she has a right to appeal that because she is the subject of the motion, and that appeal would go straight to the State Board of Education because it's a decision that we rendered, unlike the superintendent rendering. Um, and so the other option, of course, is for the board to say, we're, we're not sure we like this, let's go take it to the ethics panel, and that is where that brings value, because you could ask the ethics panel, is this something in line, and then may it render the decision. So the ethics panel can be uh, utilized sometimes as a neutral body to minimize those concerns of member to member that are sometimes. But that is just, I, I don't know specific references. I'm going off of what my understanding and explanation then, has Then my last statement then, because I was asking questions and then uh, Ms. Mm -hmm. Ortiz deferred to you and I appreciate that, Madam President, is uh, with all due respect to Ms. Oaks and you know, kind of where the spirit with this is coming from, I think especially as the board is moving to a fully elected body, we should actually be moving away from these things where board members can have different tools to vote <coughs> writs against each other. Would this be a writ uh, for a violation of D1AX for you know one board member saying that they, they, the other one was quote swayed? That's a, that's a very loose term. Swayed by unprofessional partisan bias. The board members are going to be directly accountable to voters in a way that appointees were accountable in the sense that there was, you know, there was a retention vote, but there's going to be an actual direct election of board members and they won't be reelected or there'll be other actions that can be taken. I, I think it's a bad idea to encourage board members to be voting out writs against one another. So for that reason, I'm going to be supporting uh, with my vote uh, Ms. Schallheim's amendment to take this out. I just think it's too, it's too vague and it leaves too much room for mischief. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Granin. Um, Ms. Ellis and Ms. Shalhar. Thank you. Um, so I'm a little torn here because I, while I share all of the concerns, I'm not so uncomfortable with much of it to let it float through the first reader for public comment. But what I, the, the thing I'm having trouble with is the logic that from beginning to end where it's, uh, it's saying, devote sufficient time, thought, and study to proposed actions of the board in order to base decisions upon the facts, vote with honest con conviction, and not be swayed by unethical or unprofessional partisan bias of any kind. How does devoting sufficient time, thought, and study prevent you from being swayed by unethical or That's unprofessional partisan To me, those are unrelated. If the sentence uh, ended with base, base, uh, do these things in order to base decisions upon the facts and vote with honest conviction, period, I would be, I would be comfortable with that language, at least for now, to float it through and, and get public input because to me, it would be hard to censure a board member on this, it's just sort of expressing a commitment of the board members to be prepared. Um, you, you can't make claims on how much time I spend at home reading through my packet, but um, so that for that reason, I'm, I'm not super uncomfortable with this except for the end of it. It, it doesn't follow to me. I, I don't know how that, how being prepared is what prevents you from being swayed and being unethical. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Ms. Shaw. Um, I noticed that we're without counsel for I guess for the rest of the meeting, and I'm really, really uncomfortable um, making decisions like this without his um, without his presence, because my next one was going to be about 
four A, and I was going to ask him a bunch of questions. Now I can't do that, so now I can't go through the rest of these. Would you be in favor so of tabling this? I think the full board? I think I'm going to table all the rest of my ones, and I, we we scampered down this rabbit hole before, where we had a meeting, part of a meeting, and and we didn't have his presence here, and and that didn't, didn't turn out to be a good thing, if I recall. And so, um, you know, I I just think that we. I'm going to table the rest of my. I'm going to table this amendment, this motion, and the rest of my proposed amendments until next time. But my, I have, a, go out to the I have public. a, I have a. Yes, I was just going to ask that. Are we going to? We're going to see this with the definition before it goes to public, out for public comment. Surely, right? When Darren was still here and we voted to, to define improper influence, because I, I think that we should definitely see it again before it goes out for public comment because we would, would need to we would we would want to see what that definition would be okay, so so um, we have a little bit of parliamentary we want uh, I want to get cleaned up here so that yeah we're sure in good, so you're in good shape to be right. able to proceed next time and hold is actually a motion um, imposed on that and we can draw that with consensus but um, the once a motion has been made and seconded, it becomes the board's motion. And so the board has to agree to hold it just like they agreed to, to second it, um, believe it or not. So really, if we, we tabled, have consensus. We tabled another one with well, that well, yes, with consensus. So I'm just asking for consensus for the hold so we can go on yeah, to I the wanna, rest of your conversation about the other stuff. Yeah, I want to table this. Okay. Any Any opposition? Just, okay. just, just uh -huh. to hold the motion that we're on the table. Yes. That is correct. That that that's why I'm saying that because we have to be clear outwardly too. Right, and um, then I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until the next time we see this to okay. do all my other motions. Okay. Because there's sound more. sounds good. Um, so we are now back on to the main uh, policy itself, and so Mr. Um, I'm sorry. Before I take you, I I apologize. I had I had removed Miss Antoine's. Um, Oh, thank you very much. So, <laughs> um, let me reiterate that. I had removed Miss Antoine from the thing because we were on motions, but it went Miss Antoine and Mr. Live before we went into amendments. So, Miss Antoine, please. Well, I and didn't then get Mr. Live. My question Leib. answered about whether or not we're going to see this again. Oh, I, I, um, my apologies. Um, so, um, based on your policy setting policy, I have to have this up and posted within a certain time frame, so I can't. So if this is going on second reading, I don't know that I'd be able to have, do the um, appropriate, adequate research to ensure that I come up with a legally sufficient definition to improper influence. Um, it, and would then, it, you know, uh, Okay, so the would the board be okay, if what I'm hearing correct, is that we, in, until we get that actual language that a placeholder with the phrase of what we are going to define yeah, with a um, with bracket brackets um, I believe or however it would be annotated because um, we do have a policy on policy we just passed that um, has a time frame and that was a, that was part of our own will of board of amendment as a matter of fact so if um, we're asking her a fresh request, and it, it appears that she does not have enough information to ascertain if she can make the deadline that's in our policy. So, I, I that's my suggestion is that we consider having the placeholder um, because the more public time, the better, obviously. And if we need to extend, I guess we can extend, obviously. We have multiple readers, we're still in the first reader here. Um, uh, but I don't know if we need a. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, Ms. Schalheim, I that is, I believe, the answer to your question. So um, you're going to put it. You're going to um, put it in with a, with a placeholder. Yeah, I can put a placeholder that I mean, has a statement saying, you know, to be yeah. defined on second reading, and then I can. You know, yeah, I can put that in there, okay. like in red so or maybe not. Well, it's in all in red, some, right? Maybe in blue or something. <laughs> I mean, for the for the colorblind amongst us, that 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 because that will allow you then to because if you see it beforehand.
it's not like you can vote on it via email. So then that would just allow you to see the definition on second, my proposed okay. definition on second okay. reading, All right. and then you can That's vote fine. on it, tweak it, discard, you know, however you would like to handle it. But at okay. least we would have. Okay. That works, thank you. Yep. Okay, I have Ms. Antoine, Mr. Leib, and then Mr. Gran and Ms. Antoine. So we're back. We're back to the entire policy, right? Yep. Uh, yes. So I, I would like to make a motion that f from this point we table all of our recommended amendments until second reader. Um, for so so that's basically the. I, I want to explain it, but I'll make the motion first. I'll second. has to do with directly with your motion uh, Ms. Antoine because I think I'm agreeing with what you're saying but I want this thing that will be in violation of our own policy the clock for public comment doesn't start until we really post it yeah. for first reading so right. we could just as easily table this entire thing until the next meeting when we have a full board sure. and we have our council and then the public has even more time to comment on it rather than sure. putting something out there piecemeal that says oh TBD definition of improper influence that's kind of a big deal and we have a board member who's sitting with another five or six amendments that is intending to, you know, seek to change it even further. That would give the public even less time to comment on it. So I, if I actually make a friendly amendment now that I'm thinking about it, I make a friendly amendment that we, to Ms. Uh, Ms. Entwine's motion, that way um, Ms. Alvey's here to defend her piece, exactly. the council's here to answer any questions, and the thing that goes out to the public is something that actually has the buy-in of the entire board, which this does not. So I, I move that we table it for the next meeting, and then we're fully consistent with our policy, and we're giving the public even more time to comment. I accept that friendly amendment. Woohoo! Thank you. <laughs> That's the one we should. Okay. Oh, right uh, back at you next time. So we have an am amend amendment as so amended and, and second. Can we reread that? Because um, th there was a little bit of dialogue in, in between them. So you want me to restate? Cool. Yeah. Okay. okay. So m I motion that we table the discussion on uh, item number 7.04 until the next public board meeting. Okay. Um, second, if it needs a second. Second. Okay. Um, well, uh, we can. So I don't think we need a motion to close an item if nobody else is commenting. Um, but uh, I, I just want to make that clear that I, I think we may have gotten a little too far into the semantics. But I, I'm, I, I understand the intent and the intent of the friendly amendment. I'll just point out that myself personally, I don't think that it's necessary because we do have still two more readers with uh, lots of time. And our new policy on policy triggers that any time a new amendment comes in, whether it's in the second reader or even in the third, that that additional time for public comment comes in. So I don't know that we need to sidestep anything in order to still achieve the utmost of transparency I, I, um, with the idea that, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, so I if, would if vote this, against it because it, it doesn't seem to. If this to had cause some real timeliness, like our budget, and it is, and it's there's a window, a cycle. We have, realistically, I'm getting vibes, and we have to make good decisions. We are prolonging this, and this can go even longer. If I introduce mine, we will be here a while, and I'm not even amending what we had consensus on because these are. This is information since I've studied more and more of the law that I wanted to introduce. I, I need to be able to introduce that with the full attention of the board and of staff. So, so what I believe we should do is give it that time, and we can do that with, at the next meeting. So uh, first oh, wait, well, what I, I guess what I was saying is I just didn't think it needed to be a motion because there, everything's already in place for it to occur. And we have the decision of when to close out an item. And yeah. if we're closing out an item, then at that point, it, it will reappear next time so, instead of the 30 days. And that's But we're doing two fine. different mm -hmm. actions, though. We're tabling it to, so we're basically on first reader next time, and we're closing. OK. Um, but so, so your motion, then, is to 
ta table it. Okay. Because that's an exception of policy. So do you, would you like but to add language to but create that? But it isn't. And without the, uh, in my interpretation of the policy, we're not, we're not violating that policy by tabling it and discussing it and bringing it back. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to request a st immediate stand at ease so that I can seek out the actual policy and spend a couple minutes to um, with other attorneys in the room before we proceed um, so that we are not so so, so um, could we yeah. request no, though instead of standing at ease we move to the other portions of the agenda um, I'm, you know th this is on the table so Do you want me to go get her? She can hear in the back. Um, I, I will just say the only thing we do have to do is a simple table. Um, if we do anything else, it gets a little weird. By simple table motion, by, by just saying the word, let's table this, it will freeze it as, and, and re, re, sustain it as a first reader. So yeah, that is the only that. motion that would need to be made. So if you're open to the friendly amendment to limit your motion to just say I move to table item 7.04 um, that will address <coughs> the continuation of the first reader and all of the intent that you had you and Mr. Grannon had both espoused if you're open to that. So if I, if I restate it incorrectly correct me please. Mm -hmm. so, so I motion that we table Item number 7.04. Second. Second. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Are there any comments to the motion? I, I know we have a couple lights on others. Uh, yes, we do. Okay. Mr. Lyde? Yes, my inclination is to support the motion. However, it's a suggestion uh, and in order to uh, contribute to an efficient disposition of this matter at our next meeting, I respectfully request that those having amendments and they're already prepared, share them with their fellow board members and thereby have an understanding of where our fellow board members are coming from and what their intentions are prior to the meeting. Thank you. Uh, are, is that an, an amendment to the table? No. Oh, just a recommendation? <laughs> okay. Because I was going to accept that. <laughs> can, we, can we table by acclamation? We can, but a couple people want to make comments, so um, I, I'm good by affirmation on that, um, uh, by unanimous, yeah, uh, by unanimous consent. Um, so, um, but I, I will just say um, that I do concur with Mr. Live when, and, and we have even several times today talked about needing to have information in front of us to be well prepared. And so I would echo in, as an encouragement as your president um, that it always benefits the whole board when there's an opportunity to do that. Um, that stated, are you, Mr. Dillon? Yes, thank you, Madam President. I, again, I, I, I support perhaps the intent here. I'll just throw out the caveat. There's no way in hell I'm going to be talking about this at a night meeting. 
because yeah. I mean we're already at this approaching the seven hour mark um, after 90 minutes of a closed session and last meeting we were here until almost 2 a.m. and if the six and seven hours is the new norm on something like this in an evening meeting when we're likely going to have a lot of public comment um, I, I just heard reference earlier today it looks like we're going to have some hot button issues on the agenda um, for a night meeting it, and if, if this is going to take so I would I would just prefer if, if we could stipulate that it would be a day meeting that yeah, we would talk about something like this I agree. so uh, mr. Gillen is proposing an amendment to amend the existing motion um, to table to um, define it to be at the uh, April daytime meeting yes do we have second? Second. Yeah, second. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, Ms. Howe, we are voting on Mr. Gilliland's amendment to the original motion to table to April the 3rd or 1st. Sorry. Unless we, we have it by acclamation, it sounds like. Um, do we, are we good on that? Do we need to vote on that? April. We, Everyone's April. in support. Yep. Okay. okay, great. And April. so, done deal. Um, and so the motion to table, um, let, let's do this proper. Are we in consensus? We're in yes. consensus. Okay. Yes. Okay. Item 7.04 is officially closed. Item 7.05, Ms. Ortiz, I believe you're already in your seat. I hit jury duty also. All right. So um, I don't have any bills for the, um, that require a board vote. However, there's a lot of legislation before you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions on these bills or any other bills that you may be interested in. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We have um, several um, comments. We have Ms. Ellis, Ms. Schalheim, Ms. Hummer, and Ms. Antoine in that order. Ms. Ellis. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Um, just to make sure we have the latest, most up-to-date information, do you have anything to share with us about the HB 1300? Um, uh, yeah, so the uh, Blueprint for Maryland's Future or the Kerwin Commission Bill. So um, I've attended a few uh, work group or subcommittee meetings to review the legislation and um, amend it, and we actually um, assisted uh, Mabe and Pazam, so that's the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, Public School Superintendents Association of Maryland, and the 24 CFOs um, in drafting amendments to address the concerns that we um, raised in our testimony because we supported it uh, with amendments because we did have sp some specific concerns surrounding the pre K management and um, some, you know, funding aspects of it and some implementation dates and reporting requirements and things of that nature. So um, Matt Stansky, uh, my colleague, really took the lead on putting together and working with other colleagues and, and identifying amendments and, you know, then Maeve kind of pulled that all together and we presented them to the committee. So the good news is that they accepted a handful of our amendments, uh, six pages worth, but they really didn't accept a whole lot. The pre-K is a bit of an issue with the private providers and the management and the cost and that sort of thing. And so there have been some amendments incorporated into the bill. They did address some of our concerns dealing with, you know, funding allocations and some reporting requirements. Um, it just was voted out of the Appropriations Committee with amendments. The chairs also had amendments and there were several technical amendments as well uh, today. And so I'm not sure if the Ways and Means Committee have, has taken up the bill. And so the thought is that they will move the House bill and um, get that over to the Senate, and the Senate will for sure have additional amendments. And so we'll definitely have a lot of work to do in the Senate to address some of our continued um, concerns. And so, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this here previously, but the expectation is that the governor will veto the bill. And so the legislature has to have it before the governor by a certain date in the session for him to veto it and give them enough time to override it. Um, so it's moving quickly. I know that the Senate is, you know, they're fully aware of all the amendments in the House and, you know, stakeholder amendments and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, it's moving. It's moving along. And, and there have been several late nights in, in meetings and in, in reviewing it. 
So thank thank you for that. Um, so I I sat with you and Ms. Hummer at the at the May Legislative Committee. Yes, so update. you saw so all of those amendments. I did, yes, I did, yes. and so um, some of them are extremely concerning to me that um, so far they have not been incorporated, yes. and um, so I, I'm gonna. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm trying to get a feel for what we can do about this um, because I'm, as a board member, not comfortable supporting where this is heading right now without, I mean, some of these to me are deal breakers as far as the success of this bill. And um, so you're saying I, from what I'm reading and from what I'm hearing from you, as well as Mabe, um, this is moving quite quickly. Yes. Okay. So um, I have a need um, uh, to speak a bit about it. Um, first, it's important to note that I firmly believe that education reform is needed. Our students, every student, deserves the best education possible. The blueprint created by the Kerwin Commission was developed after years of work. I believe several good recommendations have come from that work, and though I do have concerns about some of the models that were used to inform their work, um, there's definitely some real, I believe, improvements um, to be found in, in their recommendations. Um, when this board voted on uh, several weeks ago on our legislative position, I stated that I was cautiously voting to support the blueprint legislation, but would have to look carefully at it once it was released. Um, we now have a 188 page bill that is in need of many, many amendments before it is what our students need it to be. I would, I would support, I would vote to support um, with amendments as we did, but a few evenings ago on February 27th, over 60 amendments were introduced to the Education and Economic Development Subcommittee. Amendments were speedily read through without the ability for subcommittee members to carefully consider them. And when they, the subcommittee who had to consider these amendments asked for a written copy of these amendments, they were told they would not receive them until hours before they were to vote. Um, combing through 180, and also if, uh, I believe the way they received it was the amended bill. In other words, were they able to see? Yeah, and so yes, I how was there. it was amended. I was there that okay. late night, and um, it was a bit frustrating for everybody, not just the members of the subcommittee, because um, you're correct, there was nothing in writing, and staff went through everything very quickly. So we were all very furiously writing, and then a bunch of us got together until about nine o'clock that night to kind of compile our notes and put together an initial draft. However. Um, leadership did provide, so that was a thir last Thursday night on Friday, um, a summary of all of the amendments and written form to all of the subcommittee members, stakeholders received copies of them, and then um, over the weekend they provided what it's called a reprint, and so basically mm -hmm. the Department of Legislative Services kind of incorporates all of the amendments so that you have a visual and kind of like how we use track changes it, it does the same thing right it shows where okay. where there are amendments so members did receive that over the weekend I was able to also garner a super secret copy and um, so then they reviewed them again on Monday evening I was there again late and they went through and staff explained more in detail with the actual reprint there and actual copies of the amendments in front of them and went through everything in greater detail. Uh, yesterday there was another meeting where the subcommittees met to again discuss, review, offer amendments and you know several subcommittee members on Monday evening and then yesterday also had amendments. Um, and then today, the appropriations, so it's duly assigned in the House and the Senate. So the Appropriations Committee, which is the, the Budget Committee, and the Ways and Means Committee, which is the Education Policy Committee, both have it assigned. And my understanding is that the Appropriations Committee voted it out today. Um, I haven't had, I haven't gotten, I may have, I don't know, I don't have my, I haven't don't have my phone to see my email, but um, I may have a copy of the 
of the latest reprint with the incorporated amendments. But once it goes out of the committee, then that stuff you know, is all available online with all of the amendments. It's expected to go uh, to the full house by the end of the week for a discussion. And my, you know, I expect that there will be long conversation and floor debates on the legislation. Right, thank you. So um, I personally, and I, I, I know many share these thoughts, I have concerns about what was in the original bill and what is now in the amended bill. Um, and I'll give some examples. While we should all be in favor of access for all families to quality pre-K, this bill will astronomically drive up the cost of, of pre-K, um, the way it's being, um, the way it's written right now. So in other words, pre-kindergarten is, is a, a system that has not been broken in a lot of regards. The, the, problem, the problem with the pre-K system is access for people who don't currently have access, who can't afford it. But what we're gonna do is, uh, the way I see it playing out as it's currently written is gonna be like colleges where it drives up the cost basically of pre-K for everyone um, and becomes a huge financial burden on the entire state. Um, and so um, as, our, as our state struggles with determining how to fund the state portion of the new funding formula, there will also be a huge price tag for our local governments, leading to increasing both state and local taxes in order to comply with mandates created by this bill. Um, one of the smartest people I know, without a doubt, even pointed out to me language in the bill that will lead to a miscalculation of the local funding mandated by the bill as it's written right now. And this has been pointed out um, to uh, at least one legislator and it's, it still has not um, made its way into being corrected in the bill itself. Um, there, again, there's some great things in this bill um, certainly uh, the requirement to pay our teachers as the master's educated professionals that they are. Yet I do not know any other profession where a master's educated professional is micromanaged to the degree that teachers are. The blueprint should be creating a new model that cuts down on the bureaucracy, but the reporting and the accountability piece will only serve to inflate central offices even more. Um, this is a huge concern for me. Um, I, I, again, I, I have to point out the good and the bad. I, I think, you know, the, um, the focus on college and career readiness is really, really big, but um, there's some other things in that bill that I, I, I just don't think they have it right yet. Um, and so um, just to um, point out a couple of things, the U.S. is among the top uh, one of the top nations in the world when it comes to per pupil spending, yet we are nowhere near the top in math and reading scores. Maryland is among the top in, uh, in the nation on pu per pupil spending. So the point here is we cannot just spend our way to the top. We must look at what we should do away with, do differently than what has not worked for our students. The blueprint should tell us more about what to do instead of and not just in addition to. I greatly fear the long-term impact of passing this bill before it's ready. Um, there's just too much that needs to be addressed. Therefore, I, I, I'm very, very antsy about how this is being done in haste. I would like to ask my fellow board members uh, to reopen the vote on our legislative position now that we know what was in the bill, which is what I stated when we, are, when we voted last time. We didn't know what was in the bill. Now we do. I would like a fair chance to to vote on the bill as I as we now know it to be. We owe it to our students to carefully consider this very important legislation impacting the future of our community and to urge our state lawmakers to please get this right. Uh, another th thing I have to point out is Anne Arundel County, which we have an obligation to uh, to look out for. Um, is really losing out on the transition funding. Um, some, some counties, I believe, are gonna get some support there and we're not. Um, 
So I, I'm not asking uh, my fellow board members to uh, vote any particular way on the legislation itself. We all make our own informed decisions, but I want the opportunity to vote on it again, as I had stated weeks ago. Now. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So we had general comments. So I'm going to clear the general comments for the motion itself and take um, statements and debate on it. Um, so, okay, here we go. Ms. Antwine, Ms. Mr. Granin, and Ms. Schalheim. Ms. Antwine. So the, the motion is to, I think our position was in support before? With amendments. With amendments. Yes. Lots and amendments. now that we've had some scrubbing time and some studying time and some real life time, we want to go in opposing all together. Not we. I'm saying, uh, you know, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting to other board members. Y you all have to reflect on that on your own. But um, I think all board members should have an opportunity to take a position on this now that we know what is in the bill. Um, so that's so, so that's what I'm asking. So, yep. so, so what I would like to offer to you is because I had a set that I, I had shared with Jeanette that I would get to her as well, is that if we do do this, that we we present our our conditions or or whatever uh, to to Ms. Ortiz uh, for consideration, since it's going to be a position of the entire board. So, if I can quickly, so. So we supported with amendments because if, you know, as John Willems with Maeve says often, if you want a seat at the table, you can't oppose with amendments. So if you want folks to take you in. So we've, as I mentioned previously, worked with Maeve, Pazam, and other stakeholders to come up with six pages of amendments, table, table format of amendments. And so that has already been presented. The, the bill hearings, bill hearing was on President's Day. Ms. Hummer and I spent the day downtown Annapolis um, at a six plus hour hearing. And so it, our position's already been made in, in public and obviously the board can you know change that position. And the only reason why I would caution it is because we've, it's already been very public. We have our written testimony. The written testimony goes over a list of things that we had issues with. And so what we did as staff here and with our colleagues is to really go in through the bill, fine tooth comb and identify like the very, I mean, very specific amendments to address the general concerns that were raised in our testimony. And so I think, you know, it would be, it's helpful to be able to support with the amendments and have the whole slew of amendments and, and continue to work with, you know, the members of the House and then in the Senate. Um, we've already been talking to, and when I say we, I say, you know, it's AACPS and Mabe and Pazam and other school systems have already reached out to members in the Senate. They understand, you know, especially Ms. Ellis mentioned the pre-K, pre that's a big concern of ours as well. And so they're fully aware of the concerns that we've raised. And so having that support with amendments allows us to continue to engage them and present all the, the myriad of amendments that we've provided, both technical and substantive, to address um, our concerns. So then your your professional recommendation is that we not oppose but s s re um, restate our amendments, support with additional amendments. So I will not tell you how to vote. I, I will I, say that having that support with amendments gives us the ability to continue to work with leadership the Speaker of the House on this and subject. the Senate President and the chairs of the committees on our concerns, whereas typically when you just oppose a bill, they kind of leave you out of the conversation. Understood. And I've been able to be involved in those conversations currently um, because we supported with amendments, gave them a general idea of our issues, and then went back and provided very yeah. specific things. And we, you know, we feel more confident that the Senate will take up several, if not many, of our, our concerns. Thank you. So MSCA is kind of in the same boat as well. So Ms. Ellis, would you be willing to amend the motion on the table to, rather than completely oppose, to support with amendments? Yes, it will. Where are you? Are there? Oh, 
Uh, since what, the question was asked of me, I'm not. I'm. I'm asking to reopen the vote. I'm not asking for a particular vote. Um, I, I, I can tell you this, that um, to me, for sure, there are amendments that should absolutely be deal breakers, many of them. They are about to vote, before we meet again, the House will likely have voted right, on this bill. Right. Our time and is running out. they have already received, heard our amendments, considered them, and they have not made it into the bill. And I would also add, uh, well, I've, I, I've, um, I don't want to sound weird. I love uh, Mr. Willems. He is, he is such, um, he, um, he is so good Very at, mm -hmm. at explaining things and educating and, and helping us make informed decisions. Um, and I know he says that all the time. Um, support with amendments keeps you at the table, but I believe, and I can't remember what the issue was, but it was just at our meeting before last, there was a particular bill that he said, I don't really think that applies in this case. I think we can oppose this and they would be, um, still be listening to us. And I have to say, Anne Arundel County did support with amendments and that was publicly known. I would be very surprised if we changed our position that our legislators would not be interested in our input. Um, so I, that for me is not, that does not worry me. Okay. And I also know Ms. Ortiz has amazing relationships and will continue to work closely with her colleagues if for some reason we did not have a seat at the table um, that those concerns would still be heard. So um, I, I'm just giving you, um, you know, my own personal thought process. Um, but again, I, um, I would like the opportunity to vote on this because we voted on something we didn't know what it was before. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. My confusion comes in. How do we get our new points, now that we have new information, back to legislation? I mean, so they've already accepted written and verbal testimony at the hearing on the 17th. Um, I suppose we could, you know, tell people that we now oppose it. Again, my concern with that is, well, Anne Arundel was left out of the transition grants, and I'm definitely not a budget expert, so somebody stop me if I'm saying things incorrectly. But that was um, the, the school systems that received that funding were already receiving. It's to make up for funding that they were no longer receiving, that they're receiving under current law, and Anne Arundel n never had um, a stake in that funding. However, there's other pieces of the bill where they did make up for some funding for Anne Arundel County. And so like Mr. Shaknovich and Mr. Skansky have been, you know, have reviewed all of those things. Um, we're actually, as far as funding, uh, in very good shape compared to most school systems. I don't think, you know, assuming that we flat, the county flat funds us for the next, I think, seven, for seven years, there would be no increase in, in the funding that the that the county would have to provide to meet the requirements under Kerwin. I think that kicks in in year eight. It could be year seven, either year seven or year eight. Um, so, you know, they did help us out in other um, in other areas um, in dealing with local funding shares and things of that nature to kind of make up for other things. So, I would just say that. Okay. Thank you. And I, uh, Ms. Antoine, you done? Okay. Yes. Okay. I have Ms. Schalheim, Ms. Hummer, um, and then, um, and then Ms. Yeah, Eric is next. Yeah. So wasn't. And I, well, Ms. Antoine already went. So Ms. Schalheim, okay. Ms. Hummer, and then um, Mr. Grannon, and then and Mr. Gilland. So. Oh, Mr. Mr. Lib closed out. Yeah. Okay. Are, so they went through this speedy process and amendments, 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 and now it's going to be debated on that on the floor. Can um, can more amendments be included then? 
Yes, and so even in the committees, they debate and amendments are presented kind of like, you know, here on first and second reading. So similar to how we do things, um, the legislature also has three readings of legislation. The first reading is when it's initially introduced before it has all of the bill hearings. So what happens is when it receives a favorable committee report, in this instance it would be a favorable committee report with amendments, with lots of amendments, that goes before the, um, the full house in this case and the, um, the, the individual, the leader, the floor leader for that bill would kind of go through all of the amendments and so um, things are amended on second reading. Typically you have to suspend the rules to it on third reading but it can still be amended on third reading. So yes, absolutely the bill can still be amended on the floor and so what my colleagues and I have been doing is you know reaching out to uh, legislators on the House to see if we can get more amendments on the floor of the House and also already proactively reaching out to the Senate uh, leadership and members of the Senate committees which is um, budget and taxation and education, health and environmental affairs to kind of, they already know what our concerns are. They've had that list um, for over a week and now. So I'm still, I'm still picking through the original is the original with all the amendments up on a website now too, or not yet? But I didn't if think it so. Gets I was voted out of looking. the um, once it gets voted out of the committee, committee and it's it on the floor on second reading. When you click on the link, then it'll, it'll go to the show amendment. it with all the interlineated um, amendments, and okay. also there will be a separate document on the bill page that kind of shows all the technical amendments that were done. Okay, and the, still the most egregious ones to us are the money coming to us for us to then manage private preschools, right? That was a big one, so right? I think, yeah, just the whole pre-K management piece yeah. of it is a big deal and also like engaging 30, you know, a certain percentage of providers um, and changing that more, you know, to students. And I know for small counties, that's a whole other issue because they may not have private and providers. what do you, how do you, I mean, I can't, I, most preschools, at least in my experience, have some sort of religious component. Like, there's a really popular preschool at my synagogue. There's preschools at lots of churches. Like, it's just then we're we're managing religious inst institutions and kind of going into this area where they might want things a certain way because of the religious component and then we're public education which thankfully doesn't is devoid of that it should be for unless it's for you know educational purposes the religious stuff so i i worry i worry a lot about that if you so all the private all providers about that, right? would have to meet particular guidelines of state requirements in order to be got it eligible okay to be providers. And they would they would address that cuz i see this so, as like the gateway drug to public money is going to private So schooling. one of the things that they've talked about is, you know, applying um, our disciplinary practices are, are that school, public schools have to abide by, um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking here, the um, non-discrimination and all of those things that public schools currently are bound by would also apply to private providers. So they definitely would have to meet um, yeah. state requirements. Okay, and then the other thing I saw that kind of was troubling me so I was going through it and it's like okay so you're gonna have this reporting arm looking that's this this group of experts looking at CTE and this group of experts looking at this and this group of experts looking at that I maybe it maybe it escaped me it's a big bill and I'm still feel like I'm wading through it you know more like floundering through it there isn't any money to set up those things there, yes, there is. Or oh, there is. I haven't yeah, they that provided yet. for. So okay. um, there's a lot of accountability. I know that there's was referenced that earlier, up, but um, that was you know accountability is big for the governor and yes. ensuring that we're not just throwing money at schools and school systems and making sure that they're being held accountable. So there's a lot, lots of accountability in the bill. Um, but yes, they do provide for sort of um, the what we call the AIB, the Accountability Implementation Board, would have 15 staff. And you know the members of the board to be For able each to of help the implement individual CTE and this and that and the other. No, so the CTE committee is separate, but they all have different funding. But those are aspects. all okay. Okay, yeah. so all right, that's that's good because that was a troubling thing when I. And staffing, some things would fall under the AIB, some would 
fall under MSCE currently. So, so what is our what is is does it feel like we have um, the ear of enough folks to get more through as amendments on the floor? I believe we have. That we won't. I don't know about on the floor, but I do believe that we will get more amendments in the Senate. Okay. Be it's okay. a large. Um, there are lots of stakeholders um, okay. that are in agreement of many amendments. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was yeah. all I had for now. Thank you, Ms. Schalheim. We have Ms. Hummer, followed by Mr. Grannon, then Mr. Gilliland, then Ms. Ellis again. Ms. Hummer. So, as I think many people know, I have been very closely involved in this from the beginning, working with Ms. Ortiz, working with May, meeting with legislatures. I share many, if not all, of the same concerns that Ms. Ellis raised. There are some significant things in this that concern us, especially around pre-K, but also the accountability board. I think we, no one is opposing accountability, but we want it, we don't want it to be duplicative of things that we're already doing, but also um, we don't want it to be sucking so much money out that is not going to children. So I have, um, Mabe, Pazam, MSEA, um, and many of the local school systems have all been meeting together extensively. They've combined and worked with their amendments. They've pre been presenting it to individual members, to the committees. There were some significant ones um, that were included in the original House ones. We're still working. I already have scheduled with some MABE leadership meeting with committee chairman next week to go over our amendments, try and push these through. We feel um, that we are gonna be able to get some things through. Having done this very closely, on behalf of our school system and MABE for a number of years, we will lose a great deal of, inf of influence if we oppose this bill. Um, it just, it will, they will see us as not willing to work. It's the support with amendments that gives us the power. We need to be able to come in and really make the case and have that. Um, Jeanette is, if not the most, one, one, is one of the most, if not the most respected legislative person from a school system in the state. She has the, the ear of the Speaker of the House. She has the ear of, she's been working for decades now with many of the people and has relationships if there's anyone that's going to try to influence. So I believe we've got to continue to support this with amendments and making all of our efforts. Um, as I said, next week, my schedule is filled up. I'm, I have already have things scheduled and I know Jeanette will be doing the same. Um, there are some good things in this bill. There are some very concerning things in this bill. Some version of this bill is going to pass. We need to have a voice at the table to get it as good as it can be for us. And what we've also heard again and again from people is, this isn't the end. Okay. I think they're seeing that this is an imperfect bill. We're gonna try to make it more perfect this year, but in the coming years, there will be fixes and changes. And we wanna, again, be on the table and be on the record that we already brought those concerns. So if in future sessions, we can come back and say, as we told you, this is a concern for us. So I've got to, I cannot reiterate strongly enough that we need to continue to support with amendments so that we have influence in how this bill turns out. Thank you, Ms. Hunter, Mr. Grannon, Mr. Gilliland, and then Ms. Ellis. Mr. Grannon. Okay, I just thought that I uh, seconded or voted to support the idea of reopening uh, for Ms. Ellis as I would for any member up here, regardless of what their views were just in deference to a colleague who wanted to express views on this. So I want that to be clear. Then I have a couple of technical questions. Um, how much time is left for further amendments to be advocated for by you as informed by our prior amendments to you? So I think it's day 33, uh, or we have 30, not day 33, we have about 34, 33 days left in the session. And I wanna say that they have to get the bill to the governor like with at least seven days, give or take, um, in order for him to act or not act. So we have um, just under a month to be able to continue to work. So we, w we would convene again before it, it, it's, well. its passage. Yeah, so we'll pass out of the House in some form and I think House leadership is aware that it's not in the most, in the most perfect or in the best form and they fully understand that it will be further amended in the Senate, absolutely. So while it'll pass one chamber, it has to pass both chambers in the identical format, and the ident identical form in order for it to then go to the governor. So yeah, we still have 
we still have time. Will we have will we have an opportunity to vote on the bill that comes out of the House before it goes to the Senate? So as a, the board yeah. like to revisit it? Yes, because if we choose to. Yes, if you choose to absolutely. Um it should work I'm expecting it to go by by no later than Friday. Um, and then it would be voted out, and so then for the next board meeting, we would have the version that's what is being presented to the Senate, understanding that the Senate will definitely amend it further. Based on your work with the legislators, um, I guess this is a two-part question, what impact would it have on the delegation that represents Anne Arundel County if, just for example, something were to pass today that said we actually opposed the current bill absent amendments as opposed to supporting with amendments signaling we're actually changing our position or we actually oppose it absent the amendments that we're seeking yeah so i think that's tricky because literally nobody opposed the bill there was no opposition testimony so certainly that would draw attention um to our opposition i think that it would be difficult I think it would put us in a, in a difficult situation because there are things that we clearly like in the bill, and it's been this is three years, right? Well, so none those, of are, this those stuff wouldn't is change. Good. Obviously, they'd care about whatever the delta is. Right, and so then it would be kind of odd to just oppose it based on things that we haven't gotten if we do support so many of the things in there. So you know, I can't speak for our delegation. I think you know they would have lots of questions. I think it would put us in a difficult spot with leadership, you know, I'm not sure that I'd be able to reach, you know, or I would be listened to, right? I can always reach out to folks. I'm not sure that. But it would certainly it would certainly emphasize the amendments that that this board is endorsed. It if, could if, if every other board is supported. You sure, it it could. A any other questions, Mr. Miller? No, I think that's it. Okay, Mr. Gillilan. Thank you, Madam President. I, um, I guess there, there are a couple of things that I, I, I would just offer uh, to my colleagues. And again, I want to so underscore the fact, you know, we're at the seven hour, 20 minute mark um, and, and the hour is getting late. I, I was on the Ways and Means Committee. I was on the Education Subcommittee on Ways and Means. And, um, you know, so I've, I've been through this and I, I, I wasn't there for Thornton, but I was there post Thornton when we had to actually implement uh, what was passed in in, um, in the Thornton bill um, during either the 01 or 02 sessions before my time. Um, I agree with much of what Mrs. Ellis said because the bill as it was drafted, I think there were a lot of good ideas that funneled down into a bill that ended up being drafted very poorly. Um, and I, I think there's a lot in that bill that um, either should be amended out will be amended out, um, and, and then I, I think there, there may be a, a, hopefully the poison pills are gone, but there may be some things that we just have to, you know, hold our nose and, and, and live with. What, and, and some of those for me are, are, are the implementation timelines. Um, and then certainly I, I've got some concerns about how to pay for it. And I've always said, I'm not one person that's going to say, I said this when I was there, somebody who helped mentor me, uh, uh, he's no longer with us, but Ted Sophocles was, was always very vocal in saying, you can't always support something and then say you're against the funding mechanism that actually pays to support it. So you can't have it both ways. And so I struggle with how to pay for it because I don't want my taxes going up because I think I pay a lot of taxes already and I think many of us pay a lot of taxes already. Um, but at the same time, I want some elements of Thornton and I don't know how that's going to be paid for. What we've also seen over the last couple of days now is that the Senate Budget and Tax Committee, certain members of, of B&T have said that the tax bill is not going to get out of their committee, which means that the Ways and Means Committee, which is responsible for both the education bill as well as the tax bill, um, they may pass a portion of both, but the Senate's already said they're not going to pay for it, at least with this, this bill that I believe it's Delegate Lutke has, has, has sponsored to pay. So nothing you know arm twisting and all that's going to happen i mean so nothing's nothing's ever final until the vote but i, I say this to say that we don't know what's going to happen the next two weeks are, are going to be extremely volatile more volatile than the dow jones right now and 
I, at the end of the day, think it's extremely imperative, and I think Mrs. Hummer said it best. I don't want to take street credibility away from Ms. Ortiz because as the amendments, I'm, I'm all for opening up a, a revote and maybe hashing out some amendments and, and underscoring amendments, but I think if, if, if there are three ways that the General Assembly and legislators look at these bills, it's support, it's support with amendments, and it's oppose. In much the same way, you know, it's, it's <laughs> you know, not coincidental that we, we label them the same way here, and that's how the committees get their thing. If you oppose, they don't want to talk to you, they don't have time to talk to you. Um, if you oppose outright, because they know that's what you believe and you're done. But if, if we support with amendments, and then we even edit those amendments now or underscore a few of those amendments that, that I think we consider to be poison pills or whatever the vernacular is we want to use, that gives us the ability to still have a seat at the table. And it gives Ms. Ortiz the ability as, as legislators on these committees are voting and then as things get to the floor, respective chambers on second reader and people are able to stand up and, and amend, I, I, I think Ms. Ortiz has that seat at the table so long as we are support with amendments. If we were to outright oppose, uh, she ain't there. I use the police chief's word. Um, and, and, and I think that would be detrimental to us. And, and, and to the county. So I'm with Mrs. Ellis on much of what she said because I've got some grave concerns about this bill. The dupli duplicative nature that M Mrs. Hummer referenced, the fact I, I know we were getting the semantics on the budgeting, but you know, look, I, I mean, I, it's late and I don't care what I say anymore, but uh, you know, the fact that we don't have Mike Bush anymore, Anne Arundel County got hurt in this bill because we don't have the speaker. Uh, let's call it what it is. I'm not going to sugarcoat. Um, you know, we've, we lost Ed DeGrange in the Senate, who was very powerful. We lost Mike Bush in the House, who was very, uh, extremely powerful. And we're seeing a consequence of that now as things go to Baltimore City, Montgomery, Prince George's County. I'm not knocking those counties, those legislators are doing their jobs. But unfortunately, to get something, we need to have a seat at the table, and we cannot take away Ms. Ortiz's street credibility down there. You're one of the best. You have been for a while. And, and we need to give you the tools in your toolbox to help you continue to be the best. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Gilliland. Uh, Ms. Ellis, and then Mr. Lott. Ms. Ellis? Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. What is the earliest that the Senate could be voting on this? Oh, so it, it already had the bill hearings in both the House and the Senate, so that doesn't need to happen. So they'll start looking at it at probably early next week through the subcommittee process in which um, the Education Subcommittee of the um, EHE, as, as we call it, and uh, B&T, both of their Education Subcommittees will likely do it um, in unison like the House did and start going through the bill. As, as I mentioned, though, you know, it's the, the good thing is that they will not be seeing our proposed amendments for the first time. They've had them for uh, about uh, just over a week. Um, and so, whereas the House just received them when they received them to consider them. So they've had, you know, they'll have more time to review our amendments and those of other stakeholders and uh, deliberate on them. I will say that when it comes to education matters, the Senate has been much more helpful to school systems than the House has. And we have a great relationship with the leadership, um, you know, in EHE who deals with uh, the, the, the education policy legislation. Uh, Senator Pinsky from Prince George's County, he has been extremely um, helpful. And we have Senator Simon there on that committee. And then in budget and tax, the new vice chair, Senator Rosapep. Um, and we have Senator Alfreth also on BNT. And so we can always, you know, work with them on proposed um, amendments. And so Sorry, that was very long-winded. But I don't think they will be voting on it next week. You know, I think maybe in a couple of weeks, even that I think would be kind of soon, but I don't think it would be earlier than two weeks from now. So you feel confident that we will meet again before the Senate votes? I mean, I do. I, you know, the legislature, it's a, as a Mr. Gillen said, it's a little, I'm not asking for your blood. I'm just asking yeah, you feel confident. It's a little volatile right now. So <laughs> I, I think... They want to take their time to be able to review it, and they do have a little bit of time and so, um, and lots of amendments to consider. What I can do is provide 
uh, through a board office um, a list of all of our proposed amendments that are very technical and substantive and as soon as the the version of the bill with all of the um, committee amendments right just I will notate that it could be amended even more on the house floor but as soon as that's available I can make all of that available to board members so that at least you have that and you can see and then certainly you know as a board um, you can reach out board members to um, members of the delegation you know and identifying those amendments and those concerns because you know the accountability and the duplicative nature of some of the things or just like lack of clarity of like where do we start with the hierarchy between state board MSE the AIB the IG's office right like who's who has the true oversight? I will say that given the most recent amendments, it seems like the AIB, the Accountability Implementation Board, is really going to have the general oversight. Um, so certainly those are things that we continue to talk about, continue to push, and um, but I'd be happy to share you know, what we have right now so that you can know exactly what it is. And obviously, if you identify other things that were missed, you know, let me know. I'm actually... Um I, I believe there are a lot of things. Um, I, um, I've been in communication. I mentioned earlier one of the very smartest people I know um, is a teacher um, who um, has combed through this bill in a detail that I never could. And um, there are many, many, many very, very important questions that need to be addressed for this bill to be good for our students. I, and I firmly believe that. So for my um, fellow board members, I, I don't mean to make this about me in any way, but I personally have a need to come out on the right side of this issue because it feels to me like this is just so far from where it needs to be and it's moving in such haste and the the consequences of this are, are astronomical in terms of education policy and, and, um, and the price tag um, on our citizens. So um, I would be comfortable holding our position, but I am fully prepared to revisit this in two weeks. Um, and I, if, if this is not heading in the right direction, I respectfully request that my board members agree to another vote on our position, even if it's futile because it'll be so late. I, it, this is just way too important. But thank you, you have been, I know you're representing us well, and I know how much it takes out of your life during these uh, few months and um, and you're certainly um, uh, doing a great job explaining and, and keeping us informed so I really appreciate that thank you I appreciate that and um, you know if I if I'm finding out that things seem to be moving faster than what I anticipate I will certainly let the board know I appreciate that uh, miss Ellis um, based on that um, statement are you withdrawing the opener for today's purposes yes. and um, then we can just simply put it on the agenda for next time. Um, I believe there is enough change that has occurred to substantiate a reopener without any um, parliamentary obstacles. Um, so um, if, if that is the case, um, then we have dispensed of Miss Ellis's um, issues and we are back open to general items of legislation. Um, I have uh, Miss. I don't know if Miss Hummer and Mr. Grannon wanted to speak uh, to Miss Ellis's or not. Um, yeah, I had, a, I had different, a very quick different. point of information, mm -hmm. but President Corkadel, mm -hmm. you basically said what I was right. already going to say. Just to be clear, uh, any two board members can set an agenda item, and I would support Miss Ellis in making the that. House bill an agenda item for a separate board vote as I would support any board member who ever wanted any agenda item frankly so there will definitely be an opportunity for us to vote on this again yes yes all right done okay and we do have I believe um, at least one more question on items of legislation for you Ms. Ortiz Ms. Hummer um, yes so the very first bill on page 2 HB 0868 um, we have no position on this 
Um, I have a concern about this bill. It what, can, can you read it? <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Page two of our legislative program, the very first bill, HB 0868, State and Public School Holidays. Um, this bill would designate September 17th for Constitution Day and Citizenship Day as a legal state holiday and a public school holiday. We have worked very hard to try to get board oversight of the cal of the our calendar that that we can make our own decisions this adds another mandatory closing day and we already have a very hard time fitting in what we do now without having to go till january june 30th and so i would actually i make a motion that we change our position from no position to oppose this so that we do not add another additional required closing day to the school year calendar. second Okay, we have a motion and a second to move to um, oppose. Any discussions? I only have one uh, suggestion as, um, and it's probably not part, I don't know if it needs to be germane to, to the motion or not, but I would hope, you know, how we say why we are opposed, while, although while we recognize, um, you know, the, the stuff that's good of intent here that the, the, yes. the local board stuff is that something we that, need to add into the motion like, no, that's, that's what what I, I try to identify that's the, the translation yes, that the, you make of our motion right that i would okay. say we you know okay. it would be really focused on that one day okay. and not the um identifying american indian heritage day because yeah. we're already closed <laughs> Just, on that day i'm kind of so, looking at this yeah. going well well yeah I, I, most people are recognizing that right. columbus day is no longer a one of those things. Um, okay, uh, that was my only question. Uh, do I, I don't think we have any more questions or anybody left here of audience. So, Ms. Howell, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? I am definitely an, an, an aye, but I also like to say that keeping it in our control allows us to make those decisions if we wanted to. Exactly. And Nothing so. mandatory. Yes, so definitely an aye, but that. I do recognize the good in this. And I just wanted that to be on the record. Yeah. Mr. Gilliland? Yeah, if it was labeled Monique Jackson's birthday, then I, I, would I would have said aye. I. Definite <laughs> I. Or, or I, I. I would oppose, but in this case, I will say aye. <laughs> Mr. Live? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Corkado? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. She's kind of a big deal. Okay. Yeah. She really is. Okay, I don't see any more motion on items of legislation. Thank you so very much, Ms. Ortiz, and extra kudos. We're we're definitely rolling in. We've got a couple more items to clear off of our uh, off of our calendar here. Um, item 7.06, um, Rippling Woods Elementary School Replacement Schematic Design. Dr. Arlotto. Yes, ma'am. I recommend board approval of the Rippling Woods Elementary School replacement schematic design. So second. We got a motion and a second. Um, and it does look like we have a couple questions. Is there any information you wanted to share in advance? Well, Lisa Seam Crawford, mm -hmm. Director of Facilities. Kyle Roof, Supervisor, Planning, Design, and Construction. I mm -hmm. just wanted to let you know there's prototype design. So okay. it will fit with similar to Jessup Rolling Knolls. Great. Thank you guys so very much. You all are very much, much busier than, than you know, a, a, a look back at 10 years ago, I can well imagine. So um, your continued, continued gratification. We do have a couple questions. We have Ms. Shawheim followed by Ms. Hummer. Ms. Shawheim. Um, hello. Good evening. Goodness. Um, thank you for putting together these three. Um, I don't have a lot of, I, just, I, have, I have one question, but I also want to say that um, I admire your post-its because uh, you've seen my binders <laughs> with, you know, when you give me thicker ones, there, there's a lot of them. Um, but I'm getting, I'm getting more streamlined now that we've done this a time or two. But I, I had one question with regards to the floor plan. I don't know what page is it. I guess it's page 11. Yes, it's page 11, and I assume I know the answer to this, but I just want to be, be for sure. Is kindergarten 
part of the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight classrooms that are designated as early childhood? Correct. That's what I, I was hoping that you'd say because I was, I was like, wow, that's a, it's a lot of pre-K, mm -hmm. if not. Okay, so we assume that, what, four or five of those would be kindergarten and the two would be pre-K, or is there pre-K at all on this particular site? Sorry. Yes, there is pre-K. Okay. So I believe there would be five kindergarten and two pre-K. Okay, great. And then my only other question, at least for this one, is that I looked at the, you know, we have our existing map and then we have our proposed. And I'm, I'm just gonna point out, there's a, there's a lot more trees on the existing than the proposed. And I, I don't know what we're still mandated to do with, cause I didn't, I didn't read in depth of the, the forest conservation now law but um i get that these you have to you know cut down some trees to make these changes and you know the result is a is a brand new and shiny place for our students which is great but i just wanted to to state that you know if there's if there's a way to plant more trees because we're taking you know we're getting rid of so many at least i don't know if that's decorative i assume that that's actual real forested areas that um, that we just plan as many as we can when we um, after when we do this project do we are we still trying to do that as a new forest conservation yeah, we're, bill we're, limited we're, that we're subject to that okay has but as the new law like is it few, is it fewer trees for the for the size of the are we, are we going to be planting more trees or less trees as a result of that law with regard to this and the other projects? Uh, well, more. The assumption would be more. Good, okay, I just wanna just wanna <laughs> make sure. Okay, all right, so that was my only, those were my only questions on, on this one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Hunter? I just wanna say, I, all three of these are beautiful. I'm so excited for these schools, but especially for Rippling Woods. I have visited all three of these. Rippling Woods desperately needs this and is, is the, the as y'all have made amazing progress over the past years and, and we've been hand tackling our most challenging school projects, I think this is one of the last most challenging ones and so I'm thrilled for Rippling Woods that they're going to get a new building there. It will be much more educationally appropriate for all the kids there. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I don't see any more. Um, we have exactly five, so Didn't I? us five, or no one's allowed to leave until the one needs yeah. to return, um, but we do have enough for vote. Um, do we know see no public comment? Ms. Hall, please call roll. Ms. Schalheim? Aye, and thank you so much for your work. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Live? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? I'm gonna, what is who voting on? Rippling words. Oh, I'm gonna abstain. Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Motion passes to zero. Okay, next item, 7.07, .07, is the Porterfield Elementary School Replacement Schematic Design. Dr. Arlotto. Yes, ma'am. I recommend board approval of the Porterfield Elementary School Replacement Schematic Design. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Um, Stephen Crawford, do any comments from staff to share? No. Once again, it's our standard prototype design. Okay. I have uh, one question, Michelle Hunt. Um, hi, thanks again. Um, and again, with the you know the making sure we we plan uh, replace as many trees as possible. But then what I, the other thing that struck me on this one, and again, all of these are all three of these are great, and I'm very also very excited for these schools. But this one went from page th three to page forty three, and so I wonder 
what are we missing? What what exists in between page three and and forty three? Or was it was it a typo? So there's there's two different versions of this plan that we submit to the board. One is the full version, and one is the slim version. So this is the slim version. That is the slim version. The full version contains all the text, and you should have received both. Up at the board office, there should have been a copy up there. <coughs> okay. All right. It, okay, so it's a it's a hard printout, and it's in the back. Okay, got it, got it, got it. And so just just be, just give me the cliff notes. Is it is it all the the what the what occurs in each room in terms of like the storage and the square footage and uh, this and that and the other? We provide a, a summary table, and I think uh, you may not have that in the slim version, but there's a summary table of how the space is utilized, and then it breaks down existing, proposed, both site and building. Uh, what we're thinking about as far as HVAC equipment in a building, and then uh, what our initial sustainability stuff is. Oh, yeah, sure, that would be lovely. Thank you so much. And so, are we? I thought I thought it didn't happen until like the design development, but all the all the green stuff that you know I care deeply <laughs> about is that in the next? That's still in the next round. That's the right. We do our schematic design. We do our initial thinking in the schematic design. We develop options, and then in DD phase is when the engineers and architects really drill down and figure out what's the best option for us. Okay, and 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 that would include all like geothermal and solar and all Correct. that good stuff that you know I care about. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no more comments and nothing from the audience, Ms. Howe, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Ms. Um, Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. And Ms. Corkadon? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Item 7.08 Hillsmere Elementary School Replacement Schematic Design. Dr. Arlotto? Yes, ma'am. I recommend board approval of the Hillsmere Elementary School Replacement Schematic Design. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Uh, anything to comment? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing other than another prototype design. Okay. Great. But another well-deserved prototype design. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ms. Schalheim. Just one question. I noticed that it maybe, I hope it wasn't my eyes, because then I definitely got to go back to the eye doctor. But um, I, thought I, I thought I saw that the state rated capacity was higher before than it is after was I am I Michelle on your oh my mic I apologize okay so I'll restate it because I know people in the room heard me but probably not at home so um, I don't know if it's my eyes but I thought I read in here that the state rated capacity was higher before than it is after is that that's correct true? but it's only slight okay is that I mean, I'm sure that takes into account, you know, enrollment projections. And so are we, are we thinking that it's going to stay at a level that even if it's just slight, that we, we're not in desperate need of those extra, yeah. that extra space? Based on the adjacent schools, we feel that that number is adequate. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no more comments or questions, Ms. Howe, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Live? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Corkadell? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Thank, Thank you. Okay. And uh, item 7.09 is the filling of vacancies on the executive committee of the countywide citizen advisory committee for the board. As I had mentioned in brief, I believe in two other earlier um, uh, subject matters. Um, we are experiencing um, lacks of quorum um, with the CAC, uh, which means they cannot really genuinely conduct business. Um, so uh, to the level that we need them to, and clearly with some of the outcomes of this afternoon, um, the recognition of filling these vacancies as quickly as possible. Uh, we did expedite um, not the term of the application process, but the front end and the back end of that to the extent that we were able to um, following the poli within the minds of following the policy. Um, and so this item is up here 
um, as a normal, you would have a packet, and I recognize that. Um, but I would ask the board today to consider um, that we move these folks forward so that they can be prepared for the very next meeting. They only have three meetings left. And so um, this could, a delay in this could potentially limit their ability to participate in the April, um, if not altogether. So I'm respectfully asking that we consider um, under limited circumstances of information to move this forward. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, just a little bit more background. The same process of the nomination committee would have been followed. Your president did attend, just like your president has attended in all priors, um, including uh, with this group. And um, we had, it, it, it landed very well. There's, there was nothing contentious about any of the applicants. We, we were blessed with 56 applicants. Um, and uh, so uh, I know that the citizens are willing to have engagement. And so I look forward to whatever we decide today uh, to having a uh, fully restored CAC so we can continue the good business. Uh, with that stated, do we have any comments um, from board members? Ms. Shawhan. Um, so just for the record, of course I support fully uh, having a, a fully staffed CAC. This, that's not what my problem is about at all. My problem is about, I mean, I wouldn't know any of these folks if they came up and said hi to me on the street and I didn't see their applications in last spring we were all we were given all that ma material and this was published on an agenda and the public knew about it before the day of and all of that so i i'm i'm a no for those reasons i hope that going forward i've been heard you know last spring we were given all the the applications even 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 though the 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 committee meets as it does and um I'll, and i'm still waiting on the cac policy review to come out of policy committee um, as well um, because I definitely think that some things need to be changed there but I I cannot support just a, a list of names I I would need to see their applications alongside all the others just as we did last spring I'm not sure why they weren't provided today or because if it's the rush I was told that that wasn't customary but I thought we made it customary via us getting those last spring so so I'm a no and that is why not because I want to hamstring the CAC in any way but because I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a rubber stamp. So, and I, I don't know these folks from anyone else. So. Okay, I don't see any other comments um, from board members or any other. Uh, com Mr. Granham. I'm going to comment and say that I am, I am going to vote uh, to approve these based uh, on my trust in President Corkadel's, uh observation of them and that kind of thing. But nonetheless, I do, I, I do hear what Ms. Shaw is saying, and as a matter of process uh, I do not support the idea that the that the board should be pushed to vote on things without having the full opportunity for all board members so in future I, I think we should do that um, I'll, I'll just say before we go to vote that I I'm looking forward to our renovation of the CAC because I the policy because I think we'll be able to address a lot of these contingencies maybe even can include considerations for something like a, a at having alternates right. voted on in advance at the beginning of the year for those for those opportunities, um, and and I did I, I felt very rushed even in the the whole you know we went from meeting we went from the scheduling of started Thursday to we met you know it, it was it was very fast and um, but I also recognize um, and spent some time with Miss Howard to get a better understanding of why why this is unique. And so um, I, I, I do concur with you, Mr. Grannon, on that. Um, Ms. Hell, uh, please call roll. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Nay. Uh, Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Mr. Lyde? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Corkadell? Aye. 6 1. Okay. Um, item 8.01 the monthly financial status report. Um, there is, uh, this is just a review item. So um, if there are questions, we can bring staff up. Um, I'm not seeing any. Going once, going twice. Okay, item 8.01 is now officially closed. 
Item 8.02, the award of contracts. Once again, this is a review item only, and we can bring staff up if there are questions. Seeing none, okay. Um, this meeting is officially um, coming to a conclusion, and before I request a motion to adjourn, uh, just a couple of general announcements. The next general board meeting is Wednesday, March the 18th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Policy committee will be meeting earlier that day at 3.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. And after thereafter, uh, between that and the meeting, the budget committee will be meeting on Wednesday the 18th at 4.30. Um, a special board workshop has been scheduled for next Tuesday, March the 10th at 6 p.m. here in the boardroom. And just as a general reminder, the public is welcome to attend, but no testimony will be taken at that time. Okay, um, so to correct, policy committee will be meeting at 4 instead of 3.30 as originally published on the agenda. The um, changes will be made in, in accordance on the website and all the other notifications as such. And I am now willing to entertain a motion to adjourn. All those, yay, I.